Section 17 of A History of the Great War, Volume 3. The Beleaguered Forest, Continued, and the Great Sallies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of the Great War, Volume 3 by John Buchan. Chapter 61. Romania Enters the War. August 4, 1914, to September 1, 1916, Part 2. The first days of August 1914 brought Romania face to face with the great decision. King Carol alone had no doubts. His German training and antecedents, and his lifelong friendship with the Central Powers, arrayed his sympathies on the Teutonic side. Moreover, he considered Romania bound by the Treaty of 1883 to intervene on Austria's behalf. His government took a different view. They argued, as Italy argued in a similar case, that the occasion provided for by the terms of the agreement had not arisen since they had had no notice of the sudden and violent procedure of Vienna, and Austria-Hungary must be considered the party attacking and not the attacked. It was clear that popular opinion was not in favor of intervention, and accordingly the king summoned on 4th August a special advisory council to which the ministers and the leaders of the opposition were alike invited. The question put to the members was that of immediate intervention on behalf of the central powers, and the king's policy had Carp as its sole supporter. Majorescu and Margilliman preferred to wait and to intervene only when Germany had made her victories certain. By an overwhelming majority, the council decreed in favor of neutrality, and the army, when appealed to, gave the same decision. The king, who believed that the verdict was against Romania's interests and a stain on Romania's honor, was compelled to acquiesce. Two months later, on the 10th of October, 1914, he died. His successor was his nephew, Ferdinand, who had married a granddaughter of Queen Victoria. The new king had not the German leanings of his predecessor and could consider his country's interests with an undivided mind, while the queen made no secret of her sympathy with the Allied cause. For the better part of two years, with the eyes of the world on her, Romania suspended her judgment, swayed now hither, now thither, by the turn of events while her press and her platforms were filled with propaganda strife. The only alternatives were continued neutrality or entry into war on the Allied side. Never since the first month of the campaign had there been any real chance of her joining the Central Powers. Germany's performance in Belgium, her declaration of arrogant aims, and the plans for the Near East which she had loudly proclaimed, could have no attraction for a people which cherished its national independence. Moreover, the appearance of France, Russia, and Italy in the field awakened the sentiment and memories of a race which was part Latin and part Slav, but in no way Teuton. With the first Russian successes, the contest began between those Romanians who clamored for immediate union with the Allies, those who advocated delay, and those who were frankly on the German side of the first party with Taki Janescu and Filipscu, of the second, the Prime Minister, Bratianu, and of the third, Karp Majorescu and Marga Lohmann. Negotiations began with Russia, but it remained to be seen whether Petrograd would be in a position to fulfill its promises. The government paid little attention to the assiduous overtures, from the central powers and the appeals of the Margolomis press, but kept its eyes fixed on the northern frontier, where Ivanov was moving towards Krakow. In January 1915, Lechitsky's advance into the Bukovina seemed to keep Romania's day of action near. Britain lent her five million pounds. The reserves were called up, and Bretton threw out hints in Parliament of a decisive hour approaching. Negotiations were proceeding with Russia as to Romania's territorial rewards. Difficult negotiations, for Romania put her claims high, 
and having already received the promise of much for neutrality alone, wanted a large addition in return for alliance. Moreover, before she could intervene effectually, she must have munitions, and since these could only come from the Western Allies, the road into the Black Sea must be cleared. The British guns then sounding at the Dardanelles were part of the inducement to Romania to move, but everything miscarried. The British naval attack on the Dardanelles failed, and the landing of 28th April promised at the best a slow and difficult campaign. Presently Mackinson struck on the Donetsk, and Russia began her great retreat. The day of Romanian intervention had been indefinitely postponed. Bratiano had now an intricate game to play. He could not afford to quarrel with the triumphant central powers, and though he refused to allow munitions of war for Turkey to pass through his country, he was compelled to speak Germany fair and suffer Austria to purchase part of the Romanian wheat crop. With remarkable steadfastness, he resisted Austro-German blandishments and threats and bided his time. He saw Bulgaria take the plunge and Serbia destroyed, and his country's strategic position grow daily graver. If she joined the Allies, she would be hopelessly outflanked, with the hostile Bulgaria to the south and flans of Bolton in Cernovitz. Besides, she had as yet no munitions, and hard-pressed Russia could not help her on that score. Meantime, popular feeling was kindling and might soon be beyond control. The Conservative Party had split in two, and a pro-entente group had been formed, with first Lohovari and then Filipsky as its leader. The League of National Unity was active. Student demonstrations filled the capital, and the inaction of the government was attacked alike by the interventionists under Taki Yanuskyu and the pro-Germans under Marco Lohmann. Few statesmen had been placed in a more difficult position than Bretiano during the winter of 1915 to 1916. He did the only thing possible in the circumstances and played for time. He allowed the sale of cereals both to Britain and to Austria, Germany. It was clear that his policy of expectant neutrality had the support of the great mass of the Romanian people, as was shown by the vote of confidence which he received in both chambers when Parliament met. During the early summer of 1916, a fusion took place between Taki Yanniuskyu's Young Conservatives and Filipskyu's group, more and more Taki Yanniuskyu, brilliant alike as an orator and a writer, was becoming the interpreter of the national ideal. Fabian tactics may be wise, but they cannot last forever. It was his business to organize and make explicit that popular feeling which would turn the balance with the cautious Bretiano. But arguments were preparing more potent than the eloquence of the popular leaders. On 4th June, Brusilov struck his first blow. On 18th June, Letterchitsky ended Cernovitz. By the end of the month, the Book of Vienna was in Russian hands, and on the 1st of July, the Allied armies of France and Britain advanced on the Somme. In 1875, when King Carol was still busy with his reorganization, the Romanian army numbered 18,000 regulars and 44,000 territorials. By the law of 1872, men were enlisted for eight years. The large numbers were passed into the reserve before they had served their term. After the Russo-Turkish War, the army was increased, and in 1882, the German system of localized corps, drawing all the recruits from one district, was introduced. Four army corps were then created. By the law of 1891, a closer connection was established between the standing army and the territorial force. The infantry were formed into 34 regiments, each with one regular and two territorial battalions, while the militia represented the second line and a third line was available in a levee en masse. Territorials were trained for 90 days in their first year of service, and for 30 days in subsequent years. In 1902, 
The regular army was about 60,000 strong, with 75,000 territorials. By increasing the available equipment and calling up each year larger numbers of the annual class, the numbers grew rapidly, and a fifth army corps was presently formed. The declaration of war against Bulgaria in 1913, the seizure of Silistria, and the advance on Plevna afforded a good test to Romania's capacity for mobilization. In 1914, the army was organized in three main divisions, active, reserve, and militia. There were five corps, each of two divisions, with five more divisions formed of surplus reservists. Romania could mobilize the first-line force of 220 battalions, 83 squadrons, 124 batteries, and 19 companies of fortress artillery, a strength of 250,000 rifles, 18,000 sabers, 300 machine guns, and about 800 field guns and howitzers, of which three-fourths were pieces of a recent pattern. These figures by no means represented the total available forces. In 1913, when the five army corps were mobilized against Bulgaria, no less than 200,000 recruits were sent back from the depots without being embodied. When the Great War began, preparations were at once made for marshalling the whole force of the country in case of need. Cadres were formed for reserve battalions, and the aim was an eventual mobilization of a first-line army of ten corps, five active corps, and a reserve corps for each. This would provide an effective fighting force of between 500,000 and 600,000 men. The infantry were armed with the Manglicker. The field guns and field howitzers came from Krupp, and the mountain batteries and heavy pieces from Kreuzsut. Munitions were obviously a difficulty, though the Krupp supply would be cut off, and the country had no large steel works. A considerable supply of shells, however, had been accumulated, and Romania, with Russia's aid, had endeavored to make herself independent of Germany. She had no navy to speak of, only a small river and coast flotilla, with vessels conspicuously inferior to the Austrian Danube fleet. Her general staff were, for the most part, good professional soldiers, who had imbibed much of the latest German teaching but they had suffered from the fact that the few had had any experience of operations in the field under war conditions. The strategic position, if she joined the Allies, involved a war on two fronts. Political considerations would, no doubt, impel her to cross the Carpathian passes, then weakly guarded by Austrian Landstrom, and occupy Transylvania. There it was difficult to believe she would be forestalled, but Bulgaria, at the bidding of Germany, was certain to strike, either by an advance into the Dobrogea towards the Ternifoda Bridge, which carried the line from Costanza to the capital, or by a crossing of the Danube. The river line made a formidable barrier on the south, but it had been crossed before, and might be crossed again. Romania must, therefore, use her forces to protect her southern borders on the Danube, and in the Dobrugia, as well as to press through the passes into Transylvania. This the whole Romanian people took for granted, and the wiser strategy, to hold the Carpathian passes as a defensive flank, and concentrate on cutting the railway to Constantinople, had little chance of consideration. Austria had been desperately depleted of men by Brusilov's offensive, and it was believed that she could not summon any great force to hold Transylvania. It was rather in the direction of Bulgaria that danger seemed to lie. Two Bulgarian armies were held by Surreal at Salonika, while another watched the northern and northeastern frontiers. If the last were reinforced by German or Turkish troops, a dangerous invasion of the Dobrugia was possible. Hence Romania, having made up her mind on her strategical purpose, required certain assurances before she could be put into execution. In the first place, Brusilov must continue his pressure between the Pripyat and the Carpathians, so that Germany and Austria should have no troops to spare to reinforce the Transylvanian front. 
In the second place, Surreal must initiate a vigorous offensive from Salonika to keep Bulgaria's attention fixed on that quarter. In the third place, Russia must send an army to the Dobrogea to cooperate with the Romanian forces there. Finally, she must see a way to adequate munitions and a continuous future supply. This could only come by way of Russia from the Western Allies. The first train load of shells which crossed the Moldavian border would be a warning to the Central Powers of an imminent declaration of war. Early in June, Russia pressed for Romanian advance to coincide with Musilov's movements. It was the psychological moment for a successful entrance into the war. But Bucharest was not yet ready. On 17th July, Filipevescu and Takiyanoscu spoke a great interventionist demonstration. They asked for national union, an amalgamation of all parties such as France had seen, and they appealed to the king to prove himself the best of Romanians. Gratiano said nothing, but he was busy negotiating with the Allied powers, negotiating not only on the objective of the coming campaign, but on Romanian rewards and the safeguards for her future. By the middle of July, the matter was decided in principle, and the details of the supply of munitions from Russia had been settled. A provisional date was fixed for intervention, but the exact moment had to wait upon the fulfillment of certain preliminary guarantees. The central powers knew perfectly well what was happening at Bucharest, but excellent though their intelligence system was, they could not fix the date of the rupture. Bratianu conducted the game with consummate finesse. He saw the Austrian and German ministers, and left on them the impression that his mind was not yet made up. The king, as late as 25th August, received an audience, Mahalyaskyo, who had just returned from Germany. He followed the example of his predecessor, for it was announced on 26th August that the king desired to hear in council the views not only of his ministers, but of all the party leaders. The meeting was fixed for 10 a.m. on the following day, 27th August. The council, in spite of the protests of Marga Lohmann, Karp, and Mahayaskyu, ratified by a great majority the decision of the cabinet. That evening a note was handed to the Austro-Hungarian minister, containing a declaration of war. That note set forth the reasons for Romania's breach with the Triple Alliance. It referred to the long-standing grievance of Transylvania and the ill-treatment of the Transylvanian people. The central powers, it declared, had flung the world into the melting pot, and old treaties had disappeared along with more valuable things. Romania, governed by the necessity of safeguarding her racial interests, finds herself forced to enter into line by the side of those who are able to assure her the realization of her national unity. To the army, the king sent a message in the name of the heroes of the past, the shades of Michael the Brave and Stephen the Great, whose mortal remains rest in the lands you march to deliver, will lead you to victory as worthy successors of the men who triumphed at Rasbrioni and Caliugarini and at Plevna. To the people at large, he also appealed. The war, which now for two years has hemmed in our position more and more closely, has shaken the old foundations of Europe and shown that henceforth it is on a national foundation alone that the peaceful life of its people can be assured. It has brought the day which for centuries has been awaited by a national spirit, the day of the union of the Romanian race. After long centuries of misfortune and cruel trials, our ancestors succeeded in founding the Romanian state. Through the union of the principalities, through the war of independence, and through indefatigable toil, from the time of the National Renaissance. Today it is given to us to render enduring and complete the work for a moment, performed by Michael the Brave, the union of Romanians on both sides of the Carpathians. It is for us today to deliver from the foreign yoke our brothers beyond the mountains and in the land of Bukovina, where Stephen the Great sleeps his eternal sleep. In us, 
and the virtues of our race, and our courage lives that potent spirit, which will give them once more the right to prosper in peace, to follow their ancestral customs, and to realize their aspirations in a free and united Romania from the Thice to the sea. The formal breach was with Austria-Hungary alone, and for a moment Bratiano seems to have toyed with the idea of following Italy's earlier example and limiting the war. The Allies made no objection. They knew that such a limitation was impracticable, and their forecast was right. For on 28th August, Germany declared war on Romania, and on 1st September, Bulgaria followed suit. Fourteen nations were now engaged in the campaigns. The entry of Romania had been for some months expected and prepared for by Germany, and as early as 29th July, Falkenhayn had made his dispositions. On the surface, it gave the Allies a powerful recruit. It lengthened the Teutonic battlefield in the east by several hundred miles. It added more than a quarter of a million trained soldiers to the Allied strength. And above all, it gave them control of the economic assets which the central powers had counted on in their resistance to the British blockade. All these things were solid gains. And yet, paradox as it may seem, it is certain that the German high command did not find the breach with Romania wholly unwelcome. Germany's most serious danger lay in the growing unification of the Allies' command and its concentration upon the main theatres. Her situation in these theatres was very grave. Everywhere her offensive had failed. Everywhere she was strategically and tactically on the defence. Her assets were dwindling, and if the Allied pressure continued relentlessly, the day must come, sooner or later, when her field strength must crumble. Her single hope was for disunion and divergency once more among her enemies. She believed that if their efforts were concentrated, they could outlast her. But if by some fortunate chance they should begin again to dissipate their energies, then the central powers, with their unity of purpose and uniformity of organization, might prove the stronger. Her desire was for a return of those happy days when the main fronts in Europe were stagnant, and at Gallipoli and in the Balkans, France and Britain wasted themselves in vain adventures. The appearance of Romania in the war seemed to promise such a chance. The German staff knew, to a decimal, Romania's strength, and knew, too, that she would not play the game of war in its true rigor. She had her eyes fixed on her unliberated kinsfolk, and would advance forthwith on Transylvania. For this blunder, she would be made to pay dearly, and with good fortune, Bucharest might go the way of Belgrade and Brussels. But the Allies could not permit her to suffer the fate of Serbia. Her position was strategically too vital, and their honor was too deeply committed. Therefore, in the event of a Romanian debacle, Russian armies would hasten to her aid, and Surreal at Salonica would be reinforced by troops destined for the western battlefield. If this happened, the concentration of the Allied purpose would be weakened, and the unity of the Allied command might go to pieces. Brusilov might slacken his efforts, and the deadly acid in the West would cease to bite. Out of an apparent misfortune, the Teutonic League might win a final triumph. The calculation was shrewd, as this narrative will show. When the Romanians crossed the passes, they marched not to victory, but to disaster. But the chronicle of their campaign must be postponed while we turn to the great offense of which, since the first day of July, the armies of France and Britain had been conducting in the West. Meanwhile, the German high command had found a new chief. On 28th August, the Emperor sent for Hindenburg, and on the following day Falkenhayn resigned. The victor of Tannenberg had never seen eye to eye with the chief of the general staff, and might fairly claim the disasters of the summer on the Russian front as proof that he had been in the right. From these disasters had sprung Romanian intervention, and against Falkenhayn were also debited the costly failure at Verdun and, what seemed to Germany its consequences, the desperate struggle on the Somme, of which the end could not be foreseen. 
The crisis demanded a change of authority, and at the helm was placed the old soldier, who had the greatest prestige among his countrymen. All beside him was set Ludendorff, who had shown himself the ablest organizer of campaigns. It was to prove a formidable partnership in the succeeding two years. Falkenhayn, the most intellectual of Germany's commanders, had not the character or temperament for the kind of war which was now forced upon her. A more patient, if a slower mind, a tougher fortitude, a more desperate laboriousness in the conserving of every atom of national strength, were the gifts demanded, and these, joined with supreme popular confidence, were possessed by the new Diamvoit. End of chapter 61, part 2 Section 18 of A History of the Great War, Volume 3, The Beleaguered Fortress, Continued, and The Great Sallies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of the Great War, Volume 3, by John Buchan. Chapter 62. The Battle of the Somme. June 24th through September 9th, 1916. Part 1. From Arras southward, the western battlefront left the coal pits and sour fields of Artois and entered the pleasant region of Picardy. The great crook of the upper Somme and the tributary vale of the Ancre intersect a rolling tableland dotted with little towns and furrowed by a hundred shallow streams. Nowhere does the land rise higher than five hundred feet, but a trivial swell, such as the nature of the landscape, may carry the eye for thirty miles. There were few detached farms, for it was a country of peasant cultivators who clustered in villages, not a hedge broke the long roll of cornlands, and till the higher ground was reached, the lines of tall poplars flanking the great Roman high roads were the chief landmarks. At the lift of country between Somme and Ancre, copses patched the slopes, and sometimes a church spire was seen above the trees from some woodland hamlet. The Somme winds in a broad valley between chalk bluffs, faithfully dogged by a canal, a curious river which strains, like the Oxus, through matted, rushy aisles, and is sometimes a lake and sometimes an expanse of swamp. The Ancre is such a stream as may be found in Wiltshire, with good trout in its pools. On a hot midsummer day, the slopes are ablaze with yellow mustard, red poppies, and blue cornflowers and to one coming from the lush flats of Flanders, or the black country of the Pas de Calais, or the dreary levels of Champagne, or the strange, melancholy Verdun hills, this land wore a habitable and cheerful air, as if remote from the oppression of war. The district is known as the Santerre. Some derive the name from Sana Terra, the healthy land, others from Sarta Terra, the cleared land. Some say it is Sancta Terra, for Peter the Hermit was a Picard, and the piety of the Crusaders enriched the place with a thousand relics and a hundred noble churches. But there are those, and they have much to say for themselves, who read the name Song Terra the bloody land. For the Picard was the Gascon of the north, and the countryside was an old cockpit of war. It was the seat of the government of Clovis and Charlemagne. It was ravaged by the Normans and time and again by the English. There Louis XI and Charles the Bold fought their battles. It suffered terribly in the Hundred Years' War. It was the tawny ground which Shakespeare's Henry V 
discolored with blood. German and Spaniard, the Pandours of Eugene and the Cossacks of Alexander marched across its fields. From the walls of Peron, the last shot was fired in the campaign of 1814. And in the greatest war of all, it was destined to be the theater of a struggle compared with which its ancient conflicts were like the brawls of a village fair. Till midsummer in 1916, the Picardy Front had shown little activity. Since that feverish September when Castelnau had extended on the Allies' left, and Madouis beyond Castelnau, in the great race for the North Sea, there had been no serious action. Just before the Battle of Verdun began, the Germans made a feint south of the Somme and gained some ground at Fries and Dompierre. There had been local raids and local bombardments, but the trenches on both sides were good, and a partial advance offered few attractions to either. Amiens was miles behind one front. Vital points like Saint-Quentin and Cambrai and La Fere were far behind the other. In that region, only a very great and continuous offensive would offer any strategic results. In July 1915, the British took over most of the line from Arras to the Somme, and on the whole they had a quiet winter in their new trenches. This long stagnation led to one result. It enabled the industrious Germans to excavate the chalk hills on which they lay into a fortress which they believed to be impregnable. Their position was naturally strong, and they strengthened it by every device which science could provide. Their high command might look uneasily at the Aubert's Ridge and Lons and Vimy, but it had no doubts about the Albert Heights. The German plan in the West, as we have seen, after the first offensive had been checked at the Marne and Ypres, was to hold their front with abundant guns, but the bare minimum of men, and use their surplus forces to win a decision in the east. This scheme was foiled by the steadfastness of Russia's retreat, which surrendered territory freely, but kept her armies in being. During the winter of 1915-16, through 16, the German high command was growing anxious, it saw that the march to the Divina and the adventure in the Balkans had failed to shake the resolution of its opponents. It was aware that the Allies had learned with some exactness the lesson of eighteen months of war, and that even now they were superior in men and would presently be on an equality in munitions. Moreover, the Allied command was becoming concentrated, and shaking itself free from its old passion for divergent operations. Its generals had learned the wisdom of the order of the king of Syria to his captains. Fight neither with small nor great, but only with the king of Israel. And the king of Israel did not welcome the prospect. Now to quote a famous saying of Foch, A weakening force must always be attacking and from the beginning of 1916, the Central Powers were forced into a continuous offensive. Their economic strength was draining steadily. Their people had been told that victory was already won and were asking for the fruits of it. They feared greatly the coming Allied advance, for they knew that it was meant to be simultaneous on all fronts, and they cast about for a means of frustrating it. That was the main reason of the great Verdun assault. Germany hoped so to weaken the field strength of France that no future blow would be possible, and the French nation, weary and dispirited, would incline to peace. She hoped, in any event, to lure the Allies into a premature counterattack, so that their great offensive might go off at half-cock and be defeated piecemeal. None of these things happened. Pétain, at Verdun, as we know, handled the defense like a master, and the place became a trap where Germany was bleeding to death. Meanwhile, with the full assent of Joffre, 
the British armies made no movement. They were biding their time. Early in June, the Austrian attack on the Trentino had been checked by Italy, and suddenly, in the east, Russia swung forward to a surprising victory. Within a month, nearly half a million Austrians had been put out of action, and the distressed armies of the dual monarchy called on Germany for help. Falkenhayn grappled as best he could with the situation, and such divisions as could be spared were dispatched from the west. At this moment, when the grip was tightening in the east, France and Britain made ready for a supreme effort. The plan had been settled between the two commands at Chantilly as early as the 14th of February. Germany's position was intricate and uneasy. She had no large surplus of men immediately available at her interior depots. The wounded who were ready again for the line and the young recruits from the 1917 class were all needed to fill up the normal wastage in her ranks. She might create new divisions, but it would be mainly done by skimming the old. She had no longer any great mass of free strategic reserves. Most had been sucked into the maelstrom of Verdun, or dispatched east to Hindenburg. In the west, she was holding a huge salient, from the North Sea to Soissons, and from Soissons to Verdun. If a wedge were driven in on one side, the whole apex would be in danger. The Russian field army could retire safely from Warsaw or Vilna because it was mobile and lightly equipped. But an army which had been stationary for 18 months and had relied mainly upon its fortifications would be apt to find a sedan in any rapid and extensive retirement. The very strength of the German front in the West constituted its weakness. A breach in a fluid line may be mended, but a breach in a rigid and elaborate front is difficult to fill unless there are large numbers of men available for the task, or unlimited time. There were no such large numbers, and it was likely that the Allies would see that there was no superfluity of leisure. Yet in spite of some weakness in the strategic situation, the German stronghold in the west was still formidable in the extreme. From Arras southward, they held in the main the higher ground. The front consisted of a strong first position, with firing, support, and reserve trenches, and a labyrinth of deep dugouts. A less strong intermediate line covering the field batteries, and a second position some distance behind, which was of much the same strength as the first. Behind lay fortified woods and villages, which could be readily linked up with trench lines to form third and fourth positions. They were well served by the great network of railways which radiated from La Fere and Léon, Cambrai and Saint-Quentin, and many new light lines had been constructed, they had ample artillery and shells, endless machine guns, and consummate skill in using them. It was a fortress to which no front except the West could show a parallel. The Russian soldiers, who in the early summer were brought to France, stared with amazement at a ramification of trenches compared with which the lines in Poland and Galicia were like hurried improvisations. The German purpose in the event of an attack was purely defensive. It was to hold their ground, to maintain the mighty forts on which they had spent so many months of labor, to beat off the assault at whatever cost. In that section of their front, at any rate, they were resolved to be a stone wall and not a spear point. The aim of the Allied command must be clearly understood. It was not to recover so many square miles of France. It was not to take Papon or Peron or Saint-Quentin. It was not even in the strict sense to carry this or that position. All these things were subsidiary and would follow in due course, provided the main purpose succeeded. 
That purpose was simply to exercise a steady and continued pressure on a certain section of the enemy's front. For nearly two years, the world had been full of theories as to the possibility of breaking the German line. Many months before, critics had pointed out the futility of piercing that line on too narrow a front, since all that was produced thereby was an awkward salient. It was clear that any breach must be made on a wide front, which would allow the attacking wedge to maneuver in the gap and prevent reinforcements from coming up quickly enough to reconstitute the line behind. But this view took too little account of the strength of the German fortifications. No doubt a breach could be made, but its making would be desperately costly, for no bombardment could destroy all the defensive lines and infantry in the attack would be somewhere or other faced with unbroken wire and unshaken parapets. Gradually it had been accepted that an attack should proceed by stages, with, as a prelude to each, a complete artillery preparation, and that, since the struggle must be long drawn out, fresh troops should be used at each stage. The policy was that of limited objectives, but it did not preclude an unlimited objective in the event of some local enemy weakness suddenly declaring itself. These were the tactics of the Germans at Verdun, and they were obviously right. Why then did the attack on Verdun fail? In the first place, because after the first week, the assault became spasmodic, and the great plan fell to pieces. Infantry were used wastefully in hopeless rushes. The pressure was relaxed for days on end, and the defense was allowed to reorganize itself. The second reason, of which the first was a consequence, was that Germany, after the initial onslaught, had not the necessary superiority either in numbers or morale or guns. At the sum, the Allies did not intend to relax their pressure, and their strength was such that they believed that, save in the event of abnormal weather conditions, they could keep it continuously at a high potential. A strategical problem is not, as a rule, capable of being presented in a simple metaphor. But it may be said that, to the view of the Allied strategy, the huge German salient in the West was like an elastic band drawn very tight. Each part of such a band has lost elasticity, and may be severed by friction, which would do little harm to the band if less tautly stretched. That represented one element of the situation. Another aspect might be suggested by the metaphor of a sea dike of stone in a flat country where all stone must be imported. The waters crumble the wall in one section, and all free reserves of stone are used to strengthen that part. But the crumbling goes on, and to fill the breach stones are brought from other sections of the dike. Some day there may come an hour when the sea will wash through the old breach, and a great length of the weakened dike will follow in the cataclysm. There were two other motives in the Allied purpose which may be regarded as subsidiary. One was to ease the pressure on Verdun, which during June had grown to fever pitch. The second was to prevent the transference of large bodies of enemy troops from the western to the eastern front, a transference which might have wreaked havoc with Brusilov's plans. Sir Douglas Haig would have preferred to postpone the offensive a little longer, for his numbers and munitionment were still growing, and the training of the new levies was not yet complete. But the general situation demanded that the Allies in the West should not delay their stroke much beyond midsummer. The German front in the Somme area was held by the right wing of the Second Army, formerly Billows, but now under Fritz von Bülow. This army's area began just south of Monchy, north of which lay the Sixth Army under the Bavarian Crown Prince. 
At the end of June, the front between Gomkor and Frise was held as follows. North of the Ancre lay the 2nd Guard Reserve Division and the 52nd Division. Between the Ancre and the Somme lay two units of the 14th Reserve Corps, in order the 26th Reserve Division and the 28th Reserve Division, and then the 12th Division of the 6th Reserve Corps. South of the river, guarding the road to Peron, were the 121st Division, the 11th Division, and the 36th Division, belonging to the 17th Corps. The British armies, as we have seen in earlier chapters, had in less than two years grown from the six divisions of the old expeditionary force to a total of some 70 divisions in the field, leaving out of account the troops supplied by the Dominions and by India. Behind these divisions were masses of trained men to replace wastage for at least another year. The quality of the result was not less remarkable than the quantity. The efficiency of the supply and transport, the medical services, the aircraft work, was universally admitted. The staff and intelligence work, most difficult to improvise, was now equal to the best in the field. The gunnery was praised by the French, a nation of expert gunners. As for the troops themselves, we had secured a homogeneous army of which it is hard to say that one part was better than the other. By June 1916, the term New Armies was a misnomer. The whole British force, in one sense, was new. The famous old regiments of the line had been completely renewed since Mons, and their drafts were drawn from the same source as the men of the new battalions. The only difference was that in the historic battalions there was a tradition already existing, whereas in the new battalions that tradition had to be created, and the creation was quick. If the old army bore the brunt of the first battle of Ypres, the territorials were no less heroic in the second battle of Ypres, and the new army had to its credit the four-mile charge at Luz. It was no patchwork force which in June was drawn up in Picardy, but the flower of the manhood of the British Empire, differing in origin and antecedents, but alike in discipline and courage and resolution. Munitions had grown with numbers. Anyone who was present at Ypres in April and May 1915 saw the German guns all day pounding our lines, with only a feeble and intermittent reply. It was better at Luz in September, when we showed that we could achieve an intense bombardment. But at that date our equipment sufficed only for spasmodic efforts, and not for that sustained and continuous fire which was needed to destroy the enemy's defenses. Things were very different in June 1916. Everywhere on the long British front there were British guns, heavy guns of all calibers, field guns innumerable, and in the trenches there were quantities of trench mortars. The great munition dumps, constantly depleted and constantly replenished from distant bases, showed that there was food enough and to spare for this mass of artillery, and in the factories and depots at home every minute saw the reserves growing. We no longer fought against a superior machine. We had created our own machine to nullify the enemies and allow our manpower to come to grips. The coming attack was allotted to the Fourth Army, under General Sir Henry Rawlinson, who had begun the campaign in command of the Seventh Division and at Luce had commanded the Fourth Corps. His front ran from south of Gomcor across the Ancre Valley to the junction with the French north of Maricor. In his line he had five corps, from left to right, the 8th under Lieutenant General Sir Aylmer Hunter Weston, 31st, 4th, and 29th Divisions, the 10th under Lieutenant General Sir T.L.N. Moreland, 36th and 32nd Divisions, the 3rd under Lieutenant General Sir W.P. Pulteney, 8th and 34th Divisions, 
the 15th under Lieutenant General Holm, 21st and 7th Divisions, and the 13th under Lieutenant General Congreve, V.C., 18th and 30th Divisions. A subsidiary attack on the extreme left at Gom Corps was to be made by Allenby's 3rd Army, the 7th Corps under Sir T. Snow, containing the 46th and 56th Divisions. Behind in the back areas lay the nucleus of another army, called first the Reserve, and afterwards the Fifth, under General Sir Hubert Gough, which at this time was mainly composed of cavalry divisions. It was a cadre which would receive its complement of infantry when the occasion arose. The French striking force lay from Maracor astride the Somme to opposite the village of Fay. It was the 6th Army, once Castelnau's, and now under General Fayol, one of the most distinguished of French artillerymen. Verdun had made impossible the array of 39 divisions which Foch had contemplated, and Fayol mustered only 16, including the three divisions of the famous 20th Corps. Patin's wise plan of allowing no formation to be used up now received ample justification. The units allotted to the new offensive were all troops who had seen hard fighting, but the edge of their temper was undulled. South of Fayol lay the Tenth Army, once Durbal's, but now commanded by General Michelet. Its part for the present was to wait. Its turn would come when the time arrived to broaden the front of assault. About the middle of June, on the whole front held by the British, and on the French front north and south of the Somme, there began an intermittent bombardment of the German lines. There were raids at different places, partly to mislead the enemy as to the real point of assault, and partly to identify the German units opposed to us. During these days, too, there were many fights in the air, it was essential to prevent German airplanes from crossing our front and observing our preparations. Our own machines scouted far into the enemy hinterland, reconnoitring and destroying. On Saturday, the 24th of June, the bombardment became intenser. It fell everywhere on the front. German trenches were obliterated at Ypres and Arras, as well as at Beaumont-Hamel and Fricourt. There is nothing harder to measure than the relative force of such a preparation. But had a dispassionate observer been seated in the clouds, he would have noted that from Goncourt to a mile or two south of the Somme, the Allied fire was especially methodical and persistent. On Wednesday, the 28th of June, from any artillery observation post in that region, it seemed as if a complete devastation had been achieved. Some things like broken telegraph poles were all that remained of what, a week before, had been leafy copses. Villages had become heaps of rubble. Traveling at night on the roads behind the front from Bethune to Amiens, the whole eastern sky was lit up with what seemed fitful summer lightning. But there was curiously little noise. In Amiens, a score or so of miles from the firing line, the guns were rarely heard, whereas fifty miles from Ypres, they sounded like a roll of drums and woke a man in the night. The configuration of that part of Picardy muffles sound, and the country folk call it the silent land. All the last week of June the weather was gray and cloudy, with a thick fog on the uplands, which made air work unsatisfactory. There were flying showers of rain, and the roads were deep in mire. At the front, through the haze, the guns flashed incessantly, troops were everywhere on the move, and the shifting of ammunition dumps nearer to the firing line foretold what was coming. There was a curious exhilaration, too, for men felt that the great offensive had arrived, that this was no flash in the pan, but a movement conceived on the grand scale as to guns and men, which would not cease until the decision was reached. But as the hours passed in mist and wet, 
it seemed as if the fates were unpropitious. Then, on the last afternoon of June, there came a sudden change. The pall of cloud cleared away, and all Picardy swam in the translucent blue of a summer evening. That night orders went out. The attack was to be delivered next morning, three hours after dawn. The first day of July dawned hot and cloudless. Though a thin fog, the relic of the damp of the past week, clung to the hollows. At half-past five, the hill just west of Albert offered a singular view. It was almost in the center of the section allotted to the Allied attack, and from it the eye could range on the left, up and beyond the Ancre Glen, to the high ground around Beaumont-Hamel and Serre. In front, to the great lift of tableland behind which lay Bapaume, and to the right, past the woods of Fricourt to the valley of the Somme. Every slope to the east was wreathed in smoke, which blew aside now and then and revealed a patch of wood or a church spire. In the foreground lay Albert, the target of an occasional German shell, with its shattered Church of Notre-Dame de Bébrère and the famous gilt virgin hanging head downward from the Campanile. All along the Allied front, a couple of miles behind the line, captive kite balloons glittered in the sunlight. Every gun on a front of twenty-five miles was speaking, and speaking without pause. In that week's bombardment, more light and medium ammunition was expended than the total amount manufactured in Britain during the first eleven months of war, while the heavy stuff produced during the same period would not have kept our guns going for a single day. Great spurts of dust on the slopes showed where a heavy shell had burst, and black and white gouts of smoke dotted the middle distance like the little fires in a French autumn field. Lace-like shrapnel wreaths hung in the sky, melting into the morning haze. The noise was strangely uniform, a steady rumbling as if the solid earth were muttering in a nightmare, and it was hard to distinguish the deep tones of the heavies, the vicious whip-like crack of the field guns, and the bark of the trench mortars. About 7.15, the bombardment rose to that hurricane pitch of fury which betokened its close. It was as if titanic machine guns were at work round all the horizon. Then appeared a marvelous sight, the solid spouting of the enemy slopes, as if they were lines of reefs on which a strong tide was breaking. In such a hell it seemed that no human thing could live. Through the thin summer vapor and the thicker smoke which clung to the foreground, there were visions of a countryside actually moving, moving bodily and in debris into the air. And now there was a fresh sound, a series of abrupt and rapid bursts which came gustily from the first lines. These were the new Stokes trench mortars, wonderful little engines of death. There was another sound, too, from the north, as if the cannonading had suddenly come nearer, it looked as if the Germans had begun a counter-bombardment on part of the British front line. The staff officers glanced at their watches, and at half-past seven precisely there came a lull. It lasted for a second or two, and then the guns continued their tale. But the range had been lengthened everywhere, and from a bombardment the fire had become a barrage— for on a twenty-five-mile front, the Allied infantry had crossed the parapets. End of chapter 62, part 1. End of section 18. Section 19 of A History of the Great War, Volume 3, The Beleaguered Fortress, Continued, and the Great Sallies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
A History of the Great War, Volume 3, by John Buchan. Chapter 62. The Battle of the Somme, June 24th through September 9, 1916. Part 2. The point of view of the hilltop was not that of the men in the front trenches. The crossing of the parapets was the supreme moment in modern war. The troops were outside defenses, moving across the open to investigate the unknown. It was the culmination of months of training for officers and men, and the least sensitive felt the drama of the crisis. It was the first great action fought by the new armies of Britain in their full strength. Most of the troops engaged had 20 months before been employed in peaceable civilian trades. In their ranks were every class and condition. Miners from North England, factory hands from the industrial centers, clerks and shop boys, plowmen and shepherds, Saxon and Celt, college graduates and dock laborers, men who in the wild places of the earth had often faced danger, and men whose chief adventure had been a Sunday bicycle ride. Nerves may be attuned to the normal risks of trench warfare, and yet shrink from the desperate hazard of a charge into the enemy's line. But to one who visited the front before the attack, the most vivid impression was that of quiet cheerfulness. There were few shirkers, and not many who wished themselves elsewhere. One man's imagination might be more active than another's, but the will to fight, and to fight desperately, was universal. With the happy gift of the British soldier, they had turned the ghastly business of war into something homely and familiar. Accordingly, they took everything as part of the day's work and awaited the supreme moment without heroics and without tremor, confident in themselves, confident in their guns, and confident in the triumph of their cause. There was no savage lust of battle, but that far more formidable thing, a resolution which needed no rhetoric to support it. Norfolk's words were true of every man of them. As gentle and as jocund as to jest, go I to fight. Truth hath a quiet breast. The British aim in this, the opening stage of the battle, was the German first position. In the section of assault, running from north to south, it covered Gomcourt, passed east of Ebuterne, followed the high ground in front of Serre and beaumont -Amel, and crossed the Ancre a little to the northwest of Thiepval. It ran in front of Thiepval, which was strongly fortified, east of Autuy, and just covered the hamlets of Ovier and La Boisselle. There it ran about a mile and a quarter east of Albert. It then passed south, round the woodland village of Fricourt, where it turned at right angles to the east, covering Mametz and Montempon. Halfway between Maracourt and Hardacourt, it turned south again, covered Curlou, crossed the Somme at the wide marsh near the place called Vaux, covered Fries and Dompierre and Soyocourt, and passed just east of Lihon, where it left the sector with which we are now concerned. In the British area, the main assault was to be delivered between Maracourt and the Ancre. The attack from that river to Gomcourt was meant to be subsidiary. It is clear that the Germans expected the movement of the Allies, and had made a fairly accurate guess as to its terrain. They assumed that the area would be from Arras to Albert. In all that stretch, they were ready with a full concentration of men and guns. South of Albert, they were less prepared, and south of the Somme, they were caught napping. 
The history of the first day was therefore the story of two separate actions, in the north and south, in the first of which the Allies failed, and in the second of which they brilliantly succeeded. By the evening, the first action had definitely closed, and the weight of the Allies was flung wholly into the second. That is almost inevitable in an attack on a very broad front. Some part will be found tougher than the rest, and that part having been tried will be relinquished. But it is the stubbornness of the knot and the failure to take it which are the price of success elsewhere. Let us first tell the tale of the desperate struggle between Goncourt and Thiepval. The divisions in action there had to face a chain of fortified villages, Goncourt, Serre, Beaumont-Amel, and Thiepval, and enemy positions which were generally on higher and better ground. The Ancre cut the line in two, with steep slopes rising from the valley bottom. Each village had been so fortified as to be almost impregnable, with a maze of catacombs, often two stories deep, where whole battalions could take refuge. Underground passages from the firing line to sheltered places in the rear, and pits into which machine guns could be lowered during a bombardment. On the plateau behind, with excellent direct observation, the Germans had their guns massed. It was this direct observation and the deep shelters for machine guns which were the undoing of the British attack from Goncourt to Thiepval. As our bombardment grew more intense on the morning of the 1st of July, so did the enemies. Before we could go over the parapets, the Germans had plastered our front trenches with high explosives and in many places blotted them out. All along our line, 50 yards before and behind the first trench, they dropped 6-inch and 8-inch high explosive shells. The result was that our men, instead of forming up in the front trench, were compelled to form up in the open ground behind, for the front trench had disappeared. In addition to this, there was an intense shrapnel barrage, which must have been directed by observers, for it followed our troops as they moved forward. As our men began to cross no man's land, the Germans seemed to man their ruined parapets and fired rapidly with automatic rifles and machine guns. They had special light musketon battalions, armed with machine guns and automatic rifles, who showed marvelous intrepidity, some even pushing their guns into no man's land to enfilade our advance. Moreover, they had machine gun pits far in front of their parapets, connected with their trenches by deep tunnels secure from shell fire. The British moved forward in line after line, dressed as if on parade, not a man wavered or broke rank. But minute by minute, the ordered lines melted away under the deluge of high explosive, shrapnel, rifle, and machine gun fire. There was no question about the German weight of artillery. From dawn till long afternoon, they maintained this steady, drenching fire. Gallant individuals or isolated detachments managed here and there to break into the enemy position, and some even penetrated well behind it. But these were episodes, and the ground they won could not be held. By the evening, from Gomcourt to Thiepval, the attack had been everywhere checked, and our troops, what was left of them, were back again in their old line they had struck the core of the main German defense. In that stubborn action against impossible odds, the gallantry was so universal and absolute that it is idle to select special cases. In each mile, there were men who performed the incredible. Nearly every English, Scots, and Irish regiment was represented, as well as Midland and London territorials, a gallant little company of Rhodesians, and a Newfoundland battalion 
drawn from the hard-bitten fishermen of that iron coast who lost terribly on the slopes of beaumont -Tamel. Repeatedly the German position was pierced. At Serre, fragments of two battalions pushed as far as Pendant Copps, 2,000 yards from the British lines. Troops of the 29th Division broke through south of beaumont and got to the station road beyond the quarry, but few ever returned. One Scottish battalion entered Thiepval village. North of Thiepval, the Ulster Division broke through the enemy trenches, passed the crest of the ridge, and reached the point called the Crucifix, in rear of the first German position. For a little, they held the strong Schwaben Redoubt, which we were not to enter again till after three months of battle, and some even got into the outskirts of Grand Cour. It was the anniversary day of the Battle of the Boyne, and that charge when the men shouted, Remember the Boyne, will be forever a glorious page in the annals of Ulster. The splendid troops, drawn from those volunteers who had banded themselves together to defend their own freedom, now shed their blood like water for the liberty of the world. That grim struggle from Thiepval northward was responsible for by far the greater number of the Allied losses of the day. But though costly, it was not fruitless, for it occupied the bulk of the German defense. It was the price which had to be paid for the advance on the rest of the front. For while in the north the living wave broke vainly and gained little, in the south, by creeks and inlets making, the tide was flowing strongly shoreward. The map will show that Free Corps formed a bold salient, and it was the Allied purpose not to assault the salient, but to cut it off. An advance on Ovier and La Boisselle, and up the long shallow depression toward Contremaison, which our men called Sausage Valley, would, if united with the carrying of Mametz, pinch it so tightly that it must fall. Ovier and La Boisselle were strongly fortified villages, and on this first day, while we won the outskirts and carried the entrenchments before them, we did not control the ruins which our guns had pounded out of the shape of habitable dwellings, though elements of one brigade actually penetrated into La Boiselle and held a portion of the village. Just west of Free Corps, the 21st Division was engaged, the division which had suffered grave misfortunes at Luz. That day it recovered its own, and proved once again that an enemy can meet no more formidable foes than British troops which have a score to wipe off. It made no mistake, but poured resolutely into the angle east of Sausage Valley, carrying losange wood and round wood, and driving in a deep wedge north of Fricourt. Before evening, Mametz fell. Its church stood up, a broken tooth of masonry among the shattered houses, with an amphitheater of splintered woods behind and around it. South of it ran a high road, and south of the road lay a little hill, with the German trench lines on the southern side. Opposite Mametz, our assembly trenches had been destroyed by the enemy's fire, so that the attacking infantry had to advance over 400 yards of open ground. The 7th Division which took the place was one of the most renowned in the British Army. It had fought at First Ypres, at Festubert, and at Luz. Since the autumn of 1914, it had been changed in its composition. But there were in it battalions which had been for twenty months in the field. The whole division, old and new alike, went forward to their task as if it were their first day of war. On the slopes of the little hill, three battalions advanced in line, one from a southern English county, one from a northern city, 
one of Highland regulars. They carried everything before them, and to one who followed their track, the regularity of their advance was astonishing, for the dead lay aligned as if on some parade. Montauban fell early in the day to the 30th Division. The British lines lay in the hollow north of the albert Perron Road, where stood the hamlet of Carnoy. On the crest of the ridge beyond lay Montauban, now, like most Santerre villages, a few broken walls set among splintered trees. The brick fields on the right were expected to be the scene of a fierce struggle, but to our amazement they had been so shattered by our guns that they were taken easily. The Montauban attack was perhaps the most perfect of the episodes of the day. The artillery had done its work, and the 6th Bavarian Regiment opposed to us lost 3,000 of a total strength of 3,500. At that point was seen a sight hitherto unwitnessed in the campaign, the advance in line of the troops of Britain and France. On the British right lay the 20th Corps, the corps which had held the Grand Couronne of Nancy in the feverish days of the Marne battle and which by its counterattack at Douaumont on that snowy 26th of February had turned the tide at Verdun. It was the 39th Division, under General Nourisson, which moved in line with the British, horizon blue beside khaki, and behind both the comforting bark of the 75s. From the point of junction with the British, for eight miles southward, the French advanced with lightning speed and complete success. From Maricourt to the Somme, the country was still upland, but lower than the region to the north. South of the marshy Somme Valley, an undulating plain stretched east to the great crook of the river beyond which lay Peron, a fortress girdled by its moat of three streams. Foch had planned his advance on the same lines as the British, the same methodical preparation, the same limited objective for each stage. North of the Somme there was a stiff fight on the albert Perron Road, at the cliff abutting on the river called the Gendarme's Hat, and in front of the villages of Curlou and Hardecourt. Of these, on that first day of July, the French reached the outskirts, as we reached the outskirts of Fricourt and La Poiselle, but had to postpone their capture till the morrow. South of the river, the Colonial Corps, whose attack did not begin till 9.30 a.m., took the enemy completely by surprise. Officers were captured shaving in their dugouts, whole battalions were rounded up, and all was done with the minimum of loss. One French regiment had two casualties. Eight hundred was the total for one division. Long ere evening, the villages of Dompierre, Beckincourt, and Boussou were in their hands, and five miles had been bitten out of the German front. Fay was taken the same day by the French 35th Corps. Between them, the Allies in twelve hours had captured the enemy first position in its entirety, from Mametz to Fay, a front of fourteen miles. Some six thousand prisoners were in their hands, and a great quantity of guns and stores. In the powdered trenches, in the woods and valleys behind, and in the labyrinths of ruined dwellings, the German dead lay thick. That is the purpose of the battle, said a French officer. We do not want guns, for Krupp can make them faster than we can take them. But Krupp cannot make men. Sunday, the 2nd of July, was a day of level heat, when the dust stood in steady walls on every road behind the front and in the tortured areas of the captured ground. The success of the Saturday had, as we have seen, put the British right wing well in advance of their centre, and it was necessary to bring forward the left part of the line from Thiepval to Fricourt 
so as to make the breach in the German position uniform over a broad enough front. The extreme British left was now inactive. A new attack in the circumstances would have given no results, and the Ulster Division, what remained of its advanced guard, fell back from the Schwaben Redoubt to its original line. The front was rapidly getting too large and intricate for any single army commander to handle, so it was resolved to give the terrain north of the albert Bopom Road, including the area of the 4th and 8th Corps, to the Reserve or 5th Army under Sir Hubert Goff. All that day, a fierce struggle was waged by the British 3rd Corps at Ovier and La Boiselle. Two new divisions, the 12th and the 19th, had entered the line. At Ovier, the 12th carried the entrenchments before it, and late in the evening, the 19th succeeded in entering the labyrinth of cellars, the ruins of what had been La Boiselle. The 34th Division on their right, pushing across Sausage Valley, came to the skirts of the round wood. As yet, there was no counterattack. The surprise in the south had been too great, and the Germans had not yet brought up their reserve divisions. All that day, squadrons of Allied airplanes bombed depots and lines of communications in the German hinterland. The long echelons of the Allied sausages glittered in the sun, but only one German kite balloon could be detected. We had found a way the Verdun way, of bombing those fragile gas bags and turning them into wisps of flame. The Fokkers strove in vain to check our airmen, and at least two were brought crashing to the earth. At noon on Sunday, Fricourt fell. The taking of Mametz and the positions won in the Fricourt wood to the east had made its capture certain. The 21st Division took Roundwood. The 17th, brought up from Corps Reserve, attacked across the fricourt Contomaison Road, and the 7th carried the village. During the night, part of the garrison had slipped out, but when our men entered it, bombing from house to house, they made a great haul of prisoners and guns. Early that morning, The Germans had counterattacked at Montauban and been easily repulsed, and during the day our patrols were pushing east into the Bernafay wood. Farther south, the French continued their victorious progress. They destroyed a German counterattack on the new position at Hardecourt. They took Curlou, and south of the river they took Frise and the wood of Morocourt beyond it and the strongly fortified village of Erbacor. They did more, for at many points between the river and Assevier, they broke into the German second position. Fayol's left now commanded the light railway from Comble to Peron. His center held the big loop of the Somme at Frise, and his right was only four miles from Peron itself. On Monday, the 3rd of July, Fritz von Below issued an order to his troops, which showed that he had no delusion as to the gravity of the Allied offensive. The decisive issue of the war, he said, depends on the victory of the Second Army on the Somme. The important ground lost in certain places will be recaptured by our attack after the arrival of reinforcements. The vital thing is to hold on to our present positions at all costs and to improve them. I forbid the voluntary evacuation of trenches. He had correctly estimated the position. The old ground, with all it held, must be rewon if possible. No more must be lost. Fresh lines must be constructed in the rear but the new improvised lines could be no equivalent of those mighty fastnesses which represented the work of 18 months. Therefore, those fastnesses must be regained. 
we shall learn how ill his enterprise prospered. For a correct understanding of the position on Monday, the 3rd of July, it is necessary to recall the exact alignment of the new British front. It fell into two sections. The first lay from Thiepval to Fricourt, and was bisected by the albert Bopome Road, which ran like an arrow over the watershed. Here, Thiepval, Ovier, and La Boisselle were positions in the German first line. Contomaison, to the east of La Boiselle, was a strongly fortified village on high ground, which formed, so to speak, a pivot in the German intermediate line, the line which covered their field guns. The second position ran through Pozières to the two Bazatins and on to Guimont. On the morning of 3rd July, the British had not got Thiepval nor Ovier. They had only a portion of La Boiselle, but south of it, they had broken through the first position and were well on the road to Cantomaison. All this northern section consisted of bare, undulating slopes, once covered with crops, but now powdered and bare like some alkali desert. Everywhere it was seamed with the scars of trenches and pockmarked with shell holes. The few trees lining the roads had been long raised, and the only vegetation was coarse grass, thistles, and the ubiquitous poppy and mustard. The southern section, from Fricourt to Montauban, was of a different character. It was patched with large woods, curiously clean-cut like the copses in the park of a country house. A line of them ran from Fricourt northeastward. Fricourt wood, bottom wood, the big wood of Mametz, the woods of Bazatin, and the wood of Faro, which our men called high wood while from Montauban ran a second line, the woods of Bernafay and Trons, and Delvie Wood around Loncoval. Here all the Germans' first position had been captured. The second position ran through the Bazatins, Loncoval, and Guimont, but to reach it some difficult woodland country had to be traversed. On the 3rd of July, therefore, the southern half of the British line was advancing against the enemy's second position, while the northern half had still for its objective Ovier and La Boisselle in the first position, and the intermediate point, Cantomaison. It will be convenient to take the two sections separately, since their problems were different, and see the progress of the British advance in each preparatory to the assault on the enemy's second line. In the north, our task was to carry the three fortified places, Ovier, La Boisselle, and Cantomaison, which were, on a large scale, the equivalent of the Fortress, manned by machine guns, which we had known to our cost at Festubert and Luce. The German troops in this area obeyed to the full Below's instructions, and fought hard for every acre. On the night of Sunday, the 2nd of July, La Boiselle was penetrated, and all Monday the struggle swayed around that village and Ovier. La Boiselle lay on the right of the high road. Ovier was to the north and a little to the east, separated by a dry hollow which we called Mash Valley. On Monday, the 12th Division attacked south of Thiepval, but failed to advance, largely because its left flank was unsupported. All night, the struggle seesawed, our troops winning ground and the Germans winning back small portions. On Tuesday, the 4th, the heat wave broke in thunderstorms and torrential rain, and the dusty hollows became quagmires. Next morning, La Boiselle was finally carried, after one of the bloodiest contests of the battle, 
and the attack was carried forwards toward Bailiff Wood and Canton Maison. That day, Wednesday the 5th, we attacked the main defenses of Canton Maison from the west. On Friday, the 7th of July, came the first big attack on Canton Maison from Sausage Valley on the southwest and from the tangle of copses northeast of Fricourt, through which ran the fricourt Canton Maison High Road. On the latter side, good work had already been done, the enemy fortress at Birch Tree Wood and Shelter Wood, and the work called the Quadrangle having been taken on the 3rd of July, along with 1,100 prisoners. On the Friday, the attack ranged from the Leipzig Redoubt, south of Thiepval, and the environs of Ovier to the skirts of Canton Maison. About noon, the infantry of the 19th Division after carrying Bailiff Wood, took Canton Maison by storm, releasing a small party of Northumberland fusiliers who had been made prisoners four days earlier. The Third Guard Division, the famous cockchafers, were now our opponents. They were heavily punished, and 700 of them fell as prisoners into our hands. But our success at Canton Maison was beyond our strength to maintain, and in the afternoon a counterattack forced us out of the village. That same day, the 12th and 25th Divisions had pushed their front nearly half a mile along the Bapaume Road, east of La Boiselle, and taken most of the Leipzig Redoubt. Ovier was now in danger of envelopment. One brigade had attacked in front, and another, pressing in on the northeast flank, was cutting the position in two. All that day there was a deluge of rain, and the sodden ground and flooded trenches crippled the movement of our men. Next day, the struggle for Ovier continued. The place was now a mass of battered trenches, rubble and muddy shell holes, and Every yard had to be fought for. We were also slowly consolidating our ground around Canton Maison and driving the Germans from their strongholds in the little copses. Ever since the 7th of July, we had held the southern corner of the village. On the night of Monday, the 10th, pushing from Bailiff Wood on the west side in four successive waves, with the guns lifting the range in front of them, a brigade of the 23rd Division broke into the northwest corner, swept round on the north, and after bitter hand-to-hand -hand fighting, conquered the whole village. As for Ovier, it was now surrounded and beyond succor, and it was only a question of days till its stubborn garrison must yield. It did not actually fall till Sunday, the 16th of July, when the gallant remnant, two officers and 124 guardsmen, surrendered to the 25th Division. By that time, our main battle had swept far to the eastward. To turn to the southern sector, where the problem was to clear out the fortified woods which intervened between us and the German second line, from the crest of the first ridge behind Fricourt and Montauban, one looked into a shallow trough called Caterpillar Valley, beyond which the ground rose to the bazentin longueval line. On the left, toward Canton Maison, was the big Mamet's Wood. To the right, beyond Montauban, the pear-shaped woods of Bernafay and Troms. On Monday the 3rd, the ground east of Fricourt Wood was cleared and the approaches to Mamet's Wood won. That day, a German counterattack developed. A fresh division arrived at Montauban, which was faithfully handled by our guns. The milking of the line had begun, for a battalion from the Champagne front appeared east of Mamet's early on Monday morning. Within a very short time of detraining at Railhead, 
the whole battalion had been destroyed or made prisoners. In one small area, over a thousand men were taken. Next day, Tuesday, the 4th of July, we had entered the wood of Mametz, 3,000 yards north of Mametz village, and had taken the wood of Bernafay. These intermediate positions were not acquired without a grim struggle. The woods were thick with undergrowth, which had not been cut for two seasons, and though our artillery played havoc with the trees, it could not clear away the tangled shrubbery beneath them. The Germans had filled the place with machine gun redoubts, connected by concealed trenches, and in some cases, they had machine guns in positions in the trees. Each step in our advance had to be fought for, and in that briery labyrinth, the battle tended always to become a series of individual combats. Every position we won was subjected at once to a heavy counter-bombardment. During the first two days of July, it was possible to move in moderate safety almost up to the British firing lines. But from the 4th onward, the enemy kept up a steady bombardment of our whole new front and barraged heavily in all the hinterland around Fricourt, Mametz, and Montauban. On Saturday, the 8th of July, the 30th Division made a lodgment in the wood of Trons, assisted by the flanking fire of the French guns. On that day, the French on our right were advancing toward Maltzorn Farm. For the next five days, Trones Wood was the hottest corner in the southern British sector. Its peculiar situation gave every chance to the defense. There was only one covered approach to it from the west, by way of the trench called Trones Alley. The southern part was commanded by the Maltzhorn Ridge, and the northern by the German position at Longueval. Around the wood to north and east, the enemy's second line lay in a half moon, so that they could concentrate upon it a converging artillery fire, and could feed their own garrison in the place with reserves at their pleasure. Finally, the denseness of the covert cut only by the railway clearings and the German communication trenches, made organized movement impossible. It was not till our pressure elsewhere diverted the German artillery fire that the wood as a whole could be won. Slowly and stubbornly, we pushed our way northwards from our point of lodgment in the southern end. Six counterattacks were launched against us on Sunday night and Monday, and on Monday afternoon, the 6th succeeded in winning back some of the wood. These desperate efforts exactly suited our purpose, for the German losses under our artillery fire were enormous. The fighting was continued on Tuesday, when we recaptured the whole of the wood except the extreme northern corner. That same day, we approached the north end of Mamet's wood. The difficulty of the fighting and the strength of the defense may be realized from the fact that the taking of a few hundred yards or so of woodland meant invariably the capture of several hundred prisoners. By Wednesday evening, the 12th of July, the 21st Division had taken virtually the whole of Mamet's wood, its 200-odd acres, interlaced with barbed wire, honeycombed with trenches, and bristling with machine guns, had given us a tough struggle, especially the last strip on the north side, where the German machine gun positions enfiladed every advance. Next day, we cleared this corner and broke out of the wood and were face to face at last with the main German second position. Meantime, the wood of Trons had become a Tom Tiddler's ground, which neither antagonist could fully claim or use as a base. It was at the mercy of the artillery fire of both sides, and it was impossible in the time to construct shell-proof defenses. 
in the French sector, the advance had been swift and continuous. The attack, as we have seen, was a complete surprise. For half an hour before it began on the 1st of July, an order was issued to the German troops predicting the imminent fall of Verdun and announcing that a French offensive elsewhere had thereby been prevented. On the nine-mile front from Maricourt to Estrees, the German first position had been carried the first day. The heavy guns, when they had sufficiently pounded it, ceased their fire. Then the 75s took up the tail and plastered the front and communication trenches with shrapnel. Then a skirmishing line advanced to report the damage done. And finally the infantry moved forward to an easy occupation. It had been the German method at Verdun, but it was practiced by the French with far greater precision and with better fighting material. On Monday, the 3rd of July, they had broken into the German second position, south of the Somme. Twelve German battalions were hurried up from the Ain, only to be destroyed. By the next day, the Foreign Legion of the Colonial Corps had taken Bloyen Santerre, a point in the third line. On Wednesday, the 35th Corps had the better part of Estrees and were within three miles of Peron. Counterattacks by the German 17th Division, which had been brought up in support, achieved nothing, and the German railhead was moved from Peron to Schon. On the night of Sunday, the 9th of July, Fayol took Biache, a mile from Peron, and the high ground called La Maisonette, and held a front from there to north of Barlow, a position beyond the German third line. There was now nothing in front of him in this section except the line of the Upper Somme. This was south of the river. North of it, he had attained points in the second line, but had not yet carried it wholly from Ham northwards. The deep and broad wedge which their center had driven towards Peron gave the French positions for a flanking fire on the enemy ground on the left. Their artillery, even the heavies, was now far forward in the open, and old peasants beyond the Somme, waiting patiently in their captivity, heard the guns of their countrymen sounding daily nearer. In less than a fortnight, Fayol had, on a front ten miles long, with a maximum depth of six and a half miles, carried fifty square miles of fortifications and captured eighty-five guns, vast quantities of war material, 236 officers, and 12,000 men. The next step was for the British to attack the enemy's second position before them. It ran, as we have seen, from Pozières through the Bazatins and Longval to Guillemont. On Thursday, the 13th of July, we were in a condition to begin the next stage of our advance. The capture of Contemaison had been the indispensable preliminary, and immediately following its fall, Sir Douglas Haig issued his first summary. After ten days and nights of continuous fighting, our troops have completed the methodical capture of the whole of the enemy's first system of defense on a front of 14,000 yards. This system of defense consisted of numerous and continuous lines of fire trenches, extending to various depths of from 2,000 to 4,000 yards, and included five strongly fortified villages, numerous heavily wired and entrenched woods, and a large number of immensely strong redoubts. The capture of each of these trenches represented an operation of some importance, and the whole of them are now in our hands. The summary did not err from overstatement. If the northern part of our front, from Thiepval to Goncourt, had not succeeded, the southern part had steadily bitten its way into as strong a position as any area of the campaign could show. 
the Allies had already attracted against them the bulk of the available German reserves and had largely destroyed them. The strength of their plan lay in its deliberateness and the mathematical sequence of its stages. End of chapter 62, part 2, end of section 19. Section 20 of A History of the Great War, Volume 3, The Beleaguered Fortress, Continued, and The Great Sallies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of the Great War, Volume 3, by John Buchan. Chapter 62. The Battle of the Somme, June 24th through September 9th, 1916. Part 3. At dawn on Friday, the 14th, began the second stage of the battle. The most methodical action has its gambling element, its moments when a risk must be boldly taken. Without such hazards, there can be no chance of surprise. The British attacks of the 14th of July had much of this calculated audacity. In certain parts, as at Cantalmaison Villa and Mamet's Wood, we held positions within a few hundred yards of the enemy's line. But in the section from bazatin le grand to Longval, there was a long advance, in some places almost a mile, before us, up the slopes north of Caterpillar Valley. On the extreme right, the Wood of Trones gave us a somewhat indifferent place of assembly. The decision, wrote Sir Douglas Haig, to attempt a night attack of this magnitude with an army, the bulk of which had been raised since the beginning of the war, was perhaps the highest tribute that could be paid to the quality of our troops. The difficulties before the British attack were so great that more than one distinguished French officer doubted its possibility. The day of the attack was of fortunate omen, for the 14th of July was the anniversary of the fall of the Bastille, the fete day of France. In Paris, there was such a parade as that city had not seen in its long history, a procession of Allied troops, Belgians, Russians, British infantry, and last of all, the blue-coated heroes of France's incomparable line. It was a shining proof to the world of the unity of the Alliance. And on the same day, while the Paris crowd was cheering the Scottish pipers as they swung down the boulevards, the British troops in Picardy were breaking through the German line, crying, Vive la France! in all varieties of accent. It was France's day in the eyes of every soldier, the sacred day of that people whom in farm and village and trench they had come to reverence and love. The front chosen for attack was from a point southeast of Pozier to Longval and Delvy Wood, a space of some four miles. Incidentally, it was necessary for our right flank to clear the wood of Trones. Each village in the second line had its adjacent or enfolding wood, Bazatin le Petit, Bazatin le Grand, and at Longval, the big wood of Delvie. In the center, a mile and more beyond the German position, the wood of Foreau, which we called High Wood, hung like a dark cloud on the skyline. The British plan was for the Third Corps on the left to form a defensive flank, pushing out patrols in the direction of Pozier. On its right, the XV Corps moved against bazatin le petit Wood and Village, and the slopes leading up to High Wood. On their right, again, the XIII Corps was to take bazatin le grand to carry Longval and Delvie Wood, and to clear Trones Wood and form a defensive flank. 
In the event of a rapid success, the occasion might arise for the use of cavalry, so cavalry divisions were put under the orders of the two corps. The preceding bombardment was to be assisted by the French heavy guns firing on Ginchy, Guimont, and Luz and Boulot Woods. In order to distract the enemy, the Eighth Corps north of the Ancre attacked with gas and smoke, as if there was to be the main area of our effort. At 3.25 a.m., when the cloudy dawn had fully come, the infantry attacked. So complete was the surprise that in the dark the battalions which had the farthest road to go came within 200 yards of the enemy's wire with scarcely a casualty. When the German barrage came, it fell behind them. The attack failed nowhere. In some parts it was slower than others, where the enemy's defense had been less comprehensively destroyed. But by the afternoon, all our tasks had been accomplished. To take one instance, the two attacking brigades of the 3rd Division were each composed of two battalions of the new army and two of the old regulars. The general commanding put the four new battalions into the first line. The experiment proved the worth of the new troops, for a little after midday their work was done. Their part of the German second line was taken, and 662 unwounded men, 36 officers, including a battalion commander, four howitzers, four field guns, and 14 machine guns were in their hands. The 21st Division had Bazatin le Petit Wood and Village, and the 7th was far up the slopes towards High Wood, after taking Bazatin le Grand Wood. The 3rd Division had Bazatin le Grand, and the 9th had all but a small part of Longval. Trones Wood had been cleared, and a line was held eastward to Maltzorn Farm. By the evening, we had the whole second line, from Bazatin le Petit to Longval, a front of over three miles, and in the 24 hours battle, we took over 2,000 prisoners, many of them of the 3rd Division of the German Guard. The audacious enterprise had been crowned with a miraculous success. The great event of the day fell in the late afternoon. The 7th Division, pushing northward against the 10th Bavarian Division, penetrated the enemy's 3rd position at Highwood, having their flank supported by cavalry. It was 6.15 when the advance was made, the first in 18 months which had seen the use of our mounted men. In the Champagne battle of 25th September, the French had used some squadrons of General Baratier's colonial horse in the ground between the first and second German lines to sweep up prisoners and capture guns. This tactical expedient was now followed by the British, with the difference that in Champagne the fortified second line had not been taken, while in Picardy we were through the two main fortifications and operating against a more or less improvised position. The cavalry used were a troop of the 7th Dragoon Guards and a troop of the Decan Horse. They made their way up the shallow valley beyond bazatin le grand finding cover in the slope of the ground and the growing corn. The final advance, about 8 p.m., was made partly on foot and partly on horseback, and the enemy in the corn were ridden down, captured, or slain with lance and saber. The cavalry then set to work to entrench themselves, to protect the flank of the advancing infantry in Highwood. It was a clean and workmanlike job, and the news of it exhilarated the whole line. That cavalry should be used at all 
seemed to forecast the end of the long trench fighting and the beginning of a campaign in the open. On Saturday, the 15th of July, we were busy consolidating the ground one, and at some points pushing farther. Our aircraft, in spite of the haze, were never idle, and in 24 hours they destroyed four Fokkers, three biplanes, and a double-engine plane without the loss of a single machine. On the left, the 19th Division fought its way to the skirts of Pozier, attacked the Leipzig Redoubt south of Thiepval, and continued the struggle for Ovier. The 23rd Division advanced against the new switch line by which the Germans had connected the uncaptured portion of the second position with their third. The 7th Division lost most of Highwood under the pressure of counterattacks by the German 7th Division, and next day we withdrew all troops from the place. They had done their work and had formed a screen behind which we had consolidated our line. On the right, around Longueval and Delvie Wood, was being waged the fiercest contest of all. The position there was now an awkward salient, for our front ran on one side westward to Pozier, and on the other southward to Maltzorn Farm. The 9th Division concerned had on the 14th taken the greater part of the village, and on the morning of the 15th, its reserve brigade, the South African under Brigadier General Lucan, was ordered to clear the wood. The struggle which began on that Saturday before dawn was to last for 13 days and to prove one of the costliest episodes of the whole battle. The situation was an ideal one for the defense. Longval lay to the southwest of the wood, a straggling village with orchards at its northern end where the road climbed towards Flares. Delvie itself was a mass of broken tree trunks, matted undergrowth and shell holes. It had rides cut in it, running from north to south and from east to west, which were called by such names as The Strand and Prince's Street, and along these were the enemy trenches. The place was terribly at the mercy of the enemy guns, and on the north and southeast sides the Germans had a strong trench line, some seventy yards from the trees, bristling with machine guns. The problem for the attack was far less to carry the wood than to hold it, for as soon as the perimeter was reached, our men came under machine gun fire while the whole interior was incessantly bombarded. The South African Brigade carried the wood by noon on the 15th, but the other brigades did not obtain the whole of Longval, and the enemy, from the northern end of the village, was able to counterattack and force us back. The South Africans tried again on the 16th, but they had no chance under the hostile fire, and a counterattack of the German 8th Division forced them in on the central alley. Again on the 17th, they endeavored to clear the place, and again, with heavy losses, they failed. But they clung desperately to the southwest corner, and it was not until the 20th that they were relieved. For four days, the heroic remnant, under Lieutenant Colonel Thackeray of the 3rd Battalion, along with the Scots of the other brigades, wrestled in hand-to-hand -hand fighting such as the American armies knew in the last wilderness campaign. Their assault had been splendid, but their defense was a greater exploit. They hung on without food or water, while their ranks were terribly thinned, and at the end, when one battalion had lost all its officers, they repulsed an attack by the German 5th Division, the corps d'élite of Brandenburg. In this far-flung battle, all parts of the empire won fame, 
and not least was the glory of the South African contingent. Footnote. Delvi Wood was not wholly in our hands till the attack of the 25th of August. The story of the South African stand may be read in the present writer's History of the South African Forces in France, 1920. End of footnote. On Sunday, the 16th of July, OVA was at last completely taken after a stout defense, and the way was prepared for a general assault on Pozieres. That day, too, on our right, we widened the gap in the German front by the capture of Waterlot Farm, halfway between Longval and Guimont. The weather broke from the 16th to the 18th, and drenching rain and low mists made progress difficult. The enemy had got up many new batteries, whose positions could not be detected in such weather by our aircraft. He himself was better off, since we were fighting on ground he had once held, and he had the register of our trench lines and most of our possible gun positions. Our situation at Longval was now an uncomfortable salient, and it was necessary to broaden it by pushing out towards high wood. On the 20th, accordingly, the 7th Division attacked again at high wood and carried all of it except the north part. A trench line ran across that north corner where the prospect began to open towards Flares and Lassars. This position was held with extraordinary resolution by the enemy, and it was two months from the first assault before the whole wood was in our possession. The next step was to round off our capture of the enemy's second position and consolidate our ground, for it was very certain that the Germans would not be content to leave us in quiet possession. The second line being lost from east of Pozieres to Delvi Wood, the enemy was compelled to make a switch line to connect his third position with an uncaptured point in his second, such as Pozieres. Fighting continued in the skirts of Delvi and among the orchards of Longval, which had to be taken one by one. Apart from this general activity, our two main objectives were Pozieres and Guimont. The first, with the windmill beyond it, was part of the crest of the Thiepval Plateau. Our aim was the crown of the ridge, the watershed, which would give us direct observation over all the rolling country to the east. The vital points on this watershed were Moquet Farm, between Thiepval and Pozieres, the windmill, now only a stone pedestal on the high road east of Pozieres, high wood, and the high ground directly east of Longval. Guimont was necessary to us before we could align our next advance with that of the French. Its special difficulties lay in the fact that the approach to it from Trones Wood lay over a perfectly bare and open piece of country, that the enemy had excellent direct observation from Luz Wood in its rear, that the quarry on its western edge had been made into a strong redoubt, and that the ground to the south of it, between Maltzhorn and Falfamont Farms, was broken by a three-pronged ravine, with Angla Wood in the center, which the Germans held in strength, and which made it hard to form a defensive flank or link up with the French advance. Sir Douglas Haig has summarized the position. The line of demarcation agreed upon between the French commander and myself ran from Maltzhorn Farm due eastward to the Combles Valley, and then northeastward up the valley to a point midway between Sailly Saizel and Morval. These two villages had been fixed upon as the objective, respectively, of the French left and of my right. In order to advance in cooperation with my right, and eventually to reach Sailly Saizel, our allies had still to fight their way up that portion of the main ridge, 
which lies between the Combles Valley on the west and the River Torti on the east. To do so, they had to capture in the first place the strongly fortified villages of Morapa, Le Forest, Rancourt, and Frejucourt, besides many woods and strong systems of trenches. As the high ground on each side of the Combles Valley commands the slopes of the ridge on the opposite side, it was essential that the advance of the two armies should be simultaneous and made in the closest cooperation. The weather did not favor us. The third week of July was rain and fog. The last week of that month, in the first fortnight of August, saw blazing summer weather, which in that arid and dusty land told severely on men wearing heavy steel helmets and carrying a load of equipment. There was little wind, and a heat haze lay low on the uplands. This meant poor visibility at a time when air reconnaissance was most vital. Hence the task of counter-bombardment grew very difficult, and the steps in our progress became, for the moment, slow and irregular. A battle which advances without a hitch exists only in Staff College Kriegspiel, and the wise general, in preparing his plans, makes ample allowance for delays. On the 19th of July, there came the first attempt on Guillemont from Trom's Wood, an attack by the 18th Division, which failed to advance. On the 20th, the French made good progress, pushing their front east of Hardecourt beyond the Combles Clary light railway, and south of the Somme, widening the gap by carrying the German defense system from Barlow to Vermont For the two days following, our guns bombarded the whole enemy front, and on the Sunday, the 23rd of July, came the next great infantry attack. That attack had a wide front, but its main fury was on the left, where Posier and its windmill crowned the slope up which ran the albert Bapaume road. The village had long ere this been pounded flat. The windmill was a stump, and the trees in the gardens matchwood but every yard of those devastated acres was fortified in the German fashion, with covered trenches, deep dugouts, and machine-gun emplacements. The assault was delivered from two sides. The 48th Division, South Midland Territorials, moving from the southwest in the ground between Pozier and Ovier, and the 1st Australian Division from the southeast, advancing from the direction of Contomaison Villa. The movement began about midnight, and the Midlanders speedily cleared out the defenses which the Germans had flung out south of the village to the left of the high road, and held a line along the outskirts of the place in the direction of Thiepval. The Australians had a difficult task, for they had first to take a sunken road parallel with the highway, then a formidable line of trenches, and finally the high road itself, which ran straight through the middle of the village. The Australian troops then and afterwards were second to none in the new British army. In the famous landing at Gallipoli, and in the dozen desperate fights in that peninsula, culminating in the great battle which began on August 6th, 1915. They had shown themselves incomparable in the fury of assault and in reckless personal valor. In the grim struggle now beginning, they had to face a far heavier fire and far more formidable defenses than anything that Gallipoli could show. For their task, not gallantry only, but perfect battle discipline and perfect coolness were needed. The splendid troops were equal to the call. They won the high road after desperate fighting in the ruined houses, and established a line where the breadth of the road alone separated them from the enemy. 
a famous division of British regulars on this flank, sent them a message to say that they were proud to fight by their side. On Monday and Tuesday the battle continued, and by the evening of the latter day most of Pozier was in our hands. By Wednesday morning, the 26th of July, the whole village was ours, and the Midlanders on the left were pushing northward and had taken two lines of trenches. The two divisions joined hands at the north corner, where they occupied the cemetery and held a portion of the switch line. Here, they lived under a perpetual enemy bombardment. The Germans still held the windmill, which was the higher ground and gave them a good observation point. The sight of that ridge from the road east of Ovier was one that no man who saw it was likely to forget. It seemed to be smothered monotonously in smoke and fire, while wafts of the thick heliotrope smell of the lacrimatory shells floated down from it. Out of the dust and glare would come Australian units which had been relieved, long, lean men, with the shadows of the great fatigue around their deep-set, far-sighted eyes. They were perfectly cheerful and composed, and no lowland Scot was ever less inclined to expansive speech. At the most, they would admit in their slow, quiet voices that what they had been through had been some battle. Meantime, there had been heavy fighting around Longval and in Delvi Wood. Footnote. The German troops employed in the defense of Longval and Delvi Wood since the 14th of July were successively the 6th Regiment of the 10th Bavarian Division, the 8th Division of the 4th Corps, and the 5th Division of the 3rd Corps. And a footnote. On Thursday, the 27th, the wood was cleared all but its eastern side, and next day the last enemy outpost in Longval village was captured by the 3rd Division. At the same time, the 51st Division, Highland Territorials, was almost continuously engaged at High Wood, where in one week it made three fruitless attempts to drive the enemy out of the northern segment. On the 23rd of July, we attacked Guimont from the south and west, but failed, owing to the strength of the enemy's machine-gun fire. Early on the morning of Sunday, the 30th, the Australians attacked at Pozier towards the windmill, and after a fierce hand-to-hand struggle in the darkness, advanced their front to the edge of the trench labyrinth which constituted that position. Next morning, we attacked Guimont from the northwest and west, while the French pushed almost to the edge of Morapa. Troops of the 30th Division advanced right through Guimont till the failure of the attack on the left compelled them to retire with heavy losses. Our farthest limit was the station on the light railway just outside Guimont village. Little happened for some days. The heat now was very great, so great that even men inured to an Australian summer found it hard to bear, and the maddening haze still muffled the landscape. We were aware that the enemy had strengthened his position and brought up new troops and batteries. The French were, meantime, fighting their way through the remnants of the German second line, north of the Somme between Hemwood and Monacou Farm. There were strong counterattacks against Delvi Wood, which were beaten off by our guns before they got to close range. Daily, we bombarded points in the enemy hinterland and did much destruction among their depots and billets and heavy batteries. And then, on the night of Friday, the 4th of August, came the final attack at Pozier. We had already won the German second position up to the top of the village, where the new switch line joined on. The attack 
was in the nature of a surprise. It began at nine in the evening, when the light was still strong. The second Australian division advanced on the right at the windmill, and the twelfth division on the left. The trenches, which had been almost obliterated by our guns, were carried at a rush, and before the darkness came, we had taken the rest of the second position on a front of two thousand yards. Counterattacks followed all through the night, but they were badly coordinated and achieved nothing. On Saturday, we had pushed our line north and west of the village from 400 to 600 yards on a front of 3,000. Early on Sunday morning, the Germans counterattacked with liquid fire and gained a small portion of the trench line, which was speedily recovered. The position was now that we held the much-contested windmill and that we extended on the east of the village to the west end of the switch, while west of Pozier we had pushed so far north that the German line was drooping like the eaves of a steep roof. We had taken some six hundred prisoners, and at last we were looking over the watershed. The following week saw repeated attempts by the enemy to recover his losses. The German bombardment was incessant and intense, and on the high bare scarp around the windmill, our troops had to make heavy drafts on their fortitude. On Tuesday, the 8th of August, the British right, attacking at 4.20 a.m., in conjunction with the French, closed farther in on Guimont. At Pozier, too, every day our lines advanced, especially in the angle toward Mouquet Farm, between the village and Thiepval. We were exposed to a flanking fire from Thiepval, and to the exactly ranged heavy batteries around Courcelet and Grand Corps. Our task was to break off and take heavy toll of the many German counterattacks, and on the rebound to win, yard by yard, ground which made our position secure. In the desperate strain of this fighting, there was evidence that the superb German machine was beginning to creak and falter. Hitherto its strength had lain in the automatic precision of its ordering. Now, since reserves had to be hastily collected from all quarters, there was some fumbling in the command. Attacks made by half a dozen battalions collected from three divisions, battalions which had never before been brigaded together, were bound to lack the old vigor and cohesion. Units lost direction, staff work was imperfect, and what should have been a hammer blow became a loose scrimmage. It was the fashion in Germany at this time to compare the Somme offensive of the Allies with the German attack on Verdun, very much to the advantage of the latter. The deduction was false. In every military aspect, in the extent of ground won, in the respect of losses, in the accuracy and weight of artillery, in the quality of the infantry attacks, and in the precision of the generalship, the Verdun attack fell far short of the Picardy battle. The Verdun front, in its operative part, had been narrower than that of the Somme, but at least ten more enemy divisions had by the beginning of August been attracted to Picardy than had appeared between Avacourt and Vaux up to the end of April. The Crown Prince at Verdun speedily lost the initiative in any serious sense. On the Somme, Below and Galwitz never possessed it. There the enemy had to accept battle as the Allied will imposed it, and no counterattack could for a moment divert the Allied purpose. The French, by the second week of August, had carried all the German third position south of the Somme. On Saturday, the 12th of August, after preparatory reconnaissances, 
they attacked the third line north of the river from the east of Hardacore to opposite Buscor. It was a well-organized assault, which on a front of over four miles swept away the enemy trenches and redoubts to an average depth of three-quarters of a mile. They took the cemetery of Morapa and the southern slopes of Hill 109 on the Morapa clary Road and reached the saddle west of Clary village. By the evening, over 1,000 prisoners were in their hands. Four days later, on Wednesday the 16th of August, they pushed their left flank, that adjoining the British, north of Morapa, taking a mile of trenches, and south of that village captured all the enemy line on a front of a mile and a quarter. Except for a few inconsiderable sections, the enemy third position opposite the French had gone. The British to the north were not yet ready for their grand assault. They had the more difficult ground and the stronger enemy forces against them, and for six weeks had been steadily fighting uphill. At points they had reached the watershed, but they had not won enough of the high ground to give them positions against the German third line on the reverse slopes. The following week was therefore a tale of slow progress to the rim of the plateau, around Pozières, Highwood, and Guimont. Each day saw something gained by hard fighting. On Sunday, the 13th, it was a section of trench northwest of Pozières, and another between Bazatin le Petit and Martin Puich. On Tuesday, it was ground close to Mouquet Farm. On Wednesday, it was the west and southwest environs of Guimont, and a 300 yards advance at Highwood. On Thursday, there was progress northwest of Bazatin le Petit toward Martin Puich, and between Genchy and Guimont. On Friday, the 18th of August, came the next combined attack. There was a steady pressure everywhere from Thiepval to the Somme. The main advance took place at 2.45 in the afternoon, in fantastic weather, with bursts of hot sunshine followed by thunderstorms and flights of rainbows. On the left of the front, the attack was timed for 8 a.m., South of Thiepval, on the old German first line, was a strong work, the Leipzig Redoubt, into which we had already bitten. It was such a stronghold as we had seen at beaumont Amel, a nest of deep dugouts and subterranean galleries, well stocked with machine guns. As our front moved east to Pozières and Contomaison, we had neglected this corner, which had gradually become the apex of a sharp salient. It was garrisoned by Prussians of the 29th Regiment, who were confident in the impregnability of their refuge. They led an easy life, while their Confederates on the crest were crowding in improvised trenches under our shelling. Those not on duty slept peacefully in their bunks at night and played cards in the deep shelters. On Friday, after a sharp and sudden artillery preparation, two British battalions rushed the redoubt. We had learned by this time how to deal with the German machine guns. Many of the garrison fought stubbornly to the end. Others we smoked out and rounded up like the occupants of a gambling house surprised by the police. Six officers and 170 men surrendered in a body, in all, some 2,000 Germans were caught in this trap by numbers less than their own. There was no chance of a counterstroke, for we got our machine guns in position at once, and our artillery caught every enemy attempt in the open. Elsewhere on the front, the fighting was harder and less successful. In the center, the 15th Division pushed closer to Martin Puich, and from Highwood southward we slightly advanced our lines. 
we also carried the last orchard at Longval and pressed towards the eastern rim of Delvie Wood. Farther south, we took the stone quarry on the edge of Guimont, after a hand-to-hand struggle of several hours, but failed to hold it. Meantime, the French carried the greater part of Maurepas village and the place called Calvary Hill to the southeast. This last was a great feat of arms, for they had against them a fresh division of the Prussian Guard, the second, which had seen no serious action for many months. Footnote. The whole of the First Guard Corps, the First and Second Divisions, was now facing the French north of the Somme. End of footnote. We were now fighting on the watershed. At Thiepval we held the ridge that overlooked the village from the southeast, we held all the high ground north of Pozieres, which gave us a clear view of the country towards Baupalm, and our lines lay three hundred yards beyond the windmill. We had all the west side of Highwood and the ground between it and the albert Baupalm road. We were halfway between Longval and Ginchy, and our pincers were encircling Guimont. At last, we were in position over against, and in direct view of, the German third line. The next week was occupied in repelling German attempts to recover lost ground, and in efforts to sharpen still further the Thiepval salient, and to capture Guimont. Thiepval, it should be remembered, was a point in the old German first line on the left flank of the Great Breach, and Guimont was the one big position still untaken in the German second line. On Sunday, the 20th, the Germans shelled our front heavily, and at about noon attacked our new lines on the western side of High Wood. They reached a portion of our trenches, but were immediately driven out by our infantry. Next day, at High Wood and at Mouquet Farm, there were frequent bombing attacks, which came to nothing. On Tuesday, the 22nd of August, we advanced steadily on our left, pushing our line to the very edge of what was once Mouquet Farm, as well as to the northeast of it, and closing in to within 1,000 yards of Thiep Fall. On Wednesday night and Thursday morning, a very severe counterattack on our position at Guimont pressed with great determination, failed to win any ground. That afternoon, the 24th of August, we advanced nearer Thiepval, coming at one point within 500 yards of the place. In the evening, at five o'clock, the French carried Morapa and pushed their right onto the Combles Railway, while the British 14th Division succeeded at last in clearing Delvie Wood. Next day, the French success enabled us to join up with our allies southeast of Guimont, where our pincers were now beginning to grip hard. The following week was one of slow and steady progress, the most satisfactory feature of which was the frequency of the German counterattacks and their failure. On the 26th of August, for example, troops of the 4th Division of the Prussian Guard, after a heavy bombardment, attacked south of Thiepval village and were completely repulsed by the battalions holding that front. On Thursday evening, the 31st of August, five violent and futile assaults were made on our front between Highwood and Jinshi. It looked as if the enemy was trying in vain to anticipate the next great stage of our offensive, which was now imminent. On Sunday, the 3rd of September, at 12 noon, the whole Allied front pressed forward. The 4th Australian and the 25th and 49th British Divisions attacked on the extreme left, near Mouquet Farm and towards Thiep Fall, and against the enemy position just north of the Ancre. In their task, they encountered the 1st Guard Reserve Division and took several hundred prisoners. They carried various strong positions, 
one ground east of Moquet Farm, and still further narrowed the Thiepval salient. Our center took high wood in the afternoon, but pressed on too far and had to give ground before a German counterattack. On their right, the 7th Division took and lost Jinshi, while the 20th Division swept through Guimont to the sunken road, 500 yards to the east. The fall of Guimont meant that we now held the last point in the old German second position between Moquet Farm and the junction with the French. It had been most gallantly defended by the enemy for 25 days without relief. Footnote. By the German 27th Division. Its commander, Otto von Moser, received the Order of Merit. End of footnote. Farther south, we attacked but failed to capture Falfamont Farm. Meantime, the French, the First Corps, had marched steadily from victory to victory. Shortly after noon, on a three and three quarter miles front between Maurepas and the Somme, they had attacked after an intense artillery preparation. They carried the villages of Le Forest and Clairy, and north of the former place won the German lines to the outskirts of Combles. The advance was only beginning. On Monday, the 4th of September, all enemy counterattacks were beaten off and further ground won by the British near Falfamo Farm. That night, in a torrent of rain, our men pressed on, and before midday on Tuesday, the 5th of September, they were nearly a mile east of Guimont and well into Luz Wood. That evening, the whole of the wood was taken, as well as the hotly disputed Falfamont Farm, and the British were less than 1,000 yards from the town of Combles, on which the French were pressing in on the south. Meantime, about two in the afternoon, a new French army came into action south of the Somme on a front of a dozen miles from Barlow to the south of Chalmes. This was General Michelet's 10th Army, with nine divisions in line, which had been waiting for two months on the order to advance. At a bound, it carried the whole of the German first position from Vermandovier to Chilly, a front of nearly three miles, and took some 3,000 unwounded prisoners. Next day, the French pressed on both north and south of the river, and in the former area, reached the west end of the Anderloo Wood, carried the Hôpital Farm, the Reinette Wood, part of the ridge on which ran the road from Bouchavain to Clary, and the village of Omiecourt. From Wednesday, the 6th of September, to the night of Friday, the 8th, the Germans strove in vain to win back what they had lost. On the whole 30 miles from Thiepval to Chilly, there were violent counterattacks which had no success, though four divisions of the Prussian Guard shared in them. The Allied artillery broke up the massed infantry in most cases long before they reached our trenches. On Saturday the 9th of September, the 16th Irish Division carried Jinshi. The attack was delivered at 4.45 in the afternoon on a broad front, but though highly successful in this one area, it failed elsewhere. We made no progress in Highwood. We were checked east of Delvi. And most important of all, we did not succeed in carrying the work east of Jinshi called the Quadrilateral, which at a later day was to prove a thorn in our side. Nevertheless, the main objects had been attained the Allied front was now in a symmetrical line, and everywhere on the highest ground. Combles was held in a tight clutch, and the French 10th Army was within 800 yards of Chons Station, and was holding two and a half miles of the Chons Roy Railway, thereby cutting the chief German line of lateral communication. 
the first objective which the Allies had set before themselves on the 1st of July had been won. By the 10th of September, the British had made good the old German second position and had won the crest of the uplands, while the French in their section had advanced almost to the gates of Peron, and their new army on the right had begun to widen the breach. That moment was, in a very real sense, the end of a phase, the first and perhaps most critical phase of the Somme battle. The immense fortifications of her main position represented for Germany the accumulated capital of two years. She had raised these defenses when she was stronger than her adversaries in guns and in men. Now she was weaker and her capital was gone. Thenceforth, the campaign entered upon a new stage, new alike in strategical and tactical problems. From Thiepval to Scholz, the enemy was in improvised positions. The day of maneuver battles had not come, but in that section the rigidity of the old trench warfare had vanished. Haig's aim was to push eastward till he secured a good defensive position, and then turn north against the flank and rear of the German positions beyond the Ancre. It looked as if he were soon to attain the first half of his purpose. End of chapter 62, part 3. End of section 20. Section 21 of the History of the Great War, Volume 3. The Beleaguered Fortress Continued and the Great Sallies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of the Great War, Volume 3 by John Buchan. Chapter 63, The Battle of the Somme Continued. September ninth to November eighteenth, nineteen sixteen, part one. The capture of Guillemont on third September meant the end of the German second position on the whole front between Thiepval and Estrus. The Allies were faced with a new problem to understand which it is necessary to consider the nature of the defenses still before them in the peculiar configuration of the country. The advance of 1st July had carried the first enemy lines on a broad front, but the failure of the attack between Gomacor and Thiepval had made the breach eight miles less than the original plan. The advance of 14th July gave us the second line on a still narrower front, from Bassentin Le Petit to Longueval. The danger now was that the Allied thrust had continued, might show a rapidly narrowing wedge which would result in the formation of a sharp and precarious salient. Accordingly, Sir Douglas Haig broadened the breach by striking out to left and right, capturing first Fosiers and the high ground at Moquet Farm, and then, on his other flank, Guillemont and Genji. These successes made the gap in the second position some seven miles wide, and brought the British front in most places, to the highest ground, from which direct observation was obtainable over the lowest slopes and valley pockets to the east. We did not yet hold the complete crown of the ridge, though at Mouquet Farm and at High Wood we had positions which no superior height commanded. The German third position had at the beginning of the battle been only in embryo. Before the attack of 14th July it had been more or less completed, and by the beginning of September, it had been greatly elaborated and a fourth position prepared behind it. It was based on a string of fortified villages, which lay on the reverse slopes of the main ridge. Corselet, Martinporch, Flares, Lesbrefs, and Morval. Behind it was an intermediate line, with Lossars, Alcourt, La Bay, and Goodencourt, as strong positions in it and farther back a fourth position which lay just west of the Beaupont Peron Road, covering the villages of Sally Salisel and Le Transloy. This was the line protecting Beaupont. 
The next position at this moment only roughly sketched out lay well to the east of that town. Since the battle began, the Germans had, up to the second week in September, brought 61 divisions into action in the Somme area. Seven had been refitted and sent in again. On 14th September, they were holding the line with 15 divisions, which gives 53 as the number which had been used up. The German losses throughout had been high. The French casualties had been comparatively light, for they had fought economically under close cover of their guns, and had had, on the whole, the easier tactical problem to face. The British losses had been, beyond doubt, lower than those of the enemy, and our most conspicuous successes, such as the advance of 1st July south of Thief Paul, and the action of 14th July, had been achieved at a comparatively small cost. Our main casualties arose from the failure north of the fall on the first day and the taking of desperately defended and almost impregnable positions like Devil Wood and Guillermo. In the ten weeks battle, the enemy had shown many ups and downs of strength. At one moment, his whole front would appear to be crumbling, and another the arrival of fresh batteries from Verdun and new troops would solidify his line. The effort had strained his capacity to its full. On 5th September, Hindenburg and Ludendorff paid their first visit to the West, and the narrative of the latter witnesses to their grave view of the case. They found that the German infantry, relying too much upon fortifications and artillery, were losing their power of taking the offensive. They resolutely faced the crisis, drastically revised the tactical methods, and reorganized the whole Western Front. Early in the battle, the old First Army, which had been in abeyance since the preceding spring, was revived north of the Somme and placed under Fritz von Velo, while the Second Army, now under Galvitz, held the line south of the river. An army group was created under Prince Reprecht of Bavaria, comprising his own Sixth Army, the First and Second Armies, and the hitherto ungrouped Seventh Army of Schubert. Strenuous efforts were made to create a reserve, for Germany in her defense had already used the best fighting material she possessed. During those ten weeks, almost all her most famous units had appeared on the Somme. The cream of the Bavarian troops, the Fifth Brandenburgers, and every single division of the Guard and Guard Reserve Corps. In the early days of September, the Allied Command, had evidence that the enemy was in no very happy condition. The loss of Ginchy and Guillermo had enabled the British to come into line with the left wing of Fayol's great advance, while the fall of certain vital positions on the Thiefball Ridge gave us observation over a great space of country and threatened Thiefball, which was the pivot of all the German defense in the northern section of the battleground. The Allied front north of the Somme had the river as a defensive flank on its right, and might presently have the anchor to fill the same part on its left. Hence the situation was ripe for a further thrust which, if successful, might give our advance a new orientation. If the German third line could be carried, it might be possible to strike out on the flanks, repeating on a far greater scale the practice already followed. Bhopal itself was not the objective, but a thrust northeastward across the upper Ankara to get behind the great slab of unbroken enemy positions from deep fall northwards. That would be the ultimate reward of a complete success. In the meantime, our task was to break through the enemy's third line and test his powers of resistance. It seemed a propitious moment for a concerted blow. The situation on the whole front was good. Fayol's left wing had won conspicuous successes and had spirits high, while Michelin was moving his pinchers toward Charles and playing havoc with the main German lateral communications. Elsewhere in Europe, things went well for the Allies. On 28th August, Romania had entered the war and her troops were pouring into Transylvania. As it turned out, it was a premature and fruitless movement, but it compelled Germany to take instant steps to meet the menace. 
There had been important changes in the German high command, and it might reasonably be assumed that Hindenburg and Ludendorff were not yet quite at ease in the saddle. Brusilov was still pinning down the Austro-German forces on the Russian front, and Sorel had just begun his offensive in the Balkans. In the event of a real debacle in the West, the enemy might be hard-pressed to find the men to fill the breach. Every action, it should be remembered, is a packet of surprises. There is an immediate local objective, but on success any one of twenty consequences may follow. The wise commander cannot count on any of these consequences, but he must not neglect them in his calculations. If the gods send him good fortune, he must be ready to take it, and he naturally chooses a season when the gods seem propitious. 1. On Tuesday, 12th September, a comprehensive bombardment began all along the British front, from Thiefal to Ginji. The whole of Rawlinson's Fourth Army was destined for the action, as well as the right corps, the first Canadian of the Fifth Army, while on the left of the battle to the Eleventh Division was allotted a preliminary attack, which was partly in the nature of a feint and partly a necessary preparatory step. The immediate objective of the different units must be clearly noted. On the left of the main front, the second Canadian division was directed against Corselet. On their right, the 15th Scottish Division had for its task to clear the remains of the old switch line and encircle Martin Pooch, but not on the first day at any rate to attempt to capture what was believed to be a most formidable stronghold. Going south, the 50th and 47th Divisions had to clear high wood on their right, the New Zealanders had flares as their objective, while the 31st and 14th Divisions had to make good the ground east and north of Delville Wood. Next to them, the Guards and the 6th Division were to move northeast from Kinchy against Le Berfs and Morval, while on the extreme right of the British front, the 56th Division was to carry Bulow Wood and form a defensive flank. It had been agreed between Haig and Thulk that Combless should not be directly attacked, but pinched by an advance on both sides of it. This movement was no easy task, for, in Haig's words, the line of the French advance was narrowed almost to a defile by the extensive and strongly fortified wood of St. Pierre Vast on the one side and on the other by the Combless Valley. The closest cooperation was necessary to enable the two commands to solve a highly intricate tactical problem. The British force to be employed in the new advance was for the most part fresh. The guards had not been in action since Los the previous September. The Canadians were new to the Somme area, while it was the first experience of the New Zealanders on the Western Front. In this stage, too, a new weapon was to be used. The tanks, officially known as Machine Gun Corps Heavy Section, had come out from home some time before and had been parked in secluded spots at the back of the front. The world is now familiar with those strange machines, which, shaped like monstrous toads, crawled imperturbably over wire and parapets, butted down houses, shouldered trees aside, and humped themselves over the stoutest walls. They were an experiment which could only be proved in practice, and the design in using them at this stage was principally to find out their weak points so as to perfect their mechanism for the future. Their main tactical purpose was to clear out redoubts and nests of machine guns which, as we had found, to our sorrow at Lowe's, might hang up the most resolute troops. For this object they must precede the infantry attack and the task of assembling them before the parapets were crossed was fraught with difficulty, but they were neither silent nor inconspicuous. The things had been kept a profound secret, and until the very eve of the advance, few in the British army had even heard of them. On 14 September, the day before our attack, some of them were seen by German airplanes, and the German troops were warned that the British had some strange new engine 
whom was also seen to have reached Germany five or six weeks earlier, where orders had been issued to supply the soldiers with a special kind of armor-piercing bullet. But of the real nature of the device, the enemy had no inkling. On the night of Thursday the 14th, the 5th Army carried out its preliminary task. On a front of a thousand yards southeast of Thiefball, the 11th Division stormed the Hohenzollern Trench and the strong redoubt which the Germans called the Wunderwerk, taking many prisoners and themselves losing little. The fame of this enterprise had been somewhat obscured by the great advance which followed, but it was a most workmanlike and skillful performance, and it had a real effect on the subsequent battle. It deceived the enemy as to the exact terrain of the main assault, and it caused him to launch a counterattack in an area which was part of the principal battleground, with the result that our left wing, after checking his attack, was able to catch up on the rebound. The morning of Friday, 15th September, was perfect autumn weather, with a light mist filling the hollows and shrouding the slopes. At 6 a.m., the British bombardment, which had now lasted for three days, rose to the fury of a hurricane fire. The enemy had a thousand guns of all calibers massed against us, and his defenses consisted of a triple line of entrenchments and a series of advanced posts manned by machine guns. Our earlier bombardment had cut his wire and destroyed many of his trenches, besides hampering greatly his bringing up of men, rations, and shells. The final twenty minutes of intense fire slowly creeping forward with our infantry close under its shadow, pinned him to his positions and interfered with his counter-barrage. At twenty minutes past six, our men crossed the parapets and moved forward methodically towards the enemy. The Germans, manning their trenches as our guns lengthened, saw through the thin mist in human shapes crawling towards them, things like gigantic slugs spitting fire from their mortal sides. They had been warned of a new weapon, but what mortal weapon was this terror that walked by day? And ere they could collect their dazed wits, the British bayonets were upon them. On the left and center, the attack was instantly successful. The Canadians, after beating off the German counterattack, carried Corselet in the afternoon. In this advance, French-Canadian troops played a distinguished part in winning back some miles of French soil for their ancient motherland. On their right, the 15th Division, which had already been six weeks in line, performed something more than the task allotted it. The capture of Martin Pooch was not part of the program of the day's operations, but the Scots pushed east and west of the village, and at a quarter of five in the evening had the place in their hands. Farther south there was fierce fighting in the old cockpit of high wood. It was two months since we had first effected an entrance into its ill-omened shades, but we had been forced back, and for long had to be content with this southern corner. The strong German third line, which ran across its northern half of the very crest of the ridge, and the endless craters and machine-gun redoubts, made it a desperate nut to crack. We had pushed out horns to east and west of it, but the northern stronghold in the wood itself and defied all our efforts. It was held on that day by troops of the 2nd Bavarian Corps, and the German ranks had shown no better fighting stuff. Our first attack failed, but on a second attempt, the 47th Division, a little afternoon, swept the place clear, though not without heavy losses. Beyond them, the New Zealanders, with the 41st Division on their right, carried the switch line and took flurries with little trouble. They were preceded by a tank, which waddled complacently up the main street of the village, with the enemy's bullets rattling harmlessly off its sides, followed by cheering and laughing British troops. By the south, we advanced our front for nearly a mile and a half. The 14th Division, debouching from Delville Wood, cleared Mystery Corner on its eastern side before the general attack began and then pushed forward, north of Ginji, into the direction of Le Boeuf. Only on the right wing was the tale of success incomplete. Ginji, it will be remembered, had been carried on 9th September, but its environs were not yet fully cleared, and the enemy held the formidable point 
known as the Quadrilateral. This was situated about 700 yards east of Ginji, at a bend of the Morval Road, where it passed through a deep wooded ravine. The 6th Division was directed against it, with the guards on its left and the 56th Division on its right. The business of the last named was to carry Bula Wood and form a defensive flank north of Combus, while the guards were to advance from Kinchi to Leibruf. But the strength of the quadrilateral foiled the plan. The Londoners did indeed enter Bula Wood, but the 6th Division on their left was fatally hung up in front of the quadrilateral, and this in turn exposed the right flank of the guards. The brigades of the latter advanced, as they have always advanced, with perfect discipline and courage. But both their flanks were in enfiladed. The front of attack was too narrow. The sunken road before them was strongly held by machine guns. They somewhat lost direction, and, in consequence, no part of our right attack gained its full objective. There, and in high wood, we incurred most of the casualties of the day. The check was the most regrettable since complete success in this area was tactically more important than elsewhere. But after all deductions were made, the day's results were in a high degree satisfactory. We had broken in one day through three of the enemy's main defensive systems, and on a front of over six miles had advanced to an average depth of a mile. It was the most effective blow yet dealt at the enemy by British troops. It gave us not only the high ground between Thipfall and the Combless Valley, but placed us well down the forward slopes. The damage to the enemy's morale, said the official summary, is probably of greater consequence than the seizure of dominating positions and the capture of between four and five thousand prisoners. Three famous Bavarian divisions have been engaged and completely shattered, and the whole enemy front thrown into disorder. The tanks had, for a new experiment, done wonders. Some of them broke down on the way up, and of the thirty-two which reached their starting points, fourteen came to grief early in the day. The remainder did brilliant service, some squatting on enemy trenches and clearing them by machine gun fire some flattening out uncut wire, others destroying machine gun nests and redoubts or strong points like the sugar factory at Corsolet. But their moral effect was greater than the material damage they wrought. The sight of those deliberate impersonal engines ruthlessly grinding down the most cherished defenses was something like panic injured troops who had always prided themselves upon the superior merit of their own fighting machine. Beyond doubt, too, the presence of the tanks added greatly to the zeal and confidence of our insulting infantry. An element of sheer comedy was introduced into the grim business of war, and comedy is dear to the heart of the British soldier. The crews of the tanks seemed to have acquired some of the light-heartedness of the British sailor. Penned up in a narrow, stuffy space, condemned to a form of motion compared with which, that of the queasiest vessel was steady, and at the mercy of unknown perils. These adventurers faced their task of the zest of a boy on holiday. In the achievements of the day, our aircraft nobly cooperated. They destroyed thirteen hostile machines and drove nine more in a broken condition to ground. They bombarded enemy headquarters and vital points on all his railway lines. They destroyed German kite balloons, and so put out the eyes of the defense. They guided our artillery fire, and they brought back frequent and accurate reports of every stage in the infantry advance. Moreover, they attacked both enemy artillery and infantry, with their machine gun fire from a low elevation. In the week of the action on the whole Somme battleground, only 14 enemy machines managed to cross our lines, while our airplanes made between 2,000 and 3,000 flights far behind the German front. In the guards' advance, among other gallant and distinguished officers, there fell one whose death was, in a peculiar sense, a loss to his country and the future. Lieutenant Raymond Asquith of the Grenadier Guards, the eldest son of the British Prime Minister, died while leading his men through the fatal and fire 
and the corner of Genji Village. In this war, the gods took toll of every rank and class. Few generals and statesmen in the allied nations, but had to mourn intimate bereavements, and Castle now had given three sons for his country. But the death of Raymond Asquith had a poignancy, apart from his birth and possession, and it may be permitted to an old friend to pay his tribute to her heroic memory. A scholar of the ripe Elizabethan type, a brilliant wit, an accomplished poet, a sound lawyer. These things were born lightly, for his greatness was not in his attainments, but in himself. He had always borne a curious aloofness towards mere worldly success. He loved the things of the mind for their own sake. Good books, good talk, the company of friends, and the rewards of common ambition seemed to him too trivial for a man's care. He was of the spending type in life, giving freely of the riches of his nature, but asking nothing in return. His carelessness of personal gain, his inability to trim or truckle, and his aloofness from the facile acquaintanceships of the modern world made him incomprehensible to many, and his high fastidiousness gave him a certain air of coldness. Most noble in presence, and with every grace of voice and manner, he moved among men like a being of another race, scornfully detached from the common struggle, and only his friends knew the warmth and loyalty of his soul. At the outbreak of war, he joined a territorial battalion, from which he was later transferred to the Grenadiers. More than most men, he hated the loud bellicosities of politics, and he had never done homage to the deities of the crowd. His critical sense made him chary of enthusiasm, and it was no sudden sentimental fervor that swept him into the army. He saw his duty, and though it meant the shattering of every taste and interest, he did it joyfully, and did it to the full. For a little he had a post on the staff, but applied to be sent back to his battalion, since he wished no privileges. In our long roll of honor, no nobler figure will find a place. He was a type of his country at its best, shy of rhetorical professions, austerely self-respecting, one who hid his devotion under a mask of indifference, and, when the hour came, revealed it only in deeds. Many gave their all for the cause, but few had so much to give. He loved his youth, and his youth had become eternal. Devonair and brilliant and brave, he is now part of that immortal England, which knows not age or weariness or defeat. Meanwhile, the French had not been idle. On Wednesday, 13th September, two days before the British advance, Fayon carried Bouchabens, east of the Beaupont Peron Road, taking over 2,000 prisoners. He was now not three miles from the vital position of Mont Saint Quentin, the key of Peron, facing it across the little valley of the Tortilla. Next day, the French had the farm of the Prince, southeast of Combles, and on the afternoon of Sunday, the 17th, south of the Somme, their right wing carried the remainder of Aaron de Villers and Bernie and the intervening ground around Danny Court. The following day, Danny Court, with his strongly fortified park, was captured. This gave them the whole of the Bernie Danny Court Plateau, commanding the lower plateau where stood the villages of Avlan Court and Pressoir, and menaced Barlow, the pivot of enemy resistance south of the river. For the next week there was a lull in the main operations, while the hammer was swung back for another blow. On the 16th, the Canadians were counterattacked at Corselet, and the 6th Bavarian Division, newly arrived, struck its New Zealanders at Lurs. Both efforts failed, and south of Compass, the fresh troops of the German 18th Corps succeeded no better against the French. The most vigorous counterstrokes were those which the Canadians received, and which were repeated daily for nearly a week. Meantime, on Monday, the 18th, the quadrilateral was carried, carried by the division which had been blocked by it three days before. It was not one without a heavy fight at close quarters, but the garrison resisted stoutly. 
but we closed in on it from all sides, and by the evening had pushed our front five hundred yards beyond it to the hollow before Morval. The week was dull and cloudy, and from the Monday to the Wednesday it rained without ceasing, but by the Friday it had cleared, though the mornings were now thick with autumn haze, and we were able once more to get that direct observation and aerial reconnaissance which is an indispensable preliminary to a great attack. On Sunday the 24th, our batteries opened again, this time against the uncaptured points in the German third line, like Morval and Le Boeuf, against intermediate positions like Gordicourt, and especially against the Va, which we now commanded from the east. The plan was for an attack by the fourth army on Monday the 25th, with, on its left wing, small local objectives, but on the right and center, aiming at completing the captures which had been the ultimate objectives of the advance of the 15th. The following day, the right wing of the 5th Army would come into action, and it was hoped that from Thiepval to Conglis, the enemy would be driven back to his fourth line of defense, and our own front pushed up well within assaulting distance. The hour of attack on the 25th was fixed at 35 minutes after noon. It was bright, cloudless weather, but the heat of the sun had lost its summer strength. That day so in advance, the most perfect yet, made in any stage of the battle, for in almost every part of the field we won what we sought. The extreme left of the Third Corps was held up north of Corselet, but the remaining two divisions carried out the tasks assigned to them. So did the center and left divisions of the 15th Corps, while part of the 21st Division, assisted by a tank and an airplane, took Guida Court. The 14th Corps succeeded everywhere. The guards, eager to avenge their sufferings of the week before, despite the heavy losses on their left, swept irresistibly upon this wolf. South of them, the 5th Division took Morval. The village on the height north of Complice, which, with its subterranean quarries and elaborate trench system, was a most formidable stronghold. Complice was now fairly between the pinchers. It might have fallen that day, but the French attack on Frigacourt failed, though they carried the village of Rancourt on the Beaupin-Peron road. By the evening of the 25th, the British had stormed an enemy front, of six miles between Conflis and Martin Pooch, to a depth of more than a mile. The fall of Morval gave them the last piece of uncaptured high ground on that backbone of Ridge, which runs from Thiepval through Highwood and Genji. The next day the French took Frigicourt, and Conflis fell. The enemy had evacuated it, and though great stores of material were taken in its catacombs, the number of prisoners was small. Meantime, on the British left, on the 26th, the success was not less conspicuous. The 11th and 18th Divisions of the 5th Army, advancing at 25 minutes after noon under the cover of our artillery barrage, had carried the fall, the northwest corner of Mouquet Farm, and the Solent Redoubt on the eastern crest. The German pivot had gone, the pivot which they had believed impregnable. So skillful was our barrage that our men were over the German parapets and into the dugouts before machine guns could be got up to repel them. Here the prisoners were numerous, but the attack was in the nature of a surprise. On the evening of 26 September, the Allied fortunes in the West had never looked brighter. The enemy was now in his fourth line, without the benefit of the high ground and there was no chance of retrieving his disadvantages by observation from the air. Since 1st July, the British alone had taken over 26,000 prisoners and had engaged 38 German divisions, the flower of the army, of which 29 had been withdrawn exhausted and broken. The enemy had been compelled to use up his reserves in repeated costly and futile counterattacks, without compelling the Allies to relax for one moment their methodical pressure. A hundred captured documents showed that the German morale had been shaken and that the German machine was falling badly out of gear. In normal seasons, at least another month of fine weather 
might be reasonably counted on, and in that month where the blows might be struck with cumulative force. In France they spoke of a Picardy summer, of fair bright days at the end of autumn, when the ground was dry in the air of a crystal clearness. A fortnight of such days would suffice for a crowning achievement. The hope was destined to fail. The guns were scarcely silent after the great attack of the 26th, when the weather broke, and October was one long succession of tempestuous gales and drenching rains. End of chapter 63, part 1《Section 22 of A History of the Great War, Volume 3. The Beleaguered Fortress Continued at the Great Sallies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of the Great War, Volume 3 by John Buchan. Chapter 63 The Battle of the Somme Continued. September ninth to November eighteenth, nineteen sixteen, part two. To understand the difficulties which untoward weather imposed on the Allied advance, it is necessary to grasp the nature of the fifty square miles of ground which three months fighting had given them, and over which lay the communications between their firing line and the rear. From a position like the north end of High Wood, Almost the whole British battleground on a clear day was visible to the eye. To reach the place from the all Allied front line, some four miles of bad roads had to be traversed. They would have been bad roads in a moorland parish, where they suffered only the transit of the infrequent carrier cart, for at the best they were mere country tracks, casually engineered and with no solid foundation. But here they had to support such a traffic as the world had scarcely seen before. Not the biggest mining camp or the vastest engineering undertaken had ever produced one tithe of the activity which existed behind each section of the battle line. There were places like Cruel, places like the skirts of Birmingham, places like Eldershot of Salisbury Plain. It has already been pointed out that the immense and complex mechanism of modern armies resembles a series of pyramids which tapered to a point as they near the front. Though all modern science had gone to the making of this war, at the end, in spite of every artificial aid, it became elementary, akin in many respects to the days of bows and arrows. It was true of the whole front, but the Somme battleground was peculiar in this, that the area of land with the devices of civilization broke down was far larger than elsewhere. Elsewhere it was defined more or less by the limits of the enemy's observation and fire. On the Somme it was defined by the previous three months' battle. It was not the German guns which made the trouble on the ground, between the Albert and Perron Road and the British firing line. Casual bombardments vexed us little. It was the hostile elements and the unkindly nature of Mother Earth. The country roads had been rutted out of recognition, by endless transport, and, since they never had much of a bottom, the toil of the roadmakers had nothing to build upon. New roads were hard to make, but the chalky soil was poor, and had been so churned up by shelling in the movement of guns and troops that it had lost all cohesion. Countless shells had burst below the ground, causing everywhere subsidences and cavities. There was no stone in the countryside and little wood, so repairing materials had to be brought from a distance, which still further complicated the problem. To mend a road, you must give it a rest, but there was little chance of a rest for any of those poor tortured passages. In all the district, there were two good highways, one running at right angles to our front from Albert to Beaupont, the other parallel to a low front line from Albert to Peron. These, to begin with, were the best types of routes national. Broad, well-engineered, lined with orderly poplars. By the third month of the battle, even these were showing signs of wear, and to travel on either in a motor car was a switchback journey. At the famous high roads declined, 
or is likely to be the condition of the country lanes, which read around Canto Maison, Longeval, and Guillemot. Let us assume that early in October we have taken our stand at the northern angle of I Wood. It is only a specter of a wood, a horrible place of matted tree trunks and crumbling trench lines, full of mementos of the dead and all the dreadful debris of battle. To reach it we have walked across two miles of what once must have been breezy downland, patched with little fields of roots and grain. It is now like a wasted field in a decaying suburb, pockmarked with shell holes, littered with cartridge clips, equipment, fragments of wire, and every kind of tin can. Over all the area hangs a curious, bitter, unwholesome smell of burning, an odor which will always recall to every soldier the immediate front of battle. The air is clear, and we look from the height over a shallow trough towards the low slopes in front of the Transloy Road, behind which lies the German Fourth Line. Our own front is some thousands of yards off, close under that hillock which is the famous battle to Wallencourt. Far on our left is the lift of the Thiepval Bridge, and near us, hidden by the slope of the ruins of Barton Booch, the Sars and Ocourt la Bay are before us, Fleurs a little to the right and beyond it, Golden Court. On our extreme right rise the slopes of Sally Salisel. One can see the shattered trees lining the Beaupont Perron Road and hidden by the fall of the ground, a Leibouf and Morval. Behind us are things like scarred patches on the hillsides. They are the remains of the Byzantine woods and the ominous wood of Delville. The whole confines of the British battleground lie open to the eye. From the thick fall ridge in the north to the downs which bring the sight of Glombless. Look west and beyond the dreary country, we have crossed rives, green downs, set with woods untouched by shell, the normal, pleasant land of Picardy. Look east, beyond our front line in the smoke puffs, across the walling cord and golden court bridges, and on the skyline there also appear unbroken woods, and here and there a church spire and the smoke of villages. The German retirement in September had been rapid, and we had reached the fringes of a land as yet little scarred by combat. We are looking at the boundaries of the battlefield. We have pushed the enemy right up to the edge of habitable and undevastated country. But we pay for our success in having behind us a strip of sheer desolation. There were thus two no-man's lands. One was between the front lines, the other lay between the old enemy front and the front we had won. The second line was the bigger problem, for across it must be brought the supplies of a great army. This was a war of mortar transport, and we were doing what the early Victorians pronounced impossible, running the equivalent of steam engines, not on prepared tracks, but on high roads, running them day and night in endless relays. And these high roads were not the decent macadamized ways of England, but roads which would be despised in Sutherland or Connaught. The problem was hard enough in fine weather, but let the rain come and soak the churned up soil, and the whole land became a morass. There was no cafe, as in Flanders, to make a firm causeway. Every road became a watercourse, and in the hollows the mud was as deep as a man's thighs. An army must be fed, troops must be relieved, guns must be supplied, and so there could be no slackening of the traffic. Off the roads the ground was a squelching bog, Dugouts crumbled in, and communication trenches ceased to be. In areas such as Ypres and Festubert, where the soil was naturally waterlogged, the conditions were worse, but at Ypres and Festubert, we had not six miles of sponge, buried by mud torrents across which all transport must pass. Weather is a vital condition of success in operations, where great armies are concerned, the men and guns cannot fight on air. In modern war, it is more urgent than ever, since aerial reconnaissance plays so great a part, and Napoleon's fifth element, mud, grows in importance with the complexity of the fighting machine. Again, in semi-static trench warfare, 
where the same area remains for long the battlefield, the condition of the ground is the first fact to be reckoned with. Once we grasp this, the difficulty of the October campaign, waged in almost continuous rain, will be apparent, but no words can convey an adequate impression of the Somme area after a week's downpour. Its discomforts had to be endured to be understood. The topography of the immediate battleground demands a note from the point of view of its tactical peculiarities. The British line at the end of September ran from the Swaven Redoubt, 1,000 yards north of Thiepva, along the ridge to a point northeast of Corselet. Then, just in front of Matubuch, Fleurs, Goldencourt, and Le Berf, to the junction with the French. Morval was not part of the French area. From Thiepva to northeast of Corselet, the line was for the most part on the crest of the ridge. It then bent southward and followed generally the foot of the eastern slopes. But a special topographical feature complicated the position. Before our front, a shallow depression ran northwest from north of Sally Salazel to about 2,000 yards south of Bopin. We returned westward and joined the glen of the Anchor at Miramont. From the main deep fall Morval Ridge, a series of long spurs descended into this valley, of which two were of special importance. One was the hammer-headed spur immediately west of Fleurs, at the west end of which stood the tumulus called the Butte de Wallencourt. The other was a spur which lying across the main trend of the ground, ran north from Morval to Thilloy, passing 1,000 yards to the east of Goudencourt. Behind these spurs lay the German fourth position. It was in the main a position on reverse slopes, and so screened from immediate observation, though our command of the higher ground gave us a view of its hinterland. Our own possession of the heights, great though its advantages were, had certain drawbacks, for it meant that our communications had to make the descent of the reverse slopes, and were thus exposed to some extent to the enemy's observation and long-range fire. The next advance of the British Army had therefore two distinct objectives. The first, the task of the Fourth Army was to carry the two spurs, and so get within assaulting distance of the German Fourth Line. Even if the grand assault should be postponed, the possession of the spurs would greatly relieve our situation by giving us cover for our advanced gun positions and a certain shelter for the bringing up of supplies. It should be remembered that the spurs were not part of the German main front, they were held by the enemy as intermediate positions, and very strongly held, every advantage being taken of sunken roads, buildings, and the undulating nature of the country. They represented for the fourth German line what Contemaison had represented for the second, till they were carried no general assault on the main front could be undertaken. The second task, that of the fifth army was to master the whole of the high ground on the Thief Fall Ridge, so as to get direct observation into the Angra Glen and over the uplands north and northeast of it. The month of October provided a record in wetness, spells of drenching rain being varied by dull, misty days, so that the sodden land had no chance of drying. The carrying of the spurs, meant as a preliminary step to a general attack, proved an operation so full of difficulties that it occupied all our efforts during the month, and with it all was not completed. The story of these weeks is one of minor operations, local actions with strictly limited objectives undertaken by only a few battalions. In the face of every conceivable difficulty, we moved slowly up the intervening slopes. At first there was a certain briskness in our movement, from Fleurs northwestward, in front of Le Cord La Bay and Le Sars, and a very strong trench system, which we called the Fleurs Line, and which was virtually a switch connecting the old German third line with the intermediate positions in front of the Spurs. The capture of Fleurs gave us the southeastern part of this line, and the last days of September and the first of October were occupied in winning the remainder of it. On 29th September, a single company of the 23rd Division carried the farm of Destremont. 
some 400 yards southwest of Lissars, and just north of the Abbey of Popon Road. On the afternoon of 1st October, we advanced on a front of 3,000 yards, taking the Fleur's line north of Dextremont, while the 47th Division occupied the buildings of the old Abbey of Ocour, less than a mile southeast of Lersar's village. Here, for several days, remnants of the 6th Bavarian Division made a stout resistance. On the morning of 2nd October, the enemy had regained a footing in the Abbey, and during the whole of the next day and night, the battle fluctuated. It was not till the morning of the 4th that we finally cleared the place, and on 6th October, the mill northwest of it was won. On the afternoon of 7th October, a day of cloud and strong winds, but free from rain, we attacked on a broader front, while the French, on our right, moved against the key position of Sally Salazel. After a heavy struggle, the 23rd Division captured Lassars and won positions to the east and west of it. While our line was considerably advanced between Guidencourt and Le Beauf. from that date for a month we struggled up the slopes, gaining ground but never winning the crests. The enemy now followed a new practice. He had his machine guns well back in prepared positions and caught our attack with their long-range fire. We wrestled for odd lengths of fantastically named trenches, which were often three feet deep in water. It was no light job to get over the slimy parapets, and the bringing up of supplies and the evacuation of the wounded placed a terrible burden on our strength. Under conditions of such grievous discomfort, an attack on a comprehensive scale was out of the question. The more one would remember the condition of the area behind our lines. At one moment it seemed as if the butte had been won. On 5th November we were over it, and holding positions on the eastern side. But that night a counterattack by fresh troops of the 4th Guard Division, who had just come up, forced us to fall back. This was the one successful enemy counterstroke in this stage of the battle. For the most part they were too weak, if delivered promptly, and when they came later, in strength, they were broken up by our guns. The struggle of those days deserves to rank high in the records of British hardihood. The fighting had not the swift pace and the brilliant successes of the September battles. Our men had to strive for minor objectives, and such a task lacks the impetus and acceleration of a great combined assault. On many occasions, the battle resolved itself into isolated struggles, a handful of men in a mud hole holding out and consolidating their ground till their post was linked up with our main front. Rain, cold, slow reliefs, the absence of hot food, and sometimes of any food at all, made those episodes a severe test of endurance and devotion. During this period, the enemy, amazed at his good fortune inasmuch as the weather had crippled our advance, fell into a flamboyant mood and represented the result as a triumph of the fighting quality of his own troops. From day to day he announced a series of desperate British assaults, invariably repulsed with heavy losses. He spoke of British corps and divisions advancing in massed formation, when, at the most, it had been an affair of a few battalions. Often he announced an attack on a day and in a locality where nothing whatever had happened. It is to be noted that, except for the highly successful action of 21st October, presently to be recorded, there was no British attack during the month on anything like a large scale, and that the various minor actions so far from having caused us high were among the most economical of the campaign. Our second task, in which we brilliantly succeeded, was to master completely the Thief Fall Bridge, by the end of September, the strong redoubts northeast of the village, called Stuff and Zolan, were in our hands, and on the 28th of that month we had carried the southern phase of Schwaben Redoubt. It was Schwaben to which the heroic advance of the Ulster Division had penetrated on the first day of the battle, but next day the advance post had been drawn in, and three months had elapsed before we again entered it. It was now a very different place from 1st July. Our guns had pounded it out of recognition, but it remained from its situation, 
the pivot of the whole German line on the heights. Thence the trenches called Stuff and Regina ran east for some 5,000 yards to a point northeast of Corselet. These trenches, representing many of the dominating points of the ridge south of the Agra, were defended by the enemy with the most admirable tenacity. Between 30th September and 20th October, while we were battling for the remainder of Schwaben, he delivered not less than 11 counterattacks against our front in that neighborhood, counterattacks which in every case were repulsed with heavy losses. His front was held by the 26th Reserve Division and by Marines of the Naval Division, who had been brought down from the Easter and who gave a better account of themselves than their previous record had led us to expect. A captured German regimental order, dated 20th October, emphasized the necessity of regaining the Schwaben redoubt. Men are to be informed by their immediate superiors that this attack is not merely a matter of retaking a trench, because it was formerly in German possession, but that the recapture of an extremely important point is involved. If the enemy remains on the bridge, he can blow our artillery in the Agra Valley to pieces, and the protection of the infantry will then be destroyed. From 20th to 23rd October, there came a short spell of fine weather. There was frost at night, a strong easterly wind dried the ground, and the air conditions were perfect for observation. The enemy was quick to take advantage of the change, and early on the morning of Saturday, 21st October, delivered that attack upon the Schwaben Redoubt, for which the order quoted above was a preparation. The attack was made in strength and at all points, but two was repulsed by our fire before reaching our lines. At two points, the Germans entered our trenches, but were promptly driven out, leaving many dead in front of our positions and five officers and 79 other ranks prisoners in our hands. This counterstroke came opportunely for us, for it enabled us to catch the enemy on the rebound. We struck shortly after noon, attacking against the whole length of the Regina Trench, with the 39th, 15th, and 18th Divisions on our left and center, and the 4th Canadian Division on our right. The attack was completely successful, for the enemy, disorganized by his failure of the morning, was in no condition for prolonged resistance. We attained all our objectives, taking the whole of Stuff and Regina trenches, pushing out advanced posts well to the north and northeast of Schwaben Redoubt, and establishing our position on the crown of the ridge between the Upper Anger and Corselet. In the course of the day, we took nearly 1,100 prisoners at the expense of less than 1,200 casualties, many of which were extremely slight. There still remained one small section of the ridge where our position was unsatisfactory. This was at the extreme eastern end of Regina Trench, just west of the Bapong Road. Its capture was achieved on the night of 10th November, when the 4th Canadian Division carried it on a front of 1,000 yards. This rounded off our gains and allowed us to dominate the upper valley of the Anger and the uplands beyond it behind the unbroken German first line, from Beaumont, Hamel, to Cetra. Meantime, during the month, the French armies on our right had pressed forward. At the end of September, they had penetrated into St. pierre Vast Wood, whose labyrinthine depths extended east of Rancourt and south of Salisel. The immediate object of the forces under Falk was to cooperate with the British advance by taking the height of Sally Salisel and so to work round Mount St. Quentin, the main defense of Peron on the north. And on 4th October, they carried the German intermediate line between Morval and St. Pierre Vast Wood. And on 8th October, in a splendid movement, they swept up the Sally Salisel slopes and won the above Palm Peron Road to a point 200 yards from its northern entry into the village. On 10th October, Michelin's 10th Army was in action on a front of three miles and carried the western outskirts of Appalachian Court and the greater part of the wood northwest of Chalmers, taking nearly 1,300 prisoners. On the 15th, Fayel pushed east of Boucher-Besne, and on the same day, south of the Somme, 
Michele, after beating off a counterattack, carried a mile and a quarter of the German front west of Beloy, and advanced well to the northeast of Ablin Court, taking some 1,000 prisoners. This brought the French nearer to the ridge of Villers Carbonel, behind which the German batteries played the same part of the southern defense of Perron as Mount St. Quentin did for the northern. Next day, Salic Salicel was entered and occupied as far as the crossroads, the Salicel section of the village on the road running eastward, being still in German hands. For the next few days, the enemy delivered violent counterattacks from both north and east, using liquid fire. But they failed to oust the garrison, and that part of the village held by the Germans was mercilessly pounded by the French guns. On the 21st, the newly arrived 2nd Bavarian Division made a desperate attack from the southern border of Salisel and the ridge northeast of St. Pierre Vast Wood, but failed with many losses. There were other heavy and fruitless counterstrokes south of the Somme and the regions of Biache and Chalness. The month closed with the French holding Sally, but not Salisel, holding the western skirts of St. Pierre Vast Wood and south of the river outflanking Ablin Court and Cholness. End of chapter 63, part 2 Section 23 of the History of the Great War, Volume 3 The Beleaguered Forest Continued and the Great Sallies This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of the Great War, Volume 3, by John Buchan. Chapter 63, The Battle of the Song Continued, September 9th to November 18th, 1916, Part 3. 3. On 9th November, the weather improved. The wind swung round to the north and the rain ceased. But owing to the season of the year, the ground was slow to dry, and in the area of the Fourth Army the roads were still past praying for. Presently frost came and a powder of snow, and then once more the rain. But in the few days of comparatively good conditions, the British commander-in-chief brought the battle to a further stage, and won a conspicuous victory. On the first day of July, as we have seen, our attack had failed on the eight miles between Goldman Court and Thiepva. For four months we drove far into the heart of the German defenses farther south, but the stubborn enemy front before Beaumont Hamel and Serre remained untried. The position was immensely strong, and its holders, not without reason, believed it to be impregnable. All the slopes were tunneled deep with old catacombs, many of them made originally as hiding places in the wars of religion, and these had been linked up by passages to constitute a subterranean city, where whole battalions could be assembled. There were endless redoubts and strong points armed with machine guns, as we knew to our cost in July, and the wire entanglements were on a scale which had never been paralleled. Looked at from our first line, they resembled a solid wall of red rust. Very strong, too, were the sides of the anchor, should we seek to force a passage that way. In the hamlets of Beaucourt and St. Pierre de Vion, one on each bank, were fortresses of the Beaumont Hamel stamp. From Gamincourt to the Deep Val Ridge, the enemy positions were the old first line ones, repaired during two years of leisure and not the improvised defenses on which they had been thrown back between Thiepong and Chalness. At the beginning of November, the area of the Allied pressure was over 30 miles, but we had never lost sight of the necessity of widening the breach. It was desirable, with a view to the winter warfare, that the enemy should be driven out of his prepared defenses on the broadest possible front. A scheme of an assault upon the Surrey Ancrete line might seem a desperate one so late in the season, but we had learned much since 1st July, and as compared with that date, we had now certain real advantages. In the first place, our whole tactical use of artillery 
had undergone a change. A creeping barrage, moving in front of advancing infantry, protected them to a great extent against the machine gun fusillade from parapets and shell holes, which had been our undoing in the earlier battle, and assisted them in keeping direction. In the second place, our position of the whole deep fog ridge seriously outflanked the German front north of the anchor. In the dips of the high ground behind Surrey and Beaumont Hamel, their batteries had been skillfully emplaced in the beginning of July, and they had been able to devote their whole energy to the attack coming from the west. But now they were facing southward and operating against our lines on the deep fog ridge, and we commanded them to some extent by possessing the higher ground and the better observation. If, therefore, we should attack again from the west, supported also by our artillery fire from the south, the enemy guns would be fighting on two fronts. The German position in July had been straight line. It was now a salient. We had another asset for a November assault. The slow progress of the Fourth Army during October had led the enemy to conclude that our offensive had ceased for the winter. Drawing a natural deduction from the condition of the country, he argued that an attack on a grand scale was physically impossible, especially an attack upon the fortress which had defied our efforts when we advanced with fresh troops and unwearied impetus in the height of summer. But the area from Thiepa northward did not suffer from transport difficulties in the same degree as the southern terrain since we would be advancing from what was virtually our old front line. We would escape the problem of crossing five or six miles of shelter on ground by roads plowed up and broken from four months' traffic. It is necessary to grasp the topographical features of the new battleground. From north of the Schwaben Redoubt, our front curved sharply to the northwest, crossing the anchor 500 yards south of the hamlet of St. Pierre de Vion and extending northward along the foot of the slopes on which lay the villages of Beaumont Hamel and Surrey. From the high ground northwest of the anchor, several clearly marked spurs descended to the upper valley of that stream. The chief was a long ridge with Surrey as its western extremity, the village of Roussier on the north, Beaucourt sur Anchor on the south, and Miramont on the eastern end. South of this, there was another feature running from a point a thousand yards north of Beaumont Hamel to the village of Beaucourt. This latter spur had on its southwest side a shallow depression up which runs the Beaucourt Beaumont Hamel Road, and it was defined on the northeast by the Beaucourt Surrey Road. On the right bank of the anchor was thus a country of slopes and pockets. On the left bank, there was a stretch of flattish ground under the deep fall ridge, extending up the valley past St. Pierre de Vion to Grand Corps. On Sunday, 12th November, Sir Hubert Goff's 5th Army held the area from Grand Court in the north to the Elbe Bopon Road, opposite Surrey and extending south to a point just north of Beaumont Hamel, lay the 31st, 3rd, and 2nd Divisions. In front of Beaumont Hamel was the 51st Highland Territorial Division. They had been more than 18 months in France, and at the end of July and the beginning of August had spent 17 days in the line at High Wood. On their right was a point just south of the famous Y Ravine to the Anchor, lay the 63rd Naval Division, which had a long record of fighting from Antwerp to Gallipoli, but now for the first time took part in an action on the Western Front. Across the river lay the 39th and 19th Divisions. The boundary of the attack on the right was roughly defined by the Thief of Grand Court Road. The British guns began on the morning of Saturday the 11th, a bombardment devoted to the destruction of the enemy's wire and parapets. It went on fiercely during Sunday, but did not increase to hurricane fire, so that the enemy had no warning of the hour of our attack. In the darkness of the early morning of Monday, 13th November, the fog gathered thick, a cold, raw vapor which wrapped the ground like a garment. It was still black darkness, darker even than the usual moonless winter night. 
When, at 5.45 a.m., our troops crossed the parapets, the attack had been carefully planned, but in that dense shroud it was hard for the best trained soldiers to keep direction. On the other hand, the enemy had no warning of our coming till our men were surging over his trenches. The attack of the British left wing on Surrey failed, as it had failed on 1st July. That stronghold, being farther removed from the effect of our flanking fire from the Deep Fall Ridge, presented all the difficulties which had baffled us at the first attempt. South of it, and north of Beaumont Hamel, we carried the German first position and swept beyond the fortress, called the Quadrilateral, which had proved too hard a knot to unravel four months earlier. This gave us the northern part of the under feature, which we have noted as running southeast to Beaucourt. Our right wing had a triumphant progress. Almost at once it gained its objectives. St. Pierre de Vion fell early in the morning, and the 39th Division engaged there, advanced a mile and took nearly 1,400 prisoners, at a total cost of less than 600 casualties. By the evening, they were holding the Hansel Line, which ran from the neighborhood of Stuffed Trench on the Heights to the bank of the river opposite Beaucourt. But it was on the doings of the two center divisions that the fortune of the day depended. The Highland Territorials, a Celtic division except for their lowland pioneer battalion, had one of the hardest tasks that had faced troops in the battle, a task comparable to the taking of Contalmaison and Guillemot and Delville Wood. They had before them the fortress village of Beaumont Hamel itself. South of it lay the strong ridge redoubt, and south again, the wide ravine, whose prongs projected down to the German front line and whose tail ran back to its station road south of the cemetery. The wide ravine was some 800 yards long and in places 30 feet deep, with overhanging sides. In its precipitous banks were the entrances to the German dugouts, completely screened from shell fire and connecting farther back by means of tunnels with the great catacombs. Such a position allowed reinforcements to be sent up underground, even though we might be holding all the sides. The four successive German lines were so skillfully linked up subterraneously that they formed virtually a single line, no part of which could be considered to be captured till the whole was taken. The first assault took the Scots to the German defenses on all their front, except just before the ends of the wide ravine. They advanced on both sides of that gully and carried the third enemy line shortly after daybreak. There was much stern fighting in the honeycombed land, but early in the forenoon they had pushed right through the German main position and were pressing beyond Station Road and the hollow where the village lay towards their ultimate objective, the Bulcourt Seri Road. The chief fighting of the day centered round Y Ravine. So soon as they had gained the third line on both sides of it, our men leaped down the steep sides into the gully. Then followed a desperate struggle, for the entrances to the dugouts had been obscured by our bombardment, and no man knew from what direction the enemy might appear. About midday, the eastern part of the ravine was full of our men, but the Germans were in the prongs. Early in the afternoon, we delivered a fresh attack from the west and gradually forced the defense to surrender. After that, it became a battle of netoyotes, small parties taking out Germans from underground layers, for the very strength of his fortifications proved a trap to the enemy once they had been breached. On their right, the naval division advanced against Bocor, attacking over the ground which had been partly covered by the left of the Ulster Division on 1st July. On that day, the British trenches had been between 500 and 700 yards from the German front line, leaving too great an extent of no man's land to be covered by the attacking infantry. But before the present action, the naval division had dug advanced trenches and now possessed a line of departure not more than 250 yards from the enemy. Their first objective was the German support line. Their second station road, which ran from Beaumont Hamel to the main Albert Lilly, 
railway, and they third the trench line outside Bogor village. The wave of assault carried the men over the first two German lines, and for a moment it looked as if the advance was about to go smoothly forward to its goal. But in the center of our front of attack, in a communication trench between the second and third German lines, and about 800 yards from the river bank, was a very strong redoubt manned by machine guns. This had not been touched by our artillery, and it effectively blocked the center of our advance, while at the same time flanking fire from the slopes behind Beaumont Hamel, checked our left. Various parties got through and reached the German support line, and even as far as Station Road. But at about 8.30 the situation, as reviewed by the divisional commander, bore an ominous likeness to what had happened to the Ulster men on 1st July. Isolated detachments had gone forward, but the enemy had manned his reserve trenches behind them, and the formidable redoubt was blocking any general progress. At this moment there came news by a pigeon message of the right battalion. It had gone clean through to the third objective, and was now waiting outside Bokor village for our barrage to lift in order to take the place. Its commander had led his men along the brink of the river to Station Road, where he had collected odd parties of other battalions, and at 8.21 had reached Beaucourt Trench, a mile distance from our front of assault. At that day, a precarious avenue of communication for food and ammunition was kept open along the edge of the stream, under such shelter as the banks afforded. A second attack on the whole front was delivered in the afternoon by the supporting brigade of the naval division, but this too was held up by the redoubt, though again a certain number got through and reached Station Road, and even the slopes beyond it. That night it was resolved to make a great effort to put the redoubt out of action. Two tanks were brought up, one of which succeeded at dawn in getting within range, and the garrison of the stronghold hoisted the white flag. The way was now clear for a general advance next morning, to assist in which a brigade of another division was brought up in support. Part of the advance lost direction, but the result was to clear the German first position and the ground between Station Road and Beaucourt Trench. At the same time, the right battalion, which had been waiting outside Beaucourt for 24 hours, assisted by a territorial battalion and by details from its own division, carried the place by storm. The success was an instructive proof of the value of holding forward positions even though flanks and rear were threatened, if there was any certainty of supports. Like the doings of the 15th Division at Los, it pointed the way to a new form of tactics, but the lesson was read more correctly by the enemy than by the Allies. By the night of Tuesday, 14th November, our total of prisoners on the five-mile front of battle was well over 5,000. The German counterattack of the 15th failed to win back any ground. Just east of Beaumont Hamel, there was an extensive no-man's land, for Munich Trench could not be claimed by either side, but in the Bocourt area we steadily pressed on. On Thursday the 16th, we pushed east from Beaucourt Village along the north bank of the Anger, establishing posts in the Bois de Holland to the northwest of Grand Corps. Frost had set in, and it was possible from the Thiefal Ridge or from the slopes above Hamel to see clearly the whole new battlefield, and even in places to follow the infantry advance, a thing which had not been feasible since the summer fighting. By that day, our total of prisoners was over 6,000. On the 17th, we again advanced, and on Saturday, the 18th, in a downpour of icy rain, the Canadians on the right of the 5th Army, attacking from Regina Trench, moved well down the slope towards the river, while the center pushed close to the western skirts of Grand Corps. It was the last attack, with which concluded the Battle of the Somme. The weather had now fallen like a curtain upon the drama. The final stage was a fitting denouement to the great action. It gave us three strongly fortified villages and practically the whole of the minus spur which ran from north of Beaumont Hamel 
de Beaucourt. It extended the breach in the main enemy position by five miles. Our front was now far down the slopes from the Thiepval Ridge and north and west of Grand Corps. We had taken well over 7,000 prisoners in vast quantities of material, including several hundred machine guns. Our losses had been comparatively slight, while those of the enemy were, on his own admission, severe. Above all, at the moment when he was beginning to argue himself, entered the belief that the Somme offensive was over. His calculations had been upset by an unexpected stroke. We had opened the old wound and undermined his morale by reviving the terrors of the unknown and the unexpected. 4. Before 1st July, Verdun had been the greatest continuous battle fought in the world's history, but the Somme surpassed it both in numbers of men engaged, in the tactical difficulty of the objectives, and in its importance in the strategical scheme of the campaign. Its significance may be judged by the way in which it preoccupied the enemy high command. It was the fashion in Germany to describe it as a futile attack upon an unshakable fortress, an attack which might be disregarded by her public opinion while she continued her true business of conquest in the East. But the fact remained that the great bulk of the German troops, and by far the best of them, were kept congregated in this area. In November, Germany had 127 divisions on the Western Front, and no more than 75 in the East. A Brusselov's attack and Falkenhayn's Romanian expedition compelled him to send fresh troops eastward. She did not diminish, but increased her strength in the west. In June, she had fourteen divisions on the Somme. In November, she had in line, were just out of it, well over forty. By what test are we to judge the result of a battle in modern war? In the old days of open fighting, there was little room for doubt since the retreat or rout or envelopment of the beaten army was too clear for argument. Now, when the total battlefront was 3,000 miles, such easy proof were lacking, but the principle remained the same. A battle is final when it ends in the destruction of the enemy's fighting strength. A battle is won, and it may be decisively won, when it results in achieving the strategic purpose of one of the combatants provided that purpose is, on military grounds, a wise one. Hence the amount of territory occupied and the number of important points captured are not necessarily sound criteria at all. The success or defeat of a strategic purpose, that is the sole test. Judging by this, Tannenberg was a victory for Germany, the Marne for France, and the first battle of Eber for Britain. The Battle of the Somme was no less a victory since it achieved the purpose of the Allies. In the first place, it relieved Verdun and enabled Neville to advance presently to a conspicuous success. In the second place, it detained the main German forces on the Western Front. In the third place, it drew into the battle and gravely depleted the surplus manpower of the enemy and struck a shattering blow at his morale. For two years, the German behind the shelter of his trench works and the great engine of his artillery had fought with comparatively little cost against opponents far less well equipped. The Somme put the shoe on the other foot, and he came to know what the British learned in Ypres and the French in Artois, what it meant to be bombarded out of existence and to cling to shell holes and the rooms of trenches under a pitiless fire. It was a new thing in his experience, and took the heart out of men who, under other conditions, had fought with skill and courage. Further, the Allies had dislocated his whole military machine. Their ceaseless pressure had crippled his staff work and confused the organization of which he had justly boasted. Haig's sober summary was true. The enemy's power has not yet been broken. Nor is it yet possible to form an estimate of the time the war may have the objects for which the Allies are fighting have been attained. But the Somme battle has placed beyond doubt the ability of the Allies to gain these objects. The German army is the mainstay of the Central Powers, and a full half of that army, despite all the advantages of the defensive, 
supported by the strongest fortifications, suffered defeat on the Somme this year. Neither the victors nor the vanquished will forget this, and though bad weather has given the enemy a respite, there will undoubtedly be many thousands in his ranks who would begin the new campaign with little confidence in their ability to resist our assaults or to overcome our defense. Let it be freely granted that Germany met the strain in a soldierly fashion. She set herself at once to learn the lessons of the battle and to revise her methods where revision was needed. She made drastic changes in her high commands. She endeavored still further to exploit her already much exploited manpower and combed out even from vital industries every man who was capable of taking the field. Her effort was magnificent, and it was war. She had created since 1st July some 30-odd new divisions, who were partly by converting garrison units into field troops, and partly by regrouping units from existing formations, taking a regiment away from a four-regiment division and a battalion from a four-battalion regiment, and withdrawing the Jaeger battalions. But these changes, though they increased the number of her units, did not add proportionately to the aggregate of her numerical strength, and we may take 100,000 men as the maximum of the total gain in field troops from this readjustment. Moreover, she had to provide artillery and staffs for each of the new divisions, which involved a heavy strain upon services already taxed to the full. Her commission classes had been sorely depleted. This shortened, so ran an order of Hindenburgs in September, due to our heavy casualties of experienced, energetic, and well-trained junior officers, as sorely felt at the present time. The Battle of the Somme had, therefore, fulfilled the Allied purpose in taxing to the uttermost the German war machine. It tried the command. It tried the nation at home and it tried to the last limit of endurance the men in the line. The place became a name of terror, though belittled in communiques and rarely mentioned in the press. It was a word of ill omen to the whole German people, that bloodbath to which many journeyed and from which few returned. Of what availed their easy conquests on the Danube when this deadly cancer in the West was eating into the vitals of the nation? Winter might give a short respite, though the Battle of the Anchor had been fought in winter weather. But spring would come, and the evil would grow malignant again. Germany gathered herself for a great effort, marshalling for compulsory war work, the whole male population between seventeen and sixty, sending every man to the trenches who could walk on sound feet, doling out food supplies on the minimum scale for the support of life, and making desperate efforts by submarine warfare to cripple her enemy's strength. She was driven to stake her last resources on the game. In every great action, there is a major purpose, a reasoned and calculated purpose, which takes no account of the accidents of fortune. But in most actions, there come sudden strokes of luck which turn the scale. For such strokes, a general has a right to hope, but on them he dare not build. Marengo, Waterloo, Chancellorville, most of the great battles of other times showed these gifts of destiny. But in the elaborate and mechanical warfare of today, they come rarely, and at the Battle of the Somme, they did not fall to the lot of Falk or Haig. They did what they set out to do. Step by step, they drove their way through the enemy defenses. But it was all done by hard and stubborn fighting, without any bounty from capricious fortune. Germany had claimed that her line was impregnable. They broke it again and again. She had counted on her artillery machine. They crippled and outmatched it. She had decried the fighting stuff of the new British armies, who showed that it was a match for her guards and Brandenburgers. Footnote. Between 1st July and 18th November, the British on the Somme took just over 38,000 prisoners, including 800 officers, 29 Hudley guns, 96 field guns, 136 field mortars, and 514 machine guns. End of footnote. The major purpose was attained, like some harsh and remorseless chemical. The waxing allied energy was eating into the German waning mass. 
its sure and methodical pressure head, the inevitability of a natural law. It was attrition, but attrition in the acute form, not like the slow erosion of cliffs by the sea, but like the steady crumbling of a mountain to which hydraulic engineers have applied a mighty head of water. And it was a new law of life, and of war, that the weakness of the less strong would grow pari passu with the power of the stronger. The tactics and strategy of the Allies at the Somme were those natural to armies which had a greater preponderance in men and munitions. The method of laborious attrition presupposed the continuance of the war on two fronts. Should Russia fall out of line, the situation would be radically changed, and the plan would become futile against an enemy with a large new reservoir of recruitment. But at the time of its inception, uninspired and expensive as it might be, it was a sound plan, and Caterus Parabus would have given the Allies victory before the end of 1917. Even as things befell, the battle was not fought in vain, which struck a blow at the heart of Germany's strength, from which she never wholly recovered. Let Ludendorff himself describe the situation at the close. Our position was uncommonly difficult, and a way out hard to find. We could not contemplate an offense of ourselves, having to keep our reserves available for defense. If the war lasted, our defeat seemed inevitable. Footnote, my war memories, English translation, 1, page 307, end of footnote. End of chapter 63, part 3. Section 24 of the History of the Great War, Volume 3. The Beleaguered Forest Continued, and the Great Sallies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of the Great War, Volume 3, by John Buchan. Chapter 64. Romania's Campaign, August 27th to December 6th. 1916, Part 1 The Romanian Declaration of War, issued at 9 o'clock on the evening of 27th August, was accompanied by an order for general mobilization. This was no more than a formality to recall officers and men still on leave, and to summon second-line troops to guard the railways. For months, mobilization had been in progress, and such strength as Romania possessed was ready to her hand when, her harvest over, she made the great decision. Next day, 28th August, at 18 points, her troops had crossed the Transylvanian border. Before entering on the details of her campaign, we must note the nature of the military problem now presented to her, and the resources which she possessed to meet it. Her immediate and contiguous enemies were Austria and Bulgaria, and the first point to consider is the nature of her frontier. That frontier fell naturally into three sections, from Dorna Watra, in the north, to Orsovo on the Danube, the Transylvanian Plateau, rimmed by a range of mountains, jutted out like a huge bastion into her territory, almost dividing Moldavia from Wallachia. Here, the borderline, nearly 400 miles in length, followed for the most part the crest of the hills. On these, the northern part is known as the Southern Carpathians, and the southern as the Transylvanian Alps. But it is all one mountain system. On the Romanian side, the heights fall steeply to the wooded foothills, but on the west, the slopes are easier towards the plateau. The chief peaks are from 7,000 to 8,000 feet in height and the passes are for the most part deep winding ravines. These passes, which were to play a great part in the campaign, are numerous, but only ten may be considered of military importance. Four of these are on the Moldavian front. The Tolgis, served by highway from the Austrian railhead at Toplitza. The Bikas, traversed by a bad mountain road. The Gaimis, carrying a road and a railway from Ocna in Moldavia to Tsik Tsarida in Transylvania, and the Ultas, 
with a road from Okna to the head of an Austrian branch line. Of the four, all were close to the railway on the Austrian side, but only two had good Romanian railway connections. At the angle of the salient is the Basu, or Bodza Pass, with a railhead on the Romanian side and a good road running to Kronstadt. Going west, following order, the Protosia, the Predial, or Tomos, and the Torsberg Pass, all the communications of which radiate from Kronstadt. Of these, the Predio carried the main road and railway from Kronstadt to Bucharest, and the Torsberg, a road from Kronstadt to the Romanian railhead at Camp Along. Farther west lies the Rotherham, or Red Tower Pass, the best in the range, through which ran the road and railway for Hermannstadt to Bucharest. It is traversed by the river Aluta, which, rising close to the source of the Maros, the other great Transylvanian stream, flows south and west inside the rim of the salient, and then at the Rutherum breaks through the Transylvanian Alps to the Wallachian Plains. Last comes the Vulcan, a road pass with a railhead at each end of it. On the Transylvanian side, it gave access to the mining district of Proseni and Hatzeg, and on the Wallachian side, it opened upon the wide corn lands around Krajova, from Orsova to Totokai. A distance of 270 miles, the Romanian frontier was the Danube. From the Iron Gates to the Delta, the northern shore of the river is lower than the southern, and, being subject to constant inundations, is for the most part a chain of swamps, lakes, and backwaters. The patches of firm land can be picked out, even on a small scale map, by noticing the points where a town or village on the Romanian shore faces a town or village on the Bulgarian side. These pairs of towns mark the places where for centuries there have been ferries across the river. Several were railheads, provided with wharves and facilities for handling cargo and river traffic. Below Orzova, the Danube is really less than a mile broad, and on this stretch of frontier it was clear that military operations could not be immediately undertaken. The last section ran from the Danube to the Black Sea across the arid plateau known as the Dobrudja. To reach it, Romania had the good river crossings at Trutikai and Silistria, and the great bridge of Chernavoda, the only bridge between Nutzat Peter Fiden in Hungary and the mouth of the Danube, the Dobruja, which may be regarded as a tongue of the Balkan uplands, projecting to the northeast, is a barren steppe of sand-covered limestone, unwatered and treeless. It abuts on various crossings of the Danube Delta, and so has for centuries been the gate of invasion from the north, since the Goths and Slavs first swept down upon Byzantium. These invasions have left their trail upon it, and today it is still inhabited by the debris of forgotten races, the flotsam and jetsam of history. Her new frontier, now pushed forty miles southward by the Treaty of Bucharest, gave Romania a position on the flank of Bulgaria which, if she remained on the defensive, would endanger any Bulgarian attempt to cross the Danube, and, if she took the offensive, might enable her to threaten the main line of communications between Constantinople and Vienna. Stated, therefore, in geographical terms, the situation of Romania in a war with the Teutonic League was that on west and south she was enclosed by hostile territory. The Danube front might for the moment be neglected, and the Dobroja front seemed to her safe from any serious attack. The main danger, in her view, lay in the Transylvanian salient. Her frontier there was in the shape of the curve of a capital D, a bad defensive line at the best, and impossible for her to hold strongly with the forces at her command. Her first interest was to shorten it, as she could reach the upright line of the D, a position represented by the central Maros Valley, between Maros, Vesely, and Bruce, she would be safe from any serious enemy counteroffensive, and would be able either to wait with an easy mind on the development of the Russian campaign farther north, 
or to strike southward against the Ottoman railway. But in modern war, a strategic position is not determined by geography alone, but mainly by those means of communication through which the industry of man has supplemented nature. In railways, Romania was far behind her enemies. Her own lines had been built largely with Austria's assistance at a time when she was Austria's ally, and at no point had their construction been devised in the light of military needs. On the western side of the mountains, Austria was well supplied. A number of railways, including four first-class lines, converged on Transylvania. They were sufficient cross lines, and all were linked together by the frontier railway, which curved round the border just inside the mountains, thereby permitting for concentration at any point for the defense of the passes, while another cross line served for concentration along the Maros Valley. Besides the line at the Iron Gates, two good lines ran into the Wallachian Plains, and a third into Moldavia. The whole system enabled operations to be conducted on the inside of a curved salient. The defect of the Romanian system was that there were few lines for through movements, that the branch lines were short lengths ending at railheads near the river or the mountains, that, since most of the tracks were single, traffic capacity was limited, and that, since there was a paucity of alternative routes to any point, traffic backwards and forwards had to be carried over the one line. A Romanian army operating against Transylvania was compelled to use a railway system, which in the military sense was entirely on exterior lines, and the length of movement required to reinforce any point was excessive whereas the Austrians had a lateral railway between 20 and 30 miles from the frontier. The only lateral connection in Moldavia was 50 miles away, and in Wallachia still farther. From the Predeal Pass to the Rotherham Pass, troops could be moved on the Austrian side by a railway journey of 80 miles, but the same problem for Romania and a detour of nearly 300 the situation elsewhere on the border was little better. No railway line could follow the swampy northern shore of the Danube. In the Dobruja, Romania had the new railway from Chernivoda to Dobrich, but she had no lateral line. But the main Chernivoda Constanza railway was sixty miles inside the new frontier. Bulgaria, on the other hand, had the Russian Varna line close at her back for offense and defense. It may fairly be said, therefore, that the natural strategic difficulties of Romania's geographical situation were increased in every theater by railway communications vastly inferior to those of her enemies. The second part of her problem was the military strength at her disposal. She had, roughly, half a million men, but her armies, while containing abundance of good human material, were, except in the older units, imperfectly trained and very imperfectly armed. For two years she had contemplated war, but since she was dependent for new material on foreign imports by way of Russia, the supply had naturally fallen far short of the demand. The standard of equipment which she had set herself before declaring war had been too modestly conceived. She was desperately short of heavy guns, of aircraft, of machine guns, even of rifles, and she had no great reserve of ammunition. The Vertoli rifle had just been served out to her troops, a weapon which Italy had discarded twenty years before. In every branch of equipment she was far below the level of the Teutonic League. Moreover, she was not rich in trained officers or experienced generals. Few, even of her senior commanders, had had actual experience of war save as boys in the Russo-Turkish campaign forty years before. She was preparing not for a war of positions, where strong natural and artificial defenses may give a chance to the weaker side, but for a war of movement, where skillful leadership and sound organization are all in all. She was entering, moreover, upon a campaign against an enemy who fought largely with his guns, and she had only a trifling artillery to meet the gigantic machine, which had now been elaborated 
through two years of unceasing effort. Her four armies, each no more than a group of half a dozen infantry divisions, ill-supported by artillery, had to guard an awkward frontier of over 700 miles. She could not expect to succeed unless she had the help of her allies in guidance and leadership, in strategical diversions, and above all, in equipment. She counted especially on Russia, on Lachitsky's progress in the Carpathians, to embarrass the Austrian left wing in Transylvania. She counted, too, on Sorel's advance in the Balkans to distract the attention of Bulgaria. She reckoned upon a steady flow of munitions across the Russian border. In all these hopes, as we shall see, she was disappointed. She was left to make her decisions and for the most part to fight her battles alone. The blame for the Allies' failure to support Romania was hard to apportion. Partly it was the fortune of war. Surreal failed to advance from Salonika, not from lack of goodwill, but from lack of strength. The Chitsky and the Carpathians, with an army tired by four months fighting, could not play the part assigned to him. Russia, at the moment of Romania's entry, was coming to the end of her mighty effort from the sheer exhaustion of men and munitions. Her general staff had tried to induce Romania to declare war in June, when Brusilov's advance was beginning, but she had deferred the step to so late a date that the impetus of the Galician movement was all but exhausted. The great soldier who was chief of the Russian staff now deprecated Romania's adventure, and in this, as in many other things, Alexeyev was right. When the debacle came, he and his colleagues did their best to step into the breach, but the chance of success had long passed. Yet it must be remembered that it was Petrograd especially which forced King Ferdinand's decision, and on the civil government of Russia must rest no small part of the blame for what followed. They had offered Romania extravagant terms, in the shape of territorial annexations, and Sturma and his Camarilla had guaranteed an ample munition meant. This last and most vital promise was never fulfilled, was never attempted to be fulfilled. There were strange tales of consignments of munitions for Romania, sidetracked and delayed by direct orders from Petrograd, and there is some reason to believe that Sturma had deliberately planned a Romanian defeat as part of the scheme for a separate peace with Germany. Such treason was confined to the civilians, and was wholly alien to the mind of the Russian soldiers. The latter did what they could, but fate and Hindenburg were the stronger. Since, therefore, in the details of the campaign, Romania followed her own counsels, it remains to consider the wisdom of the strategy she adopted, assuming that the Allied assistance which she counted on had been forthcoming, was her plan of action the best in the circumstances? During the winter of 1916, she was severely criticized in the West, both in military and civil circles, and the criticisms were mainly directed to her initial strategy. What was this strategy, and wherein did it fall short of common sense? Of her four armies, she directed three against Transylvania, with, as their ultimate objective, the central valley of the river Maros. The fourth army was left on the defensive in the Dobrogea to cover the Bulgarian frontier, and small detachments from it were scattered along the Danube valley to watch the crossing places. The Austrian Danube flotilla held all the middle river, and the Romanian rivercraft were unable to leave the lower reaches. Romania's strategic aim may, therefore, be set out as follows. She stood on the defensive against Bulgaria with small forces, hoping that Surreal in the south would keep the attention of that enemy sufficiently occupied. With her main army, she aimed at cutting off the Transylvania salient and holding the line of the Maros, partly, for political reasons, to free her Transylvanian kinsmen, partly to give herself a short and straight defensive line instead of the long curve of the mountain barrier partly to turn the right wing of the Austrian forces opposed to Lachitsky, and so in the event of a Russian advance to prepare a complete enemy debacle in eastern Hungary. 
The current criticism upon her action was that she sacrificed strategy to politics, that, preoccupied with the desire to win Transylvania, she entered it prematurely, when she was too weak to hold it, and that she missed a supreme chance of striking a deadly blow with the enemy by cutting the communications between Germany and Turkey. The proper course, it was argued, was that Romania to have stood on the defensive in the mountain passes, and thrown her main weight through the Dobruja against Bulgarian and the Ottoman Railway. Such reasoning in the light of after events is clear and convincing. But the problem which Romania had to solve in those last days of August was by no means simple. Undoubtedly, the desire to vindicate their decision by the occupation of Transylvania was strong among the members of Monsieur Bratineau's ministry. But there was some justification for Romania's plan on military grounds alone. Her main enemy lay in the west, and sooner or later the Austro-German armies would move against her. How was she to hold the long curve of the hills and the many passes with slender forces, with a perfect railway system in front of her, and the worst conceivable at her back? Every pass could be turned on its flanks, and the German Alpine troops would find a way over the goat tracks. Footnote. The argument is stated as it may have appealed to the Romanian general staff. But, as a matter of fact, with depleted forces, the Romanian army did succeed in holding Falkenhayn for weeks in the foothills, after he had won the main divide. End of footnote. For the moment, she had a great chance. The enemy was hotly engaged by the north, and there was nothing in Transylvania but a few weak divisions. She had the initiative and the advantage of surprise. If she could once reach the line of the Middle Marrows, she would have won a strong strategical position, far better for defense than the line of the frontier, and she would have the good Austrian railways for her own use. Then set it purely as a defensive measure, it seemed wise to cut off the difficult western salient and win a shorter and easier line. Moreover, such a plan might have, also, a high offensive value. Romania at the moment believed with the rest of the world that Brusilov's advance had still far to go. She thought that presently Lechitsky would cross the Carpathians. If that happened, the presence of her troops on the enemy's flank might turn a retreat into a wholesale disaster. Alexiev proposed that Russian troops should be transferred to Transylvania, and that Romania's line of defense in the west should be in the foothills short of the main ranges. Romania refused the advice, largely because she feared that Russian temporary occupation of Transylvania might become permanent. On the other hand, she anticipated no danger from the side of the Dobruja. Surreal's offensive had been part of the bargain with the Allies, and even if it did not advance far on the road to Sofia, she believed that it would keep the three Bulgarian armies busily engaged. Further, at first she seems to have even hoped that Bulgaria would refrain from a declaration of war, a political miscalculation in the circumstances not altogether unnatural. In any case, if she had to choose between two dangers, the menace from Transylvania loomed far the greater. To the Western world, it seemed as if Romania, at the outset, embarked on a rash offensive. It would be truer to say that her generals, whatever may have been the case with their politicians, thought principally of the best defense. They thought about it too much, and therein lay the secret of her failure. Her plan was not conceived in the general interest of the whole alliance, but with regard chiefly to her own security. From the Allies' point of view, the occupation of Transylvania mattered little, but the cutting of the Ottoman railway would have struck deep at the roots of German power. Had Romania played the long game, she would have risked everything in the west and struck hard from the Dobruja at the German highway to the east. It is difficult to believe that she would not have succeeded, and the blow would have altered the whole course of the campaign in eastern Europe. For her, the bold path would also have been the path of safety. He that saveth his life shall lose it, is a maxim not only of religion, but of war. End of chapter 64, part 1
Section 25 of A History of the Great War, Volume 3. The Beleaguered Forest Continued, and the Great Sallies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of the Great War, Volume 3, by John Bakken. Chapter 64 Romania's campaign, August 27th to December 6th, 1916, Part 2. The breach with Austria found three Romanian armies waiting to cross the Transylvanian frontier. The first army, under General Kulser, was the left wing of the invasion, and its front of 120 miles extended from Usova to east of the Rutherham Pass. Obviously, half a dozen divisions could not operate continuously in such a front, so the advance fell into three groups, the left against the Ozozo Mahadia Railway, the central against Hatseg by way of the Balkan Pass, and the right through the Rothrum Pass against Hamastad. East of the First Army lay the Second Army, under General Avarescu, the ablest of Romanian generals, who had risen from the ranks to be chief of staff in the invasion of Bulgaria in 1913, Averescu's force extended as far north as the Ortiz Pass and was the main army of assault, whose object was the seizure of the central Maros Valley, assisted by the flanking forces on the south. North of Averescu lay the Army of the North, the Fourth Army, under General Prasan, whose right wing was in touch with Lechitsky's left in the Dorna Water region. The Third Army guarded the Danube and the Dobruja frontier. At the moment, the Austrian strength in Transylvania was small. Five divisions, under General Van Arndt van Strausenberg. Nor was their quality high, but they consisted partly of land there and partly of troops which had suffered severely in Brusilov's attack. The Romanians, strung out on a 400-mile frontier and advancing through passes separated, often by 40 miles of rocky mountain, were obviously in a precarious position against a strong enemy. Their hope of success was to break through the feeble resistance speedily and win their objective before the enemy could gather his supports. If Romania was to succeed, she must succeed at once, or with her poor communications and widely scattered units, she would find herself checked on a line where she could not abide. The Romanian armies were in motion on the evening of 27th August, and next day were pouring across the passes towards the frontier railway in the upper glens of the Maros and the Aluta. They moved past and found little opposition. In the Tomas Pass, a regiment drawn up in the Magyars of Transylvania offered some resistance, but was driven in with heavy losses. In the tall guys, a Czech regiment went over bodily to the invader. During that week, the bulletins posted up in Bucharest were cheerful reading. On 29th August, the town of Kedsti Varsahari, west of the Oytars Pass, was occupied, as well as Kronstadt, north of the Pradil, and Perseni, north of the Vulcan. This gave them most of the upper Aluda Valley and the lands held by the Saxon and Magyar immigrants. On 2nd September, on the extreme right, a column, descending from the Tongais Pass, occupied the town of Borsak and sent out cavalry patrols to get in touch with Lachitsky on the Bukovina front. On the 4th, the Romanians, advancing from the Rutherum Pass, were close upon the important town of Hermannstadt. On the same day, the advance from the right over the Bacchus Pass reached the frontier railway. By the ninth, from Toplitza southward, the whole frontier valley between the outer and inner walls of Transylvania was in Romanian hands. Next day, Hermannstadt was evacuated, and the enemy withdrew to the northern hills. The advance was slowest just north of the Vulcan Pass, where the defense fought hard for the vital junction of Hadzeg. But by 12th September, three-fourths of the distance had been covered by the invader. On the extreme left, a Romanian division had carried the Cerna line 
and entered Lord Silva. Within a fortnight from the declaration of war, the Saxon and Magyar people of southeastern Transylvania were in full flight westward. The invasion had penetrated in some places to a depth of 50 miles. All the passes, the strategic frontier railway, and most of the frontier towns had been occupied, and nearly a quarter of the country was in Romanian possession. It was a dazzling success, but it was very cold, which could not endure. The enemy had fallen back upon a shorter and safer line, and the real struggle had not begun. The Romanians, with their armies and groups far apart and often unable to communicate, were enmeshed in a difficult country of divergent valleys, with many strong positions to take before they reached the comparative security of the middle marrows. Moreover, the enemy was preparing a deadly counterstroke, though the invaders, with hardly an airplane to serve their needs, were ignorant of his preparations. As early as 29th July, a plan had been agreed upon for which Germany undertook to provide five infantry and two cavalry divisions. When Falkenhayn ceased to be chief of the general staff, the emperor had announced that he was destined presently to take up an important command. This command was the new Austro-German Ninth Army, even now assembling in the Lower Maros Valley. It was intended to strike hard at the left of the straggling Romanian front and open the passes leading to the Wallachian Plain. Another army under McKesson was being assembled south of the Danube to clear the Dobrogea of the enemy and be ready when Falkehain had stormed the passes to cross the river and join hands with him in an enveloping movement upon Bucharest. At first, Conrad von Herzendorf would have brought Mankessen directly across the Danube against the Romanian capital, but Falkenhayn insisted that the Dobrogea must first be won, and he was supported by Ludendorff and Hindenburg. It was a bold and subtle scheme, the true type of that offensive which is the best defense, and it was based upon a correct judgment of Romania's weakness and Russia's preoccupations. Its success was certain from the moment when the main forces of Romania were pulled across the Carpathians rather than over the Dobrogea frontier. The first move came from Mackesson, who was in the Balkans when Romania declared war, and during the four days which elapsed before Bulgaria followed suit, he had concentrated his fixed forces with unprecedented speed. He could count on three Bulgarian infantry divisions, two Bulgarian cavalry divisions, and the better part of a German corps, or two Turkish divisions were on their way to reinforce him. Above all, he disposed of a far greater weight of artillery than his opponents. The problem before him had the simplicity of an illustration to a staff lecture on strategy. The new frontier in the Dobrogea was 100 miles long, but the Dobrogea narrows as it runs northward, and it is only 30 miles wide, where the main line runs from the bridge of Chirkovoda to Costanza. Every mile he advanced, therefore, made his front shorter. Further, if he could cut off the Romanian bridgeheads at Tutakai and Silistria, he would get rid of any danger of a flank attack on Bulgaria across the Danube. He would advance with his flanks resting securely on the river and the sea. If he could win the Chernoboda Constanza line, he would be master of all the Dobrugia, and would cut off Romania from any connection with Russia by sea. Finally, the Dobrugia won. He would have a safe starting point for the passage of the Danube and the flanking movement against Bucharest. On 1st September, Bulgarian troops crossed the Dobrugia border, striking on the eastern flank against the railway which links Dobruj and Balchik. The Romanian frontier guards fell back, and on the 4th the enemy had Dobruj. Balchik, and Kavarna. This gave Mackensen a good strategic front on his right, and he proceeded to wheel his left against Turtikai and Silistria. Each of these places was held by an isolated Romanian division. Had Romania possessed an adequate air service, the perils of Mackensen's movement would have been discerned, 
and the divisions withdrawn, but only the German armies had eyes. Turfikai was little more than a large village and owed its importance solely to the ferry across the Danube between it and Oltenitsa, which stands on a tongue of hard ground between the marshes of the northern bank and is the starting point of a road to Bucharest. Since 1913, when it became a frontier post, it had been provided with extensive barracks and defended by forts and entrenchments. On 2nd September, two Bulgarian divisions advanced from the south against the forts, while a Bulgarian German force, with heavy guns, came down the river from the west by the Rochek Road. By the morning of the 5th, the place was invested, and that evening an attempt by the general commanding at Silistria to send supports was easily frustrated. Next day, the 6th, the garrison of Turdekai was compelled to surrender, and 100 guns in the better part of two infantry divisions fell into Mackenzie's hands. It was a serious disaster for Romania to suffer on the 10th day of her campaign. The detachment of Silistria, warned by the fate of Turdekai, did not linger. The place was evacuated, and on 9th September was occupied by the Bulgarians. But Kensin's problem was now to bring up his center to the level of his left wing, and to form a front on the line Silistria, Drobich, Kavarna. This was presently accomplished, and once more he swung forward his left, till on the 11th he held the front Karakuyo, Alexander Karagat. He had the Romanian resistance stiffened, but the German general pressed on, till, on the 16th, he was in contact with the main Romanian position a dozen miles south of the Chernavoda Railway, running from Brasova on the Danube to Tuzla on the Black Sea. Romania, engrossed in her Carpathian advance, had been forced to turn her attention to a menace which he had ruled out as unlikely. She saw her gains of 1913 disappearing, and her communications with their main seaport in jeopardy. The measures she took to meet the crisis showed her bewilderment. Three divisions were hurried eastward from the Transylvanian front, and Aravescu was recalled from the command of the Second Army to take charge of the Army of the Danube. The Russian general, Zyantrovsky, was placed in command of the whole defense and the Russian contingent present included a division composed of southern Slavs taken prisoner by Russia, who had asked to be led against the enemies of their race. The Russo-Romanian army in the Dobruja was now concentrated, not so much by any design of its commander, as because one of its outlying divisions had been destroyed and two more driven back upon it. The opposing forces were approximately equal in numbers, and the Romanians were fighting on interior lines, with slightly the better communications behind them. This advantage, however, such as it was, was more than neutralized by the fact that Mackenzie had many more guns and a far greater munitionment. For the moment, the defense proved the stronger. The rolling barons of the Dobruja presented no obstacle to movement, so long as the weather was dry and Mackenzie was in a hurry to win his objective before the weather broke. On 16th September, he struck with his left, and for four days there was bitter fighting, during which Zyantrovsky held his ground. On the 20th, the latter received reinforcements and opened a counteroffensive against the enemies right in the neighborhood of Toprasari, east of the Dobridge Majidia Railway. By the 23rd, Mackenzie was forced back at least ten miles behind the line which he had held on 14th September. It was a fine achievement, and the heroic Southern Slav division played no small part in it. It is clear that Mackenzie's initial supply of shells had run short, and that in ordinary infantry fighting, his men were not the superiors of the defending force. But he had the means to procure a further stock, and his opponents had none. Had Zyantrovsky had reserves to fling in at the critical moment, it is possible that he might have turned the retreat into a rout, pushed the enemy beyond the Dobruja border, and carried an offensive far into Bulgaria. 
but his men were weary, and he had no supports. He was compelled to wait on Mackenzie's next move, in the painful knowledge that though his enemy had failed as yet to attain his main objective, he had forced Romania to conform to his strategy, had nullified two avenues of communication for a Gibraltar campaign, and had compelled at a critical moment the weakening of the Transylvanian front. For in Transylvania the skies were already darkening. The two northern armies, indeed, still continued to progress after the middle of September. Persons' army advanced from the glen of the Upper Maros over the Gurgani Mountains and approached the Upper Kokai Valley with its important railway line. The second army, now under General Kranisienu, crossed the Geisterwald and on the 16th took the historic town of Fogaraz on the Aluda. But the first army engaged around Hermannstadt and in the Stria Valley on the way to Hadzeg was already feeling the first effect of Falkenhayn's new concentration. It was commonly supposed in the West that the Teutonic League, being a crochet on the Somme and in Galicia, would have no surplus troops for a Romanian expedition, what Hindenburg did was precisely what he had already begun to do in the West. He took infantry regiments from four regiment divisions and battalions from four battalion regiments. His main trust, now as ever, was in artillery, and on all the fronts, while he kept the guns up to strength, he provided a smaller complement of men. For Romania, he relied mainly on his guns, the service in which his opponents were weakest, but he also provided Falkenhayn with some admirable infantry units. The northern sector, facing the Romanian 4th Army, was taken over by the right wing of the Austrian 7th Army, and the Romanian 1st and 2nd Armies were faced by the Austrian 1st Army, under Van Arts, and Falkenhayn's new 9th Army. The latter had with it the Alpine Corps, which had hitherto been with the imperial crown prince at Verdun, men drawn from the Bavarian highlands and familiar with every branch of mountain fighting. General Koanda, commanding that part of the first Romanian army, which was operating west of the Vulcan Pass, was getting dangerously near to Hatzeg and the main line from the Austrian bases, so on him fell the first brunt of the German counterattack. He was now astride the Strio Valley, and on 15th September, he encountered a German force under the Bavarian general, von Stabs. Koanda, after a gallant fight, made a skillful retirement. The Hatzik range of mountains lay between him and the frontier, and the railway by which he retreated circled round the eastern end of the range, and then turned south to the Vulcan Pass. Pivoting upon his left, he resisted the effort of von Stabs to outflank him in the Atzig Mountains and swung his front round parallel to the frontier. On the 20th, he evacuated Protocena, and by the 22nd, his right was back at the Vulcan Pass. That night, he counterattacked and took many prisoners, while his left threatened to cut the German railway communications. Stabs was forced back to a position astride the Struyo Valley, at Ersera, and had his gains of the week were lost. Koanda maintained his ground till the disastrous events farther east compelled him to fall back through the Vulcan into Wallachia. Falkenhayn's main thrust was delivered against the section of the First Army, known as the Aluda Group, which at the moment held a line from Parambaco in the Aluda Valley by the heights north of Hermannstadt to Orlog in the tributary valley of the Sibu. This, the right of the first army, was separated by a space of some fifteen miles from the left of the second army near Forstgras. Ten miles of rough mountain lay between it and the frontier range. It had no supports in flank, and it had no rear guard to speak of at the Rotherham Pass. The position was fated to be turned, and Falkenhayn grasped the opportunity. He disposed his forces in three columns. The western, consisting of the Bavarian Alpine Corps, was directed to cross the intervening hills, 
and cut the line of retreat through the Rutherum Pass, the eastern to march through the gap between the first and second armies, and the central to attack in front the line Olat Porumbaku. The Bavarian Jaegers, under General Kraut von Demensingen, started on the 72nd, and crossing ridges 5,000 feet high, reached the southern base of Mount Kerala on the night of the 23rd. After that, their path became difficult, and they had several encounters with Romanian pickets. But by the 26th, they were close to the Rotherham Pass. That day, they attacked the pass on both its ends and the adjoining peaks and cut the railway line from Hermannstadt to Wallachia. They took large quantities of material on its way to the Romanian forces, and on a rock at the Romanian end of the pass, clamped great letters of iron commemorating their success. It was an operation which, for its speed and secrecy, well deserved the grandiose memorial. And the rest of Volkenheim's scheme proceeded with the precision of the part, and trusted to the Bavarians. The Aluda group must have suffered complete destruction. His left succeeded in cutting any communication with the Second Army by forcing the passage of the Aluda east of Porumbaku, but it failed to execute a true flanking movement. On the 26th, the day the Rutherum Pass fell, the main German force opened a furious bombardment on the Romanian front at Hermannstadt. The Romanians were now aware of their imminent danger, and they met the crisis in the spirit of soldiers. Since the Rotherham Pass was closed to them, they must retreat southeastward and cross the frontier range by goat pass and difficult saddles. To cover such a retreat, the rear guards offered a stout resistance, and every village was the scene of bitter fighting. Next day, their main force was at Talmish, and during the following week, they fought their way back over the border crest. The second army did what it could by an advance west to Porumbaku, and a contingent from Wallachia kept the Bavarians busy in the Rotherham Pass. The retiring troops lost heavily, but the amazing thing is that their losses were not greater. The Germans claimed no more than 3,000 prisoners and 13 guns, and the main booty was laden wagons and rolling stock intercepted on the Hermannstadt Railway. It was faulty general ship, which led to the surprise of 26 September, but both leaders and men showed at their best in their efforts to retrieve the disaster. Hermannstadt was an undeniable defeat, but it was never a rout, and the retreat over the range will rank as one of the most honorable achievements in the story of Romanian arms. The Falconane had won his end. He was now free to turn eastward against the flank of the Second Army. Crania Suno was pushing towards Schausburg, in spite of the misfortunes of his western neighbors, and the fourth army was moving down the valley of the great Kokel towards the same objective. These operations were admirably conducted, and had they taken place at the beginning of September, instead of at its close, the line of the central morrows might have been won. On 3rd October, the position occupied was astride the valleys of the two Kokels, and within a dozen miles of both Schausburg, and Maros Vasahili. It was the high water mark of Romanian success in Transylvania, for on 4th October, Balkanhain's sweep to the east had begun, and Folgaras was evacuated. The pressure proved irresistible, and the 2nd and 4th armies began to fall back on divergent lines to the frontier, the former towards Torsburg and Brusula Passes, the latter towards the Gaimis and the Utahs. On 6th October, the Bucharest official reports for the first time abandoned their tone of confidence and announced that, in the south of Transylvania, the Romanian army is retiring before superior forces. The retirement was about to become universal. The tide had turned. The invasion had ended in failure, and everywhere, except in the extreme north, Romania was being forced back to defend her frontier passes. South of the Rotherham, indeed, the campaign was already being fought on Romanian soil. End of chapter 64, part 2
Section 26 of A History of the Great War, Volume 3. The Beleaguered Forest, Continued, and the Great Sallies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of the Great War, Volume 3, by John Buchan. Chapter 64. Romania's Campaign. August 27th to December 6th, 1916. Part 3. 2. The closing stages of Brusilov's attack in the north had so vital an influence on the Romanian campaign that they must be most logically grouped with it. Stanislav fell on 10th August, and by the 15th, Bothmer's army had drawn back towards the Sloda Lipa. The first two phases of Brusilov's advance had been crowned by a brilliant success. The Russian offensive had, indeed, attained its main object, since two Austrian armies had been shattered, over 350,000 prisoners taken, and little short of a million men put out of action. There remained six weeks of good campaigning weather in which to complete the work, begun on the 4th of June, by the taking of some enemy key point like Covell or Lemberg. The past two months seemed to warrant such hopes, and the entry of Romania into the war promised a grave distraction for Hindenburg on his southern flank. But Germany had not been slow to perceive and prepare against the danger. The whole of the eastern commands had been transformed. The Archduke Charles took formal charge of the forces against Romania, and his former group passed to Bohem Ermoli, the supreme direction of all troops north of the Carpathians being vested in German headquarters. The de facto German control, which had existed since the first day of war, was now officially proclaimed and extended to the smallest details. The Austrian regiments were moved about like pawns on a chessboard, without regard to the wishes of their normal commanders. They did not complain but the Prussian handling was efficient, and that of their own leaders had been chaotic. Now, at any rate, they were decently fed, and their transport well organized, but they perceived that they were regarded by their new masters as mere cannon fodder, and their love did not increase for their allies. We are beasts to be sent to slaughter, wrote one Austrian officer. When it is necessary to attack, we go in front. When enough of us are killed, the Germans advance under cover of our dead. But till the moment of need arrived, the cannon fodder was well cared for. The Magyar regiments were for the most part brought southward to the Transylvanian front, where they would be defending Hungarian territory from invasion. Everywhere along the depleted Austrian line, German troops were introduced, and the German commanders, even when they had only divisional rank, became the true directors of operations. For the most part, Austrians were left in charge of the corps, and from the prepet marshes southward, all the army commanders, with the exception of Bothmer, were Austrians. But both corps and army had ceased to be important units. The true field units were now the divisions, and we find, as on the western front, that groups of divisions tended to replace the old corps, and groups of armies, the old armies. Almost every group commander was a German, and it was with Lenzinget, Bothmer, and Falkenhayn that there lay the direction of the eastern campaigns. Brusilov's main objective in August was twofold, to push towards Lemberg, and to fling his left wing beyond the Carpathians, so as to keep touch with the right of the now eminent Romanian advance. This dual aim meant a dislocation of his offensive front, for there could be no strategic relation between the Carpathian campaign and that of the North Dniester. Accordingly, we find Lachiski's Ninth Army definitely assigned to the Carpathian area, and given a southwest alignment, while Cherbachev extended his left across the river and took over the whole Dniester front. The battleground for Russia had become two self-contained terrains, where the forces in one could render no resistance to those in the other. 
Had Luchitsky's aim been merely to form a defensive flank, it would have been different, but he had a heavy offensive duty laid upon him. It is in this inevitable divergence of purpose that we must look for the cause of the check which Brusilov's advance was presently to suffer. Russia was approaching the limits of her accumulation of reserves and munitions, and could not sustain at the old pitch. Two campaigns, conducted in two wholly distinct areas. If Brusilov had been able to concentrate his main energies on the movement towards Lemberg, he might well have succeeded. If he had remained idle on the Zloto Lippa and put all his force into the Carpathian attack, he might have turned the enemy flank in Transylvania and frustrated Falkenhayn's march on Bucharest. But in the middle of August, the situation was still too obscure to allow Alexiev to forecast the true center of gravity, and Cherbachev was committed to the advance on Holitz before the importance of the Carpathian flank had revealed itself. We left the army of Bothma with the main feeders on his right wing cut by Luchitsky, and with Cherbachev across the Zlata Slipa, north of Nisanov and so threatening to turn its flank. Brusilov's new position north of the Dniester was now well established. His right wing on the stalkered, and his hold on Brody safeguarded his flanks in Volhynia, while in the south he had the Dniester itself to cover his swing towards Lemberg. He had three railways along which to advance, that from Tarnopol, by Zoborov and Krasny, and by Brzezny, and that by Halitz all three converging on the Galician capital. It was his aim to strike at Halitz and Brezhny, while, at the same time, the army of Sakharov pushed southwestward from Volhynia against the northern side of Bothmer's salient. The immediate key point was Halitz, the importance of which was due to a number of quite different reasons. The town stood on the right bank of the Dniester, commanding the chief road bridge in that neighborhood, the Stanislaw Glenberg Railway crossed the river at Jezepol, a few miles farther down. If Halitz fell, then the southernmost of the lines running east from Lemberg were lost for the purpose of Bothmer's retirement, and, moreover, the valuable lateral line up of the valley of the Nazavelka, which be rendered useless. Again, the westernmost of the river ravines running south to the Nister was that of the Nila Nippa. The loss of Halitz meant that this, the last strong defensive position before Lemberg was reached, would be turned on its right flank. Finally, Halitz was an important depot where large stores had been accumulated, stores which could not be easily moved in the disorganization of a general retreat. If Lemberg was to be saved, it was clear that Halitz must stand. Under Cherbachev's pressure, Bothma fell back from the strip towards the Zlata Lippa, twenty miles to the west. His position was curious, for while his center and left were on a straight line, his right was bent sharply back, since the Russians, assisted by Lechitsky's advance south of the river, had crossed the Kura Pits by 8th August and were over the slaughter lip close to its junction with the Mista by 11th August. On the 13th, they had taken Mirianopol, some ten miles from Halitz itself. Elsewhere, Bothma's retirement was more leisurely. The Russian right was at Senyov on the 13th, and the center not far from Zavalov. They had marched fast so long as their route lay over the treeless plateau, just west of the stripper, but the country became more formidable as they approached the broken hills and the forests around the Zlata Lippa. Moreover, Bothma had fallen back upon a prepared position and had received large reinforcements for its defense. By 20th August, when his retreat had definitely halted, Bothma's fifty-mile front lay from south to Soparov, in the north to the Dniester east of Halitz. On his left across the Tarnopol Krasny Railway lay the right wing of Bowen Ermoli's Austrian Second Army. Bothmer lay 
from Coniutri along the river, Zeni Afka, to the Zlata Lipa, at the important junction of Portatori, a line of marshy valleys supported by the hills, half crag, half forest, which protected Brzezeni on the east. Thence he continued down the broad, swampy vale of the Zlata Lipa to Zavalov, where his position was on the hills on the eastern bank, with Turbachev in close contact. South of Zavalov, the German-Austrian wing bent back at a sharp angle to form a defensive flank with the Dniester. The south of that, the Slaughter Lippa line had gone. The front in this area roughly followed the wooded hills south of the zavalov hulitz Highway and reached the Dniester a little west of Miriam Pole. Chervichev's great effort began on Tuesday, 29th August. He struck first against Bothnia's right center at Zavalov, and by the evening had pushed it off the hills east of the slaughter Lepa, and forced it across the river. Next day the Russian left kept him to action towards the Dniester, and for four days the battle raged on a fifteen-mile front from Nasov to Miriam Pole. On Sunday, 3rd September, the enemy's resistance broke. Jezepol, with its railway bridge, fell to the Russian extreme left, and there was desperate fighting among the wooded hills south of the Halitz Zavalov High Road. Late in the day, Bothmer's defensive flank was pierced, with the result that the whole of his right and right center had to retreat in some confusion. The Russian cavalry was sent in, and over 4,000 prisoners were taken. Next day, 4th September, the Russian center forced the passage of the slaughter Lippa, routing a Turkish division at Bozikov, while in the south of the railway between Jezepol and Halitz was taken, and the banks of the Nila Lippa reached. Bothra had now a singular line. He still possessed the town of Halitz, but not the station on the north bank of the Dniester. Thence his friend followed the valley of the Narachovka to Lipitsa Dolma and then struck almost to east across wooded hills to the Zlata Lippa. North of that it followed the valley of the Zeniovka to Zoborov and Plukov. The Russian drive towards Halitz had thus made a Brzeni, a fairly pronounced salient, a sub-salient, so to speak, or under feature of the greater salient formed by Sakharov's possession of Brody and Chervikov's position outside Halitz. The situation was critical, and reinforcements were hurried up to Bothmer's front. He got back what was left to the Third Guard Division and two other German divisions from the Somme, while his Austrian troops were also added to, so that presently his army was stronger than it had ever been since its creation. Seven German divisions and fragments of two others, three and a half Austrian and two Turkish, were over. These divisions had mostly been brought up to strength, so that the fifty miles of front were held with not less than a quarter of a million men, a density familiar in the West, but novel in the looser fighting of the eastern battleground. Meantime, Cherbuchev's right had begun a struggle for Brzezny. On Friday, 1st September, he attacked on the east bank the Zenyovka, some half-dozen miles from Brzezny and the battle extended south past the junction of Portatori. Between the Zeniovka and the Zlata Lippa stood a ridge called Lysonia, which dominated Brzezny. On 2nd September, the Russian guns bombarded the enemy position on this height and played havoc with the crumbling outcrops of rock which lined the crest like a South African crance. Next day, the infantry attacked across the Zeniovka, and carried the ridges which the artillery had rendered untenable. For a moment it looked as if Brzezny must fall, but the place was too vital for the Germans to relinquish it, and a counterattack by fresh Bavarian troops early on the morning of 4th September won back most of the Lysonia crest. The Russians remained west of the Zeniovka, but they no longer held the high ground. In the four days' fighting, they had taken nearly 3,000 prisoners. Then, during the rest of September, the battle stagnated. The Portatori fell into Russian hands. It was a clear stalemate, 
Both sides were so evenly matched that progress was permitted to neither. On 5th September, Cherbuchev made a bold bid for Halitz. He strengthened his hold on the east bank of the Nella Lipa and the adjacent northern shore of the Niester. Bothmer's right wing fell back, blowing up the Halitz Bridge, and the town itself was cleared of military stores and the civil population evacuated. But no progress was possible in this direction until the German center on the Navajoka was broken. On 7th September, Chervichev had crossed the Narajov south of Lipnitsa Dolna, winning a height on the West Bank. His position there now formed a sharp salient, which was the endeavor of the Russians to enlarge and the Germans to destroy. All through September and well into October, the struggle continued on the line of this little river, and the Russian attack, though gallantly sustained, was unable to make any real progress. The third stage of Brusilov's offensive perished in the early days of October from sheer inanition. It had no longer the weight of artillery and trained reserves to succeed. The failure of the Podolian campaign made fruitless Sakharov's supplementary thrust from Bohemia. It was directed southwest from the Sovyetka Bluedorf line on a front of some six miles in a district of forests and marshy valleys. Ground was gained in the first fight on 1st September and in the second main action of 20th September. But Cherbuchev's check made his success difficulty and deprived his strategic value even such advance as was made. October saw the Volhynian terrain reduced to the stagnation of the Hulitz front. There remains the final section of this third phase of Brusilov's offensive, the Carpathians, where Lichitsky faced the Austrian 3rd and 7th armies. The entry of Romania gave this area a very real importance, but Russia, deeply involved by the north, was unable, as we have seen, to increase her forces there to the strength which the strategic position demanded. On 15th August, the crest of the Jabonitsa Pass was won, and by the 17th, the Russians were holding part of Mount Kapul and the Kirababa Pass. At the southern apex of the Bukovina, the accession of Romania on 27th August gave Lechitsky a new orientation, and henceforward his main efforts were directed against the passes of the eastern Carpathians in order to cooperate with his allies. His front extended for nearly 100 miles from north of the Chaplinitsa to Dorna Watra. At first, this mountain warfare went well. Between 30th August and 6th September, the Chitsky reported the capture of 15 officers, 1,889 other ranks, two mountain guns, and 26 machine guns. On Monday, 11th September, his left in the Dorna Water region got into touch with the Romanian right. On that day, too, Mount Capel was carried in its entirety a peak 5,000 feet high above the Kurlababa Pass, and nearly a 1,000 prisoners were taken. During these days, the Romanians were pouring into Transylvania, and about the 22nd had reached the farthest limit of their advance. The Chitsky formed their defensive flank, but he could do little more, for about the middle of September the snow began to fall and crippled his movements among the high peaks and he had never that superiority in men and guns, which would have allowed him to win the western depagement of the passes and drive down on the left rear of the Austrian defense in Transylvania. When the tide of Romania invasion turned, and Falkenhayn began his sweep across the Parthians, Russia's position in the theater of her summer triumphs, was safe against attacks, did not promise any further success in the near future. Jervichev was held at Hilitz on the Narajovka and opposite Brzezny, and the offensive in Volhynia had come to nothing. Lachitsky had captured various outlying parts of the mountain barrier between Hungary and the Bukovina, but he had not broken the defense. Germany's immense effort had for the moment closed the gaps in what Austrian front, which in July had seemed to be crumbling. 
to stabilize their line, certain changes were made in the Russian dispositions. A new special army, consisting mainly of the Guard Corps, was formed under Gorko and placed on Brusilov's right wing. An eighth army was moved southward between the 7th and the 9th. Russia entered upon the winter with very different prospects from those which had faced her a year before. Then she lay weary at the end of her great retreat. Now she had behind her a summer of successes, which, if they had cost her a million men, had yet inflicted irreparable losses upon her enemies, and had proved conclusively that, given anything like a fair munitionment, she could break the front of the invader. The grandiose schemes proclaimed a year before the capture of Petrograd and Kiev and Odessa had faded out of the air. She was secure on her front and seemed to need only a period of recuperation during which she could complete the training of her reserves and accumulate supplies of shells in order to resume her deadly offensive. As before, her problem centered in munitions. There was still no easy way of access for these from her western allies. Archangel was still the neck of the bottle, though the new Merman line from the ice report of Alexandrovsk was in sight of completion, and she had enormously increased her domestic production. But her moral gains were conspicuous, and her troops had won confidence in themselves and their commanders. Their resolution on the defensive was now supplemented by that assurance of prowess in attack which is necessary to produce the true fighting edge. There were indeed two dark spots in her outlook. The success of the summer had weakened that political unanimity which had characterized the dark days of the retreat. Reactionary elements appeared in the ministerial appointments and the Duma, and the government drew apart. The omens in Russian internal politics in the autumn of 1916 were not propitious for a harmonious winter. In the second place, it was clear that Germany would struggle desperately to put Romania out of action and to make Hershey at the fate of Serbia and Belgium. Succor could come only from Russia, for the Allies at Salonika were too weak and too far away to affect the situation. In that event, Ali Aksev might find himself involved in a defensive campaign in Wallachia and Moldavia, a campaign which lay outside his plans, and would spend in a barren terrain the strength which he wished to reserve for the spring advance. Germany might follow on the Eastern Front the policy which in the spring of 1916 she had followed in the West, and the line of the Romanian Sarep might play the part of Verdun. End of chapter 64, part 3. Section 27 of A History of the Great War, Volume 3. The Beleaguered Forest Continued, and the Great Sallies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of the Great War, Volume 3, by John Buchan. Chapter 64. Romania's Campaign, August 27th to December 6, 1916, Part 4. 3. The check to Brusilov's advance, more especially the unsuccess of his left wing, was soon to be followed by disastrous consequences to the Romanian offensive. If Bothmer and Kurthbog could hold their opponents among the Nister canyons in the Carpathian defiles. The way was clear for Falkenhayn to force the weak armies of the invader back over the mountains and to use the awkward strategic position of the country for a crushing counterattack. We have seen that the situation on 3rd October might be regarded as the high-water mark of Romania's success. Thereafter, the decline began like the thaw of a snowfield in spring, a slow shrinkage and declension which grew quicker as it neared the day of cataclysm. At first, Falcon Haynes' counter-thrust was well parried, as the enemy, pushed against the left flank of the Second Army, Crane Sienu, fell back from Fort Goras, 
on 4th October, his line of retreat being towards Kronstadt and the Dordsburg, Perdil, and Dozu passes. The 4th Army must inevitably lose connection with the 2nd, for its route of retirement was the eastern passes leading into Moldavia. On the night of 5th October, the Geisterwald was lost, and the left wing of Krenius Hilno's army was forced back to the frontier mountains. On the 7th, the enemy was in Kronstadt, though the place was not finally evacuated without some stubborn street fighting by the Romanian rear guards. Three days later, the Romanian 2nd Army was everywhere, back at the Transylvania gates of the passes. Prison's 4th Army, though much less hardly pressed, was compelled to conform and on the same day stood close to the frontier on the upper streams of the Maros and the Aluta. The great adventure was over, and Romania was now forced to a hopeless defense. She had taken over 15,000 prisoners during her six weeks' attack, but beyond that it gained nothing, while the strength of her half-trained soldiery had been gravely tried by the Transylvanian raid. Bad as her intelligence system was, she had by this time some inkling of the strength and of the intentions of the enemy, and she braced herself resolutely to meet them. Ever rescue was recalled from the Dobruja, and placed again at the head of the Second Army, which had imposed upon it the most critical part of the frontier defense. General Kulser, commanding the First Army, was replaced by General Dragolina, who had distinguished himself in the Orsovo section. Moreover, General Berthelet had arrived in charge of a French military mission to supply the Romanian general staff with advice based on a long understanding of German methods in war. There could be no hesitation in Falkenhayn's mind about the exact nature of the task before him. He had to drive his enemies back to their borders and regain control of the frontier railways. That done, he would be on the inside of a curve of 300 miles with a dozen passes to choose from, and able to strengthen rapidly his troops at every point. While his opponents with slender forces and no good communications for a sudden concentration would have to watch all the inlets and string their armies along the outer line of the Transylvanian salient. Moreover, there was Mackensen in the Dobruja, held tight for the moment, but likely, as the stress in the West increased, to free himself from his difficulties and win a line which he could hold lightly, thereby releasing his main troops to cross the Danube and take Romania in flank. Once Romania had failed to occupy the central Maros Valley and Falkenhayn's Ninth Army had taken the field, it was obvious that the Austro-Germans had all the cards in their hands. The only drawback lay in the weather. Snow had begun to fall in the Carpathians, before the end of September, and it was possible that winter in the mountains might interfere with the transit of the great guns and their full munition meant. What was to be done must be done quickly. To win a complete victory at the earliest possible moment, it was necessary to force the passes in the center of the arc of frontier. The passes, that is to say, between the Torsberg and the Brazo. If that had been achieved, and the railway junctions of Ploesti and Pesu seized, Romania would have been split in two. Wallachia would have been separated from Moldavia, and the Romanian First Army, and a large part of the Second, would have been cut off. It would have given Falkenhayn the great oil region before it could be destroyed, and the Wallachian harvest before there was time to remove it. He therefore began by driving hard, against the passes south of Kronstadt, while Mackensen supported him by an advance in the Tobruja. The Romanian staff were alive to the danger. They successfully held the eastern outlets of the central passes, and when the line gave way, it was farther west, where the consequences, serious as they were, proved less disastrous than those which would have followed upon an early debauchment from the Torsburg and the Predeal passes. But gallant as the defense showed itself, it was doomed from the start. It might avert the worst results, but it could do no more than play for time. For a strong concentration, 
if it held the central passes, involved the weakening of, or at any rate the inability to reinforce, the defense in northwestern Wallachia. The gates into Romania were opened when, towards the close of September, her troops came to a standstill far beyond her borders before they had reached the only objective that spells security. We have seen that south of Kronstadt, three chief passes, the Torsberg, Predil, and Basu, and two lesser ones, the Alshans and Bratosia, open into the Wallachian foothills. These passes are narrow defiles, and on the Wallachian side it is many miles before the glens of the rivers, bounded by steep, pine-clad hills, open out into the plains. For obvious reasons, it was necessary for the Romanians to fight as near as possible to their railheads, so they did not attempt to stand on the main divide, but had their principal defensive positions nearer the southern debauchments. With the loss of many prisoners and a few guns, by the middle of October, they had been forced back through most of the passes. The first blow was delivered at the Torsberg. By 14th October, the defense was on the main road from Kronstadt to Kampelong, six miles inside the frontier. Here the enemy, failing to force the road by a frontal attack, devoted himself to outflanking movements by the subsidiary valley of the Dambo Pizza on the east and Lareshti on the west. He made no progress, and the Romanians stood firm in front of Campalon, on the line Lareshti Dragoslavili. Farther east, the railway pass of the Predil was the scene of severe fighting. The frontier ridge was won by Falkenhayn as early as 14th October, and the border town of Predil was destroyed by shell fire. It fell on 25th October, and fighting for every mile, the Romanians fell back through the wood glens towards the summer resort of Cyania. In this section, the defense was especially brilliant, and by the first days of November, the enemy, though he had carried the main range in some of the lateral foothills, had not advanced more than four miles inside the frontier. Meantime, Prisan and the Fourth Army were holding with equal resolution to the gates of Moldavia. He had been compelled to divide his forces into two detachments, one watching the Bigas and Tolgai's passes and the routes to the upper Petritza Valley, and the other holding the railway pass of Gaiens and the subsidiary Oats and Ortos passes, which gave access to Ochna. The first assaults failed to carry the last-named passes, but by 17th October the enemy was through the Gaiems, and some seven miles inside the frontier, down the Trotus Valley. There he was held and driven back, and by the first days of November had made no headway in this section. By the north, Prasan's right wing was no less successful. It held the frontier between the Tolgais and the Bigas, till it was relieved in early November, by an extension southward of Lachetsky's left. From that date, the Romanian front was bounded by the Gaiams Pass, and the defense of northwest Moldavia was handed over to that stubborn Russian corps, which had been the spearhead of Lachetsky in the summer campaign in the Bukovina. Its counterattack drove the enemy back across the Tolgais, and in this section regained the initiative. Meantime, a serious situation had begun to develop in the Dobruja. We have seen that by 24 September, Mackensen's advance had been checked, and he had been driven south some 15 miles from the line Rostova tutsla There, for nearly a month, little happened. At one or two points, the Romanians pushed the enemy farther back and took prisoners, and there was an attempt by each side to cross the Danube. The German effort was made on 30th September at Korobia, a port and railhead on the Romanian bank of the Danube, some miles west of the point where the Aluta enters the main stream. The port was bombarded and a few small craft sunk, but the landing came to nothing. The Romanian attempt next day was more ambitious. It took place at Rehova, a little east of Rostock, where... There is an island on the north side of the river. Some fifteen battalions crossed, 
too large a force for a mere reconnaissance, and occupied several villages and a tract of land, some ten miles wide and four deep. The attacking force was weak in artillery, and, being assailed on both flanks, it was driven back across the river with considerable loss. By the middle of October, the pressure on the western frontier precluded all hopes of a Russo-Romanian offensive in the Dobroja. But Mackensen had not been idle. He had received large reinforcements of guns and munitions, and had got two new divisions from Turkey and one from Germany. On 19th October, after a heavy preliminary bombardment, he resumed the offensive, especially against the Romanian left. Tutsla fell next day, and on the 21st, the central position, a Toprasari was evacuated, while Mackensen's right pushed within six miles of Costanza. On the railway, the Romanian right center was driven back from Copadinu, and before night fell, the turn of road of Costanza Railway had been cut some twenty miles from the coast. Constanza, bombarded on flank and front, could not be held. On the 22nd, its evacuation began and its stores of oil and wheat were burned. Under cover of the fire of a Russian flotilla in the Black Sea, the Romanian troops withdrew, and in a wild rainstorm, Bulgarian cavalry entered the place on the 23rd. They found little booty, except on hundreds of empty railway trucks and a few locomotives. But Romania had lost her principal seaport and one of her main lines of communication with her Russian ally. Sakharov, formerly in command of the Russian 11th Army, had arrived to take charge of the defense, but the Russian divisions were poor in discipline and fighting quality. In a stern order to his troops, he warned them that they had been sent to conquer, or at any rate to fight, and not to see who could run the fastest. Events now moved swiftly, for against the fire of Mackensen's guns, Sakharov's ill-supplied army could make no stand. On the 23rd, Medjidia fell, the station on the line halfway between Chernovoda and Costanza, while the Romanian right was driven back from Rushova. The great bridge was doomed. Constructed twenty years before by a French company, it was more than one thousand yards long, built of steel on stone piers, and carried at a height of one hundred feet above the river. The Romanian bank was low-lying, a wide stretch of swamp and lagoon, and over the bad ground the railway was carried by ten miles of causeway and viaduct. The importance of the spot was not as a crossing place, for such a crossing could be opposed by a small force on the hard ground above Fetishti, on the northern shore, beyond the marsh belt, and the invaders would have to advance by a long, open defile exposed for miles to gunfire. Mackensen had several better crossings higher up the river, and his attack on the bridge was only the last step in taking possession of the Costanza Railway. Once he had secured it and driven Sakharov northwards into bad country with no railway communications, he could afford to entrench himself on the ground he had won and prepare to invade Romania across the Danube so soon as Falkenhayn was through the mountains. On the 25th, the small Romanian force which held the bridge retired across it and blew up one of the spans. On that day, the Bulgarians entered the town a churn of Oda. On the 26th, Sakharov was 24 miles north of the railway, and by the 29th, he was on the line ostrov Babadok. Here the pursuit was stayed, and presently the counteroffensive began, but the center of gravity was now in the west, where the Romanian defense of the hills was beginning to crumble. We left Falkenhayn, held at the debauchments of the central passes, the winter snows had begun, and it looked as if he had missed his stroke. But farther west, the Romanian First Army, holding the Rutherum and the Vulcan Passes, was less fortunate than ever rescue, and the troops of the Second. From the Rutherum Pass, the Aluda flows for some thirty miles in a narrow gorge, accompanied by a road and a railway, a gorge from its nature impregnable to direct assault. 
The southern end is the village of Rimnik Velsia, and fifteen miles east of the place is the town of Kurdia de Agash, the terminus of one of the two railways which ran from Piteshki to the hills. If Kurtia de Argos could be won by way of the Aloda and camp along, by way of the Torsberg, the path would be prepared for the capture of Piteshti, the most important strategic point in Wallachia. Falkenhayn, therefore, aimed at Piteshki by a converging attack through the Torsberg and the Rotherham. The Bavarian Alpine Corps, as we have seen, secured the southern end of the Rotherham on 26 September. During early October, that force prepared for the next step, and on 15th October began its advance in three columns. On the east, a brigade was to cross the high Moscovo Pass and descend the glen of the Topologo against Salatruco. In the center, the Bavarians followed the road which runs along the ridge between the Topologo and the Aluta. On the west, a brigade was to take the high ground of Pietru Asa and the Beverita Mountain towards the tributary glen of the Lotru. From the start, all went ill. The eastern force by 18th October had reached the hills directly north of Salatruco when the Romanians closed in on its flanks from the Aluda and Argesh valleys and, but for a heavy snowstorm, would have wholly destroyed it. So, too, the Western Brigade was caught on the Pietruasa Massif and flung back with heavy losses. The disasters to the wings compelled Kraft von Delmensingen to hold up the attack of his Bavarian center. For a week there was a respite, and then at the close of October the offensive was renewed. On the 28th, a fresh German division won positions on the hills between the Aluda and the Topologu. By this time, the Aluda group of the Romanian First Army had been reinforced by some of Prisant's troops from the Fourth Army, released by the extension of Lechitsky's front. But the enemy was also strengthened, and since his campaign in the Torsberg and Predial passes was checked, and he was about to make his main effort through the Vulcan Pass, it was necessary to pin down the Aluda group to a defense which would preclude it from sending reinforcements westward. By 1st November, the Germans had reached the Teteshti Valley, which enters that of the Aluda from the east. A week later, they had mastered the heights on both sides of the Topolugu and the Massif of Gosia, which commands the mouth of the Low True Glen. By this time, events south of the Vulcan had compelled the Romanians to send thither every man they could spare, and the Aluda group, thus weakened, was forced to fall back. By the middle of November, the Germans had won the Aluda Valley, as far as Kalaman Eshti, and the Topologo Valley as far as Switzi, and controlled the road which linked up the two places. They were only ten miles from the vital railhead of Kurtia de Argesh. We now come to the section where the defense finally broke. The Vulcan Pass, through which ran the road down the Geo Valley to the railhead of Tarko Jui. After beating off the attack in the Strio Glen, the Romanians, about the middle of October, were compelled to give way before the 11th Bavarian Division and retire through the Vulcan. The enemy advanced in four columns, aiming at an ultimate concentration in the Geo Valley between Targo Jui and Bombeshti. Colonel Dragolina, now in command of the Romanian First Army, had inferior forces and no reserves. He took his stand on the lines which the enemy had marked for his objective and borrowed a detachment from the division at Orsova and one from the Aluta group. With great tactical skill, he made his dispositions. On 27th October, succeeded in checking the enemy attack and taking many prisoners. Up to 1st November, the Romanians advanced and drove the enemy back to the mountain ravines by which he had come. This first battle of Targo Giu was the most conspicuous success of the campaign, achieved as it was by forces inferior both in numbers and artillery. Unluckily, it was paid for by the life of the gallant commander. 
General Dragolina died of his wounds on 9th November and was succeeded in command of the First Army by General Batali, while the actual fighting on the Jiu was placed under General Vasilescu. In the beginning of November, though things had gone ill in the Drobruja, the Romanian defense in the West had succeeded beyond expectation. The invaders were still held in the foothills and had no wit won the debauchments to the plains. Falkenhayn accordingly revised his plans and resolved to make his supreme effort in the Geo Valley. He knew the smallness of Eliescu's force, and he knew, too, that there the lateral communications were worst of all, and least permitted the speedy dispatch of reinforcements. Accordingly, General Cuny was put in charge of a strong group which included four infantry divisions and a cavalry corps under Count Schmetto. Falkenhayn himself was present in this theater to watch the fortunes of the new attack, to support it and prevent reinforcements reaching the meager Romanian First Army. Kraft von Delmensingen was ordered to press hard on the Alota and General Van Morgan in the Torsberg and Perdiel section. The heavy guns having been got through, the passes, the new offensive began on 10th November with an attack by the two central German divisions against the position on both banks of the Jiu. Ground was won on the heights, and at the same time a German force from the west pressed into the upper Motru Glen. On the 13th, the enemy was astride the Jiu Valley some six miles north of Targo Jui. At this place, the terminus of the railway from Krajova fell on the 15th. The Romanian position now lay on Colpacini, west of the Geo, to the river Gilot, down whose valley ran the Krajova line. The situation was desperate, and reinforcements were hurried westward from the Aluda group. They were fated to arrive too late, for on 17th November, the second battle of the Geo was fought and the whole Romanian defense crumbled before superior numbers and a far superior weight of guns. Cuny was advancing on a wide front, flinging Schmitto's cavalry far out on his flanks, and by the 19th he had reached Felicia. The junction with a line from Targo Jui joins the main railway from Bucharest to Budapest by way of Orsova. This put the Romanian division at Orsova, under Colonel Anastitsu, in dire jeopardy. The retreat of the First Army was now eastward instead of southward. Its first hope was to prevent its left flank being turned, and to fall back on the pivot of the Aluda group, and hold the line up that river. On 21st November, German troops entered Krajova, which the Romanians had evacuated. Kuni was now well into the Wallachian plains, and his progress became rapid. His next objective was the line of the Aluda, and two days later he was in touch with its defense on the front between Dragoshani and Karakalu. The attack on the center at the railway bridge of Slatina failed, but Schmetto's cavalry managed to cross the river at Karakalu. The position was turned. The railway bridge and the granaries of Slatina were blown up, and by the 27th the Aluda line was abandoned. It was not a moment too soon, for in the north the group of Kraft von Demensingen was threatening the right flank south of the Rotherham Pass, and in the south the left flank was already turned, for on the 23rd Mackenzie had begun to cross the Danube. Sakharov, on 9th November, had recaptured Churchova on the Danube, and pushed back Mackenzie in the center as far as Moslu. On that day, too, a Romanian attack from Fetesti on the northern shore of the river gave them the riverside station of Dunaria at the north end of the Chernavolta Bridge. Pushing on, by the middle of the month, Sakharov was in position from a point on the Danube, some seven miles north of Chernavolta to the shore of the Black Sea, fifty miles north of Constanza. But he never reached the railway, being held by the strong lines which the enemy had constructed for its defense. And before he could attack them in force, 
the debacle in the West had put a further offensive in the Dobroja out of the question. Early in November, Mackenzie, having entrusted the task of watching Sakharov to Prince Boris of Bulgaria, turned to his main objective, the crossing of the Danube. In late autumn, the river is not a formidable obstacle to an army operating from the south bank. The stream is at its lowest, not more than ten feet deep between Nicopoli and Silistria, and the current is from eight to ten miles an hour. The south bank, as we have seen, is a high bluff with, in many places when the river is low, a beach beneath it, while the northern shore is for the most part swamp and backwater. Holding the high bank, an army with modern guns could sweep the northern shore for three or four miles inland and command the narrow strips of hard ground between the marshes. In addition to this advantage, Mackenzie had at his command a powerful river flotilla of monitors and gunboats, which could lie hidden behind the shrubby islets. So soon as the fall of Orsovo and Torno Severin had opened the way from the upper waters, long trains of barges came downstream, bringing abundant bridging material. He selected for his first crossing places Islas, opposite the Bulgarian railhead, a Samovit, and Sistova Samnitsa, the very place where the Russians had crossed in 1877. These points were chosen in order to turn the new Romanian line of defense on the Aluta. At both places, the bridging of the river would be facilitated by the islands and the streams, and since the Sistova crossing in peace times was one of the busiest ferries on the river, there were good landing arrangements on both banks. On 19th November, the preliminary German bombardment began to clear the north shore. A thick haze hung over the stream, and under its cover on the night at the 22nd to 23rd, the enemy river craft swarmed out from the shelter of the creeks and islands. In 1877, the Russians had taken 33 days to cross. Mackenzie did the main work in 18 hours. The first troops crossed in steam ferries, and when they had seized the opposite bank, pontoon bridges were constructed with amazing speed. There was practically no opposition, but the enemy's overwhelming superiority in guns made it impossible for the Romanian river guards to make even a show of resistance. By the 26th, Mackenzie was able to report that he had an army group under General Kosh on the northern bank, that he had cleared the country for 20 miles inland, and that his van was close on Alexandria. Presently, at every Danube ferry, the enemy was crossing. Bulgarian cavalry were over the stream at Koravia, and in the east, a Bulgarian detachment from Rushtuk sacked Giorgiva. The end had now fairly come. The Romanian left flank on the Aluda was turned, and events in the north put the pivot on which they swung in danger. The enemy was still held at the Predio, but von Morgan entered Campalong on 29th November. At the same time, Kraft von Delmensingen was pressing hard from the Rotherham. On the 25th, he reached Rimnik Valsia. On the 27th, Tokurtia de Argish. On the 29th, Petitschi fell, and the invaders' line ran by way of Dragonesti to Giogivo, within 30 miles of Bucharest. Before this week, the Romanian groups of the Geo and the Aluda had fallen back in fair order, but two of the frontier forces were in dire straits. One, the Osovo Division, was already beyond hope. Under its gallant leader, Colonel Anastasio, it had left Osovo on 25th November and attempted to retreat southeastward to the Aluda. After three weeks' wild adventures, it reached the valley, only to find it held by the enemy. On 7th December, two days after the capital fell, the remnant of the 7,000 surrendered at Caracalu, having extorted from the Germans admiration for their undaunted valor. The camp alone group, after the fall of Petesti, was compelled to move southeast over difficult country and eventually reached Tagovista and the Dambovisto Valley, where it joined the main Romanian forces. 
The situation now was that from the Pradillo Pass eastward and northward, the mountain position was still held, and the Russians in the Moldavian passes were successfully counterattacking the enemy. But from the Pradillo, westward, all the passes had gone. The upper Argish Valley was lost, and in the south, Mackenzie had pushed between the capital and the Danube. At the rescue, now in supreme command of the Romanian forces, attempted one last stand before Bucharest. A Russian division had arrived in support, and northwest lay what was left of the First Army. South and southwest, Vassan commanded a group formed of troops from what had once been the Third and Fourth Armies to hold the line of the Lower Argesh. On 30th November, the Germans forced the passage of the Little River near Lovu, only 16 miles from the capital. On 1st December, Prasan attempted a counterstroke with the object of driving a wedge between Mackenzie and the German center under Kuni. He almost succeeded, for he flung the enemy back over the Nialovu, taking 30 guns and 1,000 prisoners. Unfortunately, the expected reserves came too late, and the enemy was reinforced before Prasan could press his victory home. The success of 1st December was changed on the 2nd and 3rd to disaster, and Prasan's broken forces were driven in upon Bucharest. Meantime, farther north, the remains of the 1st Army could not bar the roads down the upper Argesh and the Dambovitsa. The vital junction of Titu fell, and Tagovishta, the border town of the great oil fields, passed into enemy hands. Since the line of the Argesh and Dambovitsa could not be held, it was clear that Bucharest was doomed. In the days before the war, the Romanian capital ranked as one of the great fortresses of Europe. Around the city, the land is a flat plain, open, treeless, and highly fertile, broken only by a slight rise between the Argesh and the Dambovitsa. Such country was considered ideal for a modern fortress, and more than thirty years ago the Romanian government accepted the suggestion of Brielmont, the Belgian engineer, to make of the place an entrenched camp like Antwerp. In those days, the dreaded enemy was Russia, and Brielmont intended that Bucharest should be the central point for the defense against the Russians advancing towards the Danube, its works being supplemented by an entrenched line on the lower Sarev, from Galatz to Fasani. Brielmont's forts, Nineteen in number, were arranged in an irregular oval at a distance of some six to nine miles from the center of the city, connected by a circular railway, linked up by three junctions with the existing lines. The forts were of the same type as those of Liège and Namur, a mass of concrete covering a vaulted underground structure and forming the glacis for armored street turrets mounting heavy guns. But in 1914, the first months of war showed that, under the fire of the latest siege artillery, the turret fort with its steel armor and concrete glacis was futile. Five million sterling had been expended on the forts of Bucharest. For this campaign, the money was as utterly wasted as if it had been thrown into the Black Sea. It needed 120,000 men to man the defenses, and to shut up these numbers in the place would have been to make a present of them to the enemy. The Romanian staff had long recognized this truth, and the most they could do was to fight a delaying action on the Argesh to cover the evacuation. That had begun towards the end of November, when Mackenzie first crossed the Danube. By 1st December, the ministers, the banks, and the Allied legations had moved to Jassy in Moldavia. On 5th December, the arsenal was blown up. On 6th December, Mackenzie entered the city. Meantime, in the north, Falkenhayn was approaching Polwesti, the center of the oil region. As he moved east from Tago Vishta, he had before him, like the Israelites in the desert, a pillar of smoke by day and a pillar of fire by night. The air was rank with the fog and fumes of burning oil. The headworks of the wells, the wells themselves, the refineries, the stores, the tanks, all were ablaze as the Romanians retreated. 
The destruction was largely the work of a British member of Parliament, Colonel Norton Griffiths, assisted by the many American engineers employed in the oil works, and millions of pounds worth of property was destroyed in a few days. In front of the German armies moved a crowd of fugitives of every class and condition. Roads and railways were congested with traffic. In the towns on the line of the retreat, there was little shelter and scanty fare. It was a starved and frozen crowd that struggled into Gassi and Galatz. The advance of Falkenhayn to Ploesti had compelled the Romanians to abandon the defense of the Predio. Senei, the summer residence of King Ferdinand, among the pine woods of the Prohoa Valley, was occupied on the same day as the capital. The German line now ran from the Predio through Senei, Ploesti, and Bucharest to the Danube, where Oltenitsa had been abandoned, and a new Bulgarian force was crossing from Turkakai. Wallachia had gone, and the defense was confined to the short front between the apex of the Transylvania salient at the Bozu Pass and the river. North of the Bozu, the mountain frontier was still unbroken. The Romanian army had suffered no sedan, but it had lost heavily and the remnant was broken and weary. It was clear that the defense of Moldavia must for the present rest mainly with the Russian reinforcements. Contemporary history is really just to failure. Only when the mist have cleared and the main issues have been decided can the belligerents afford to weigh each section of a campaign in a just scale. Romania's entry into the war had awakened baseless hopes among her allies. Her unsuccess her inexplicable unsuccess, as it seemed to many, was followed by equally baseless criticism and complaint. The truth is that when Brusilov and Sorel had once failed to achieve their purpose, her chances of victory were gone. She attempted a strategic problem, which only a wild freak of fortune could have permitted her to solve. Her numbers from the start were too small too indifferently trained and too weakly supplied with guns. Nevertheless, when she stood with her back to the wall, this little people, inexpert in war, made a stalwart resistance. Let justice be done to the skill and fortitude of the Romanian retreat. Her generals were quick to grasp the elements of danger, and by their defense of the central passes, prevented the swift and utter disaster of which her enemies dreamed. After months of fighting, during which his armies lost heavily, Polkenhain gained Wallachia and the capital. But the plunder was not a tithe of what he had hoped for. The Romanian expedition was, let it be remembered, a foraging expedition and part of its purpose, and the provender secured was small. The ten weeks of the retreat were marked by conspicuous instances of Romanian quality in the field, and the battles of Hermstadt and the Strio Valley, the defense of the Predio, Torsberg, and Rotherham Passes, the first battle of Targo Jewel, and Poussin's counterstroke on the Argesh, were achievements of which any army might be proud, and the staunch valor of the Roman legionaries still lived in the heroic band who, under Anastasio, cut their way from Orsova to the Aluta. End of chapter 64, part 4. Section 28 of History of the Great War, Volume 3. The Beleaguered Forest Continued in the Great Sallies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of the Great War, Volume 3, by John Buchan. Chapter 65. The Italian Counterattack, June 16th to November 21st, 1916. The Austrian threat in the Trentino had, according to General Cadorna, exhausted itself by the third day of June. But this exhaustion did not involve an immediate relinquishment of the struggle for the road to the Venetian plains. The Italian positions lay from the Conizogna in the Val Lagarina to the Massif of Pasubio, 
where they held the crests, and south of the Pazina, to a point southeast of Anciero, then south of the Pazina to a point southeast of Asiero, and thence along the southern and eastern rims of the Asiago Plateau to the Val Sagano. For a fortnight the enemy fought hard against the Italian center and right, in the first theater to break through the Pazina Heights and reach Sio, and in the second to turn the Italian flank on the Brenta. The splendid defense of Cordona is left in the Vesuvio and Buoli region, where the Alpini fought half buried in snow, slept in snow, and had two hundred cases of frostbite daily, and defeated the dangerous turning movement from the Valasa, and the only chances left to the enemy were in the center and on the east. The actual Italian counteroffensive may be said to have begun on Friday, 16th June, when, on the extreme right, two columns of Alpini drove two Austrian regiments from Monte Magari, a peak of 5,000 feet above the Val Sagana, which forms the northern buttress of the Sete Comuni Plateau. Cadorna had begun to reascend the staircase, down which the enemy had moved halfway. In spite of a stubborn defense, the Italian right began to close in on Asiago. On the 20th, the center advanced on the heights south of the Piscina and on Mount Sengio. Meantime, Brusilov's pressure in Volhynia was beginning to make itself felt, and by the 25th, the Italians had begun to force the pace of withdrawal. Their artillery pounded the enemy positions, and between the Brenta and the Adige, they won ground everywhere, in some places only half a mile, in others as much as four miles. On the 25th, Monte Sengio was stormed, and Monte Simone, north of Asiero, was carried. Next day, squadrons of Sicilian horse rode into Asiago, and on the 27th, Asiero was recovered. On the Italian left ground was one north of Conisotna, and the whole center advanced against the Pusina. The deep bulge between the Adige and the Brenta was being pressed in, and the enemy fell back only just in time. He had no reserves remaining, for his last division had been flung in to cover the difficult retirement of his left. In two days, the Austrians had lost more than half the ground they had gained in their six weeks' offensive. Presently, the enemy's front was behind the Pusina and the Asa, and there for the time being he remained. He held a strong position in the center on the mountain ridges, Amaggio, Toronto, Campomolo, and Spitz to Mezzo. And even on his flanks he had advanced from his old line, for he held Borgo in the east and Sogda Torta in the west. He had certain definite territorial gains to show for an enormous expenditure of shells, and losses which were not less than 130,000. Moreover, his retreat was skillful, for he lost few prisoners and few heavy guns. As he retired, he contracted his front, and so could make up for the absence of the divisions which had gone eastwards against Brusilov. But when all has been said, the Trentino offensive was, from Austria's point of view, a grave failure. It had not reached its main objective, the Venetian plains and the railway communications of the Isonzo front. It had weakened Austria's strength and lowered her power of resistance to Brusilov's attacks. It had inspired her with the false notion that she had crippled Cadorna and prevented any Italian offensive that year. Finally, it had taught the Italians their business. It had forced them to improve their communications and to grapple with transport difficulties of the first magnitude. Italy's materiel was immensely increased, and her successful resistance not only gave her confidence and enthusiasm, but a certain suppleness in movement and a new technical aptitude. If Cadorna could bring reinforcements swiftly, and secretly from the Isonzo to the Trentino, he might carry them back again with the same speed and silence. The penalty for Austria's failure was not Italy's counterstroke of June in the Trentino, but her August assault on Gorizia. As we have seen, 
the 50-mile front on the Isonzo, was one of the most difficult and complex of all the European battlegrounds. In July, the Italian position was as follows. At Tormino, their left flank was east of the river and established on the hills north of the town, while they held strongly the heights on the western bank. The town remained in Austrian hands, and the area offered no very good opportunities for an advance, since the railway from Gorizia to village by the Wojian Tunnel was already cut, and a flank march on Gorizia from Tolmino was an almost impracticable undertaking. Fifteen miles south, the Italian left center held the bridgehead of Plava, which offered a possible route for an attack upon Monte Santo the defense of Gorizio on the north. The enemy, however, held the heights east of the river in great strength, and such a plan, since the asset of surprise was lost, would have involved a cost wholly disproportionate to any conceivable gain. It had been tried on July 2, 1915, and had failed. An attack from this side was not possible till a more sheltered road could be made down into the plava bottom which would escape the attentions of the enemy from Monte Cook. The Italian center lay in front of Gorizia itself. The city lay in a pocket of plain, defended on all sides by rampart of hills. West of the Isonzo, the Austrians held the line of lower heights, Sovetino, Oslavio, and Podgoro, on the first and last of which the Italians had formerly effected a lodgment. North ran the Turno Vanifold, with its main positions of Monte Santo, Monte San Gabriel, and Monte Santa Catarina. South lay the northern edge of the Carso Plateau. Finally, the Italian right wing lay along the western rim of the Carso itself, that bleak, stony upland without soil or vegetation, where every acre is a virtual fortress. The map will show that it projects well to the west into the great loop of the Isonzo. The court of the arc so formed is the dry valley called the Valloni, which runs almost from the plain of Gorizia to the Adriatic. It was that part of the castle west of the Valloni, which formed the key of the southern defenses of Gorizia. The valley itself was like a vast lateral communication trench, providing a sheltered road for the movement of troops behind the front line. The Italians held the greater part of this butt end of the castle, and in the center reached almost to the Valloni, but in the north, Monte San Michel, and in the south, the line of heights between Cebusi and Cossage, had defied their efforts. The vital point was San Michel, for it dominated the Gorizian plain. If any assaults upon Gorizia there were two alternatives before the Italian commander, merely to master the heights on the western bank would not give him the city. He must win them, and also carry and support either the northern defenses at Santo or the southern at San Michel. The reason was that, with the enemy on the San Michel or Santo, the Pogorda line, even if one could not have been used as a position for which to assault the actual river crossing. Cadorna chose the latter of the two alternatives, to carry the western bank, and at the same time take the defense on its southern flank by winning San Michel. During the winter, Italy had made a great effort in the preparation of munitions and heavy guns, and her general staff had worked out in detail the plans for the Isonzo attack. The Trentino business upset the timetable, but it did not change the essentials of the scheme. Cadorno spent May and June with one eye on the Seti Comuni and the other on Gorizia and the Carso, where Borovich sat in fancied security. Even in the heat of the last defensive effort in the Trentino, there was a steady winning of minor positions in the Gorizian area. For example, on the evening of 14th June, a Neapolitan brigade captured by a surprise attack the enemy trenches east of Malfalcone, taking seven machine guns and nearly 500 prisoners. On the 29th, the sudden gas attack almost drove the Italians off the Carso, and in repelling it, Colonel Godolfi was the first soldier to receive the gold medal, Al Valori, 
otherwise then as a posthumous honor. Towards the end of June, certain movements had already begun the transferring troops and guns from the Trentino to the Isonzo. The Italian staff divided its operations under this head into three stages. From 29th June to July 27th, the work was only preliminary, consisting of the transport of reserve units and of drafts for the existing Isonzo forces, as well as a certain amount of material. From 27th July to the eve of the Grand Assault, the great guns and trench mortars were moved, and the principal new units who received their orders while on the journey. After the attack began, there was a rapid movement of reserves, which the railways, reorganized under the strain of the Trentino defense, handled with conspicuous speed and precision. Cardona desired to take the enemy unawares. He intended to faint hard with his right wing, against the Malfalcone end of the castle position, and so induced the Austrians, under fear of being outflanked, to mass their local reserves there. At the same time, they would assume that it was merely a local effort, and would not hurry such strategic reserves as they might possess to that point from the more distant parts of their line. Then, when the main enemy strength was massed opposite Malfalcone, he intended to strike with his chief forces against Carizzi itself, on the front from Sabatino to San Michele. His strategy was assisted by the confidence into which Porovich had been lulled. That commander believed the Trentino offensive had, even in its failure, crippled Italy for months. Once again, as in Volhynia, in June, Austria had underrated the recuperative power of her opponents. From the first day of August, the Italian artillery bombarded the whole Isonzo front, from Sabatino to the Adriatic. The preparation was so uniform that the defense could not forecast an infantry attack in any one section from the special violence of the shelling. On Friday, 4th August, came the Malfalcone feint. The boys Saglieri, who had long made this their fighting ground, carried two hills to the east of the Rocca in their assault upon the strong Austrian flank positions on Monte Cossic. The Austrians left numbers of asphyxiating bombs in their abandoned trenches, which did terrible havoc among the attackers. Presently, Counterstroke drove back the Versaglieri to their original line, but Cadorna's purpose had been secured. Roborovich promptly reinforced the Malfalcone section. On Sunday, 6th August, the Italian bombardment was resumed, this time with redoubled fury along the front from Sabatino to San Michel. Presently, it was reported that the Austrian first position had been destroyed, and at four in the afternoon, the infantry crossed their parapets. Against Gorizzi itself moved the right wing of the Second Army, the enlarged Sixth Corps, under General Capello, whose chief of staff, Badoglio, had planned the details of the battle. On the right against San Michele and the north edge of the Carso was the left wing of the Duke of Aosto's third army. The great battle of that day and the following, which determined the fate of Gorizia, falls naturally into two parts. The northern, where the Italians aimed at mastering the heights between Sabatino and Bodgora, and the southern, where the objective was San Michele. Sabatino and San Michele may be regarded as the two lateral buttresses of the Gorizian bridgehead, the fall of which must involve its conquest. On the extreme left, troops of the 45th Division were directed on Sabatino. The mountain had been tunneled to within 90 feet of the Austrian trenches, and in that tunnel the first wave of the assault assembled. At the signal, they swept up the broken hillside among the blazing scrub with such splendid gallantry that they withdrew the enemy first position before he had begun his barrage. In twenty minutes, the first three trench lines were carried, and within an hour, the Italians had the redoubt on the summit, fifteen hundred feet above the river, had captured the whole garrison, and was swarming down the farther side. Before the dark fell, the 45th Division held the line, San Valentino, San Moro, within half a mile of the river. 
just south of Sabatino, a brigade of the 43rd Division assaulted the hill marked 188 and carried it. On their right, the Abruzzi Brigade of the 24th Division stormed with dust the strong line of Oslavia. South, again, a brigade of the 11th Division advanced against Podgora. This cave position, so long contested, was not taken without desperate fighting. The crest was won in patches, and the Italians advanced down the farthest slope. But for two days, small garrisons of brave men resisted on the summit. An Austrian major with forty men made such a gallant stand that when he was finally overpowered, the Italian commander ordered his men to present arms to the prisoners. Austria's fighting record in the campaign was so consistently belittled by her German allies that it is worthwhile remembering that both against Italy and Russia, certain of her troops showed a fighting quality which was never excelled and not often equaled in the German ranks. Finally, to complete the tale of this section, the 12th Division carried Monte Calvaria and had advanced by nightfall against the enemy's final position between the southern end of Polgora and the river. Not less were the achievements of the 3rd Army against San Michel. Had it been possible for the Versagliari on the 4th to have carried the Sei Busi, Cossack position, the Italian right might have swung northwards against the southern flank of the mountain. As it was, the place had to be taken by direct assault. The four peaks, three of which had once been in Italian hands, seemed to offer a task too hard for mortal valor. Nevertheless, it was completed, but not without heavy loss. The enemy fought from cavern to cavern and from redoubt to redoubt, but he could not be reinforced. And step by step during the 6th and 7th, the Italians won their way to the rim, overlooking Gorizia and forced the defense northwards. By midday on Tuesday, 8th August, the whole of the heights on the western bank of the river had fallen to Cadorna and the key point of San Michel on the eastern shore. The moment had now come for the assault upon Gorizia itself. Trench line after trench line had to be carried in the riverside flats. But before the darkness came, no Austrians remained on the western bank. The bridges had been damaged and must be repaired before the army could cross. And for this task, it was necessary to get an advance guard over to hold a covering line. At dusk, troops of the Casali and Pavia brigades forded the stream and entrenched themselves on the farther side, while detachments of cavalry and prosaglieri cyclists pursued and kept touch with the retreating enemy. That day, too, the right wing won more ground on San Michel, occupying Boschini on its extreme northern edge. By the morning of the night, the bridges were ready, and the main army crossed the stream. Before noon, it entered Gorizia, no longer the pleasant city among orchards which had once made it, the Austrian Nice, but a dusty, shell-scarred memorial of a year of war. Meantime, the Italian cavalry was pressing eastwards to the line of the little river, Vrtobitsa, and the hills which on the east bound the Gorizian plain. Already over 12,000 prisoners were in Cordona's hands, and the casualties on the defense were little less than 80,000. With the fall of Gorizia, Cordona's offensive entered on its second phase. Trieste was now the direct objective, and as a first step, the enemy must be driven beyond the Valloni Depression, since as long as he held any part of the western side, he menaced Gorizia and barred progress on the castle itself. On Thursday, 10th August, began the advance on the Valloni. That day, the whole de Berda plateau was cleared. The Seibusi Cossack knot of hills was taken, and the enemy was flung eastward across the valley. At one point in the south, at Devoli, near Mount Falcone, the Austrians held their ground for two days longer. But on Saturday the 12th, their resistance was broken and the whole of the western butt end of the Carso was in Cadorno's hands. He pressed on east of the Valloni, to the village of Apachiasella, the hill called Nad Logan, and positions on the west side of Monte Pichinco. Northeast of Gorizzo he won Tivoli, 
on the slopes of Monte Santa Catarina, but it was clear that the San Gabriel and Santo Heights could not be taken without a simultaneous attack from Plava or Monte Cook. Moreover, it was necessary to rearrange the front after the fortnight's fighting, and about 15th August the advance slowed down, and it made invaluable gains. Carizia and the Garizian plain were won, and a vital part of the Carso, the line now lying several miles east of the Valloni. The Austrians, as in Galicia, had been compelled by their repulse not to shorten but to lengthen the front, already inadequately held. The whole southern Isonzo defense system had disappeared, and between Cadorno and Trieste lay a country, difficult indeed, but lacking such elaborately prepared fortifications as those which had made the Isonzo lines of stuff in a problem. Between 4th and 15th August, he had taken 18,758 prisoners, 393 of them officers, 30 heavy guns, 62 pieces of trench artillery, 92 machine guns, and huge quantities of every kind of war material. The August battles roused in Italy a strong emotion of joy and pride. Only those who have seen the steep wooded hills west of Gruzia and viewed the intractable landscape of the Carso can realize how great was the Italian achievement. The Carso in especial might be claimed with truth as the most terrible battlefield in Europe. Waterless and dusty, scorching by day and icy by night, it was one giant natural redoubt. There was nothing to soften the shattering percussion of projectiles among the acres of rock and boulders, and wounds which elsewhere might have been slight became deadly injuries. Further, Austria had used all the laborious talent of certain classes of her people, to turn the natural strength of the place to the best advantage. In this uncanny fighting, Italy was developing special troops distinguished by a desperate ardor and extreme endurance. She had always been famous for her corps d'elite, and to the great names of Alpini and Vassiglieri. There were soon to be added those of Arditi and Granatieri. New leaders also had emerged in the struggle and of Capello and Badoglio, the world was to hear much in the future. The fall of Gorizia was for Italy like the extra chemical, whose addition to a compound dissolves certain intractable elements. The new enthusiasm for the war brought her into exact line with her allies. On May 23, 1915, she had broken with Austria-Hungary, and the Triple Alliance was at an end. On 20th August of the same year, she had declared war on Turkey, and on 19th October on Bulgaria. But with Germany, she still remained formally at peace. Her reasons for this anomalous situation were mainly domestic, and no ally questioned their validity, the more especially against one member of the Teutonic League. She was waging a wholehearted struggle. But the financial and ecclesiastical difficulties which stood in the way of a final break with Germany gradually disappeared during the first year of war. Germany was the supreme fount of offense, and a contest with any one of her allies must bring a nation face to face with that Prussian creed which civilized Europe had vowed to destroy. Nor was she herself slow to give Italy specific grounds for hostility. She surrendered to Austria, Italian prisoners of war who escaped to German soil. She directed her banks to regard Italian subjects as alien enemies and to postpone all payments owing to them. She suspended the payment of pensions due to Italian workmen. By the summer of 1916, the nominal peace was the merest comedy. It was Germany who supplied Austria, Italy's direct opponent, with her chief munitions of war. It was German officers and German soldiers and sailors who largely directed every operation against Italy. It was only by Germany's assistance that the Archduke Charles had been able to concentrate for the Trentino Offensive. The contrast between the situations de facto and de jure had become too glaring to continue. Cadorno's success cleared the air. The new national spirit demanded that truth should be spoken and facts recognized. Accordingly, 
On 27th August, the government declared in the king's name that Italy considered herself as from 28th August in a state of war with Germany and begged Switzerland to convey the intimation to Berlin. So completely farcical had been the previous peace that the declaration involved no single change in the conduct of the campaign. The capture of Gorizia was an important step, but the nature of the country made it no more than a first step, and those who spoke glibly of a dash for Leibach or Trieste had small acquaintance with the intricate landscape. North of Gorizia, the Isonzo runs in a deep trench. Its eastern bank rises in sharp wooded ridges to the height of nearly 2,000 feet, and from its crest runs northeast the great Benziza Plateau, between the Isonzo and the Val Chiapavano. South of this last glen, and at right angles to the main river, the southern rim of the turn of Vanavald stretches eastward, with its peaks of Monte San Gabriel and Monte San Daniel, defending the Gorizian plain from the north. Till these were masted, there could be no advance from Gorizia along the railway to Trieste. East of the city, the Austrians held the low wooded ridge of San Marco and the east bank of the Vertobitza, up to the edge of the Carso, along whose foot flowed from the east the little river Vipaco. The western Carso had already been won, but the Carso east of the Bologna was a harder problem. Desolate and stony in the interior, it had shaggy wooded fringes, the ridge above the Vipaco in the north, and in the south her motto and the coast foothills. Its tableland was tilted towards the northeast, where it ascended from the Valloni in a great staircase to the crest called the Iron Gates, south of Dornberg. It is necessary to recapitulate this topography, that the strength of the Austrian position may be understood. Two facts must be kept in mind. The first is that no advance eastwards through the Gorizian plain was practicable till Santo, Gabriel, and Daniel. The rim of the turn of Vandevald had been won, and that to win these points the Italians must first scale the steep ridge east of the Isonzo and carry the Benzitsa Plateau. The second is that for the same advance the Carso must be carried, and that with every mile the place became a stronger fortress. To force the ridge at the iron gates by direct attack was impracticable, and the best chance was a turning movement by the south. But to block this rose Hermada, one labyrinth of tunnels and trenches, and bristling with guns. The task before Cordona was a slow and formidable one, and could only be performed by patient stages. Moreover, it must be performed by alternate blows, now at the Santo Ridge, now on the Carso for each demanded a full concentration, till Gabriel and Daniel were one in the north, and Hermada on the south, the Austrians in Trieste might sleep secure. The Carso was fixed as the theater of the next movement, and something like a month was occupied in preparation. The Italian line, the Third Army, now ran from the Vipaco, east of the hill called Nad Logum, east of Opochi Asala west of the hamlet of Nova Vas, east of the lake of Dobrodo, and thence to the coast marshes about Porto Rosiga. On the morning of 14th September, a great bombardment began between the Vapaco and the sea, in which the bombarda, the giant 11-inch trench mortar, played a chief part. Just after midday, a thunderstorm broke on the Carso, and when, in the early afternoon, the Italian infantry advanced it was in a downpour of rain. In the center east of Madlogum, they succeeded at once and took large numbers of prisoners. On the right there was desperate fighting around Nova Vaz and Hill 208 to the south, and no impression was made on the extreme right, where Hills 144 and 77 were supported by the guns from Hermada. On the left, the Italians surrounded the little hill, which stood San Grado di Merna. All night, thunderstorms rattled among the stormy scarps, and with the wet dawn, the batteries began again. At midday on the 15th came the next attack, which gave the Italian San Gardo as well as some gains at Lovica, 
and opened to the cellar. Next day, the 16th, the line was farther advanced, and on the following day, Austrian counterattacks were decisively repulsed. So far in the four-day battle, the Duke of Augusta had taken between 4,000 and 5,000 prisoners, but he had not won any vital position. The Austrians showed the most dogged tenacity in defense, and they were well served by the nature of their fortifications. The quote from an Italian communique, Their new trenches had been prepared months ago, and had been strengthened and deepened as soon as the Italian offensive, which resulted in the taking of Gorizia, began. Many of these were blasted out of the rock to the depth of about six feet, faced with a low parapet of sandbags and protected with steel shields, as experience had taught the Austrians not to use stones in the construction of their breastworks, and to avoid offering even the smallest target to the Italian artillery and trench mortars. Moreover, caverns and deep dugouts protected the defenders during bombardment. The undulating ground, broken by innumerable crater-like holes in the limestone, and here and there covered by small woods, lends itself admirably to obstinate resistance with concealed emplacements and hidden machine guns. Everywhere they had barbed wire entanglements, much of which, being concealed, escaped destruction. Once more the Italian bombardment was renewed, and with it came the rain. Low mists hung over the plateau, observation for the air was impossible, and it was not till 10th October that the next attack was made. The infantry of the 3rd Army advanced at 2.45 p.m. in a thin fog and were immediately successful. They straightened out the kinks which had been left from the September battle, winning notably the remainder of the Hill 208 position and Hill 144 east of Lake Doberto. The Italian front now ran nearly straight from Hill 144 to the 5th battle and included the whole of the old Austrian front which had been attacked in September. Next morning, 11th October, the Austrians counterattacked in dense fog, especially against the Italian left. In the afternoon, when the weather had cleared, the Italians again advanced, and during that night and the following day, there was a fierce struggle for Sober and the new hit line on Hill 144. At Sober alone, on a single battalion front, 400 dead were counted. That afternoon, the Italians carried the hill of Pachinka in the center and got into the outskirts of the villages of Lovitcha and Hudi Log, more than a mile east of Nova Vos. Once more, the line was as serrated as it had been in September. On the 13th, in wild weather, the Duke of Aosta's left pushed north of Solba to the Gorizia Bavavincia Road and brought their capture of prisoners up to 8,000. But the continuing tempest, the same chain of gales which dislocated the British plans on the Somme, forced the battle to a standstill, and compelled the Italians to withdraw a little from Prochinka, Lovitra, and Hudi Log. For a fortnight the rains continued, and then very slowly the mist began to rise, and a chill, the first hint of winter, crept into the air. On 30th October, the skies were clear, and from dawn to dusk, there was such a bombardment as even the Carso had not seen. Fog had settled on the ridges again, but it was the fog of powdered earth, splintered stone, and the fumes of the great shells. The guns roared all night, and on the morning of the 31st, at ten minutes past eleven, the Italian infantry crossed the parapets to be met with the hurricane of shrapnel as soon as they showed in the open. On the left, the 11th Corps won back all the ground that had been relinquished, carried Pachinka and Lovica, and within an hour, by a brilliant flanking movement, had the summit of a Licky Erb. Thence, they swept on to the hill, named 376. The Italian center south of Lovica moved along the Apachisella, Costa Gifica Road and came within a thousand yards of the latter place. The right wing, operating along the southern rim of the Carso Plateau, took Hill 238 and the village of Jamiano, but could not maintain itself against the fire from the Hamata guns. 
that hollow east of Hill 144, the southern end of the Valoni, became another pit of smoke and death. The day had been for the Third Army a remarkable victory, for on a front of more than two miles, between the north edge of the Carso and the upper Chiasella, Costan Javica Road, the Austrian line had been shattered. A large number of enemy batteries were taken, and nearly 5,000 prisoners, including 132 officers. But a pronounced salient had been created, and a salient is always liable to a counterstroke. The Austrians had been so roughly handled that it was not till 2nd November that their guns woke. All the ground won by the Italian center was plastered with shells, and since the Italians were largely in the open, the old trenches having been destroyed, their sufferings were severe. Of the first Sagliari brigade, which had taken Pachinka, there is told a fine tale. All night the brigadier and the commanders of the 6th and 12th regiments walked up and down the front line to give confidence to their men, and in the morning of the three only one was left. About midday the enemy launched his infantry against Pachinka and held 308. In order to drive a wedge into the salient, he failed, and the Italians again swept forward, taking Hill 399 and the crowning position of Facci Herb. Facci Herb is the highest point of the step of the great staircase, which runs from Fupaco to Costa Giafica. It commanded the last name village and also the road which ran to the east and north to south across the plateau. The situation was grave for the enemy center, but for the moment he had to content himself with fruitless counterattacks on the flanks. The Italian salient was now as deep as it was broad, some two miles each way, and the danger of a counterattack at the re-entrance was great. But on 3rd November, a division moved downhill from the rim of the Carso and occupied the line of the Verbaco west of Biglia and so protected the northern flank of the salient. Farther south during the same day, other troops occupied Hill 291, and came within 200 yards of Costa Yavica. In the three days fighting, the Third Army had taken 8,750 prisoners, including 270 officers. The Austrians were now back everywhere on their third line. Part of it, from the Verpaco to Costa Yavica, was an improvised line constructed during the September attack, but from Clauston Yavica south, it was largely the old first line, made long before Gorizia fell, and moreover its strength was increased by the formidable concealed batteries on Hermata. It was clear that Hermata was the real obstacle, and that no progress could be made till a way was found of taking order with it. This meant a great concentration of guns and a halt for preparations. But meantime, the winter closed down, and though all through December, Cardona waited in readiness, hoping for fine weather. About Christmas, he had to abandon his plan and postpone the next effort to the spring. During November and December, the rain fell in sheets. Every ravine was a torrent, and every depression a morass. The borer scourged the bleak uplands, and with the new year came frost and snow, so that the ice on so front was scarcely less arctic than the glacier post in Trentino or the icy eeries in the Dolomites. It was a bitter winter for the front lines, but through it all, a perpetual toil went on to improve positions, to contrive gun emplacements, to complete a network of communication trenches, in preparation for the campaign which the next season would bring. The troops could look back upon four months of brilliant achievement, but Italy was now at war with Germany as well as with Austria, and her high command had little doubt that 1917 would prove a supreme test of their country's valor and resolution. On Tuesday, 21st November, the Emperor Francis Joseph died. He was in his 86th year, the oldest sovereign in the world. He had reigned for 68 years, having begun his active political life just after the fall of Metternich. He had fought many wars and had nearly always been beaten. He had had, to yield time and again, his most cherished convictions. He had suffered the deepest public and private sorrows, and in the end he had come to be regarded as one of the permanent things in Europe, 
from his sheer length of life and tenacity and suffering. He was the last believer in the old theory of the divine right of monarchs, but the German emperor held a more modern variant, and his passionate faith gave him strength and constancy. To this creed, everything was sacrificed. Ease, family affection, private honor, the well-being of individuals and of nations, until he became an inhuman monarchical machine, grinding on decisions like an automaton. His age and his afflictions persuaded the world to judge him kindly, and indeed the tragic loneliness of his life made the predominant feeling one of pity. But if we try by any serious standard, we cannot set him among the good sovereigns of the world, and still less among the great. He gravely misruled the peoples and trusted to his care. He brought misfortunes upon Europe, and in the end he left his country ruined, bleeding, and bankrupt. The cause he fought for was not noble or wise, but only a sumptuous egotism. At no time in his career had he any true perception of the forces at work in the world. He broke his head against new powers which he did not foresee, and then sat in the dust to be commiserated. The tragedy lay in a mind so sparsely furnished being charged with the control of such mighty destinies. He was a self-deceiver, living in a fanciful world of his own to which he feebly sought to make facts conform. He had the dignity and patience of his strange house, and in the fullest degree the essential Habsburg weakness. His successor on the throne was his great-nephew, the Archduke Charles Francis Joseph, the son of that Archduke Otto, who was the younger brother of the murdered Francis Ferdinand. He was in his thirtieth year, and had lately been commanding in chief on the southern section of the Eastern Front. The new emperor had some of the characteristics of his father, and shared in his personal popularity. He was known as a good sportsman and young man of frank and engaging manners, but he had scarcely the education to fit him to sit on the most difficult throne in Europe. He was reported to have shared the trialist views of his uncle, the Archduke Francis Ferdinand, and his two years of campaigning had done something to sour his temper towards the martinets of Berlin. He wished to safeguard the remains of his sovereignty, and it was believed that he might show a certain independence in policy. If he accepted Middle Europa, it would be because of the interests of Austria-Hungary, and not from subservience to his German ally. End of chapter 65Section 29 of the History of the Great War, Volume 3. The Beleaguered Fortress Continued in the Great Sallies. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of the Great War, Volume 3 by John Buchan. Chapter 66, The Winter of 1916 in Eastern and Southeastern Europe. August 25th, 1916 to January 29th, 1917, Part 1. 1. We left the narrative of the Salonica campaign at the close of August, when the Bulgarian offensive had carried the troops of Todorov's Second Army to the gates of Kavala. The northern forts were occupied on 25th August, and on 14th September, the invaders entered the town itself. Then followed strange doings. The bulk of the 4th Greek Corps, stationed in the place, along with one Colonel Hatzelopoulos, its commander, surrendered itself without a blow to the enemy and was carried to Germany as guest of the German government. One portion, the 6th Division, under Colonel Chrysostulus, succeeded in making its way by Thesos to Salonika to join the Allied forces. The Athens government repudiated the action of the commander of the 4th Corps, alleging that he had strict orders, in case of necessity, to transport his troops to Volo. But over these instructions, as over the similar case of the surrender of Fort Rupel, there hung a mist of doubt and suspicion, a doubt which has since been turned into a damning certainty by the publication of the correspondence between Athens and Berlin. 
the surrender was not only acquiesced in, but invited. Rumani had begun her campaign, and it behoved Sorel to play his part in detaining her enemies. But the events of August had made it very clear to him that no offensive could succeed by way of the Vardar and Struma valleys. The enemy was too strongly in force, and the country was too difficult. His one hope lay in the west, where, not too remote from the Allied lines, lay Monastir, the most cherished of Bulgaria's gains, a city which the enemy might be trusted to fight hard to retain. In that quarter was to be found a possible objective in the military sense, and at the same time, a certain means of engaging Bulgaria's attention. Accordingly, the bulk of Cordonier's French force, the Serbian corps under Mischitz, and the Russian contingent were allocated to the advance west of the Vardar. By the last day of August, except for a French mounted detachment, the whole front from the Vardar eastward was in British hands. The task of General Milne was that of controlling the Bulgarian Second Army so that it should not send reinforcements to the First Army in the Monastir section. His methods were artillery bombardments and well-organized raids into the enemy lines. He slowly made ground, till by the end of the year he had advanced the British front east of the Struma and had prepared a position secure from assault and formidable enough to detain large enemy forces. On 10th September, the Struma was crossed at five places above Lake Tahinos, and a number of villages occupied. Five days later, there was a second successful crossing in the same area, and yet another on the 23rd, when the sudden rising of the river made operations difficult. Between 11th and 13th September, the Bulgarian front between the Vardar and Lake Doran was heavily bombarded at a point where it formed a salient, and the subsequent infantry attack inflicted severe losses on the enemy. Toward the close of the month, in order to cooperate with the impending attack on Florina, preparations were made for a more prolonged effort beyond the Struma. Bridges were improvised between Orjak and Lake Tahinos, and on the night of the 29th September, our infantry crossed. On the 30th, one brigade carried various villages, beat off counterattacks, and by 2nd October had consolidated its position. On the 3rd, another brigade won the village of Yanakoi, on the main road from Ceres to Salonika. The Bulgarians counterattacked desperately during the afternoon and evening, but by the following morning, our ground was secure. On the 5th, Novellian, a hamlet north of the high road, was taken, and on the 7th we flung forward a cavalry reconnaissance, which located the enemy on the railway between Demir Hissar and Ceres. Presently we were astride the line, and the Bulgarians took up strong positions on the high ground to the eastward. On 1st November, we captured Baraklijoma, six miles southwest of Demir Hissar, taking over 300 prisoners and strengthened our hold on the railway north of Ceres. But the floods of the Struma, the wintry weather, and the strength of the enemy prevented us from undertaking any larger movement. In artillery work, we had shown ourselves conspicuously superior to the Bulgarians, and our activity at the autumn won us immunity from attack during the winter trench warfare. The British had performed the task assigned to them and immobilized Todorov, while Sorel's left wing was creeping nearer to Monastir. At the end of August, the Bulgarian First Army was still advancing, and there was fierce fighting on the northern shore of Lake Ostrovo. By the last day of the month, that offensive had been definitely checked, and on 7th September, the Allied attack began. On the extreme left, in Albania, the Italians were in motion east of Athlona. The main front directed against Monastir was held by the Serbian Corps on the right and by the French and Russians on the left. The city lies at the mouth of a gorge on the western side of the Pelagonian Plain. East of it, the river Cherna flows southward and then turns to the northern white curve 
containing in its loop a number of minor ridges of hills. The Salonica Road and Railway ran south also, west of the Cherna Curve, to the great border in Florina, crossed the watershed, and turned along the north shore of Lake Ostrovo. Between that lake and the Cherna Loop lies the Moglina Range of Mountains, close on 8,000 feet high, which separates Greece from southwestern Macedonia. Against an enemy advancing from the southeast, Monastir was well protected. Whoever held the Moglina Crest could bar all access to the plain, and even when the frontier was passed, strong lines of defense were possible by means of the various tributaries entering the Cherna from the west. Cyril's plan was simple. The Servians were directed from the Vodina Lake Ostrova line against the Moglina Ridge, while farther west of the French and Russians moved on Florina and the southern entrance to the Monastir Plain. If the mountains were won and the advance pushed beyond them, it was clear that any defensive position in the south of that plain would be turned on its eastern flank, and once the hills in the Cherna Loop were carried, the city would fall. The Serbians began their main advance on 7th September, at a time when the valleys were yellow with ripening millet, and the orchards around the little villages were heavy with fruit. West and north of Lake Ostrovo, they progressed in a series of bounds, making brilliant use of their field guns, and storming the enemy trenches on the slopes with hand grenade and bayonet. They were fighting for revenge, and every foot gained brought them nearer to their native soil. Their left wing moved towards Benista, and their center and right against the massif of K. Manchalan, the highest point of the Maglena Range. On the 14th, they took Exigiu, on the railway between Ostrovo and Florina, by a dashing cavalry charge, and pushed their front well up the steep ridge to the north. On the 16th, the Franco-Russian force, sweeping in a wide curve southwest of Lake Ostrovo, was close on the Greek town of Florina, which the Bulgarians had taken a month before. Four days later, the Serbians stormed the summit of Kmak Chalam, and there, for the first time, we entered their native land. That morning also, after a battle which lasted all the previous day and night, the Franco-Russian troops carried Florina by assault. The Allies were now in the Monastir Plain, their left moving up the railway, their center approaching the Cherna Loop, and their right on the top of the flanking mountains. The men on the hilltops were looking over the empty fields and yellowing vineyards to the red roofs and shining white walls and minarets of the most ancient of Balkan cities. To defend Monastir, there were three main lines of entrenchments, one ran north of Florina and south of the Greek frontier. A second lay from the western hills, through the village of Canali to the loop of the Cherna, while a third followed the little river Beritza, just south of the city itself. The key to the whole position was Kmak Chalan, and to regain this, the Bulgarians made many desperate and fruitless counterattacks. On the 26th at dawn came such a venture, which was broken before the sun rose. Late on the 9th of the 27th, four different assaults were launched, one of which succeeded in taking the advanced Serbian line on the northern slope, but the crest remained in the Allied hands. Two days later, Mishik made another bound forward and pushed his front one and a quarter miles north of Cape Machalan, spreading also down the slopes toward the Cherna. The result was to outflank the first Bulgarian position for the defense of the Monastir Plain and to drive the enemy back to the Canale lines, only ten miles from the city. While the French and Russians faced Canale from the plain, it was the task of Mishik to continue the outflanking movement by crossing the Cherna and winning the bridges in the loop of the river. The bridges had been destroyed, by 5th October, the river had been crossed in the region of Broad and Dobrovina. The Serbians now held 25 miles of frontier and had regained 90 square miles of their own land, including seven villages. Ludendorff was compelled to take action 
He had already had friction with the Bulgarian headquarters, and he now insisted that the armies on that front should be made a group under German command, and Otto von Bello was brought south from Courland for the task. The Canale position was virtually impregnable to a frontal attack, and it was hoped to hold Michigan up among the bridges inside the loop once the river was crossed. The next great assault came on 14th October. After a heavy artillery preparation, the infantry went into action at one o'clock in the morning, all along the line. But the position was too strong to be carried by a frontal assault, and little was achieved. On the 17th, the Serbians attacked north of the Cherna and forced their way well into the loop getting behind the main alignment of the Canale position. On the 19th, they were nearly four miles north of Broad, and on 21st October, the weather broke, and Surreal had to endure the same obstacles from rainstorms, which were at the moment delaying the British advance on the Somme. In drenching wet and fog, the fighting in the Cherna Hills slowed down. The opportunity was taken by Winford to strengthen his front, and bring up his reserves, and for a little it looked as if the chance of the Allies had gone for the year. The new arrivals counterattacked on the 22nd, but Mishik held his ground in the loop, and in some places advanced his line. During the last week of October, these attacks were many times repeated, while the French and Russians bombarded their 14-mile front, aiming especially at preventing the movement of troops from one bank of the Cherna to the other. On 14th and 15th November, Bishop struck again. He moved forward in the loop, taking 1,000 prisoners, mostly Germans, and reaching a point only a dozen miles from Monastir. This victory spelled the doom of the Canale lines, now hopelessly outflanked. Violent counterattacks failed to delay the Allied progress, for on the 14th the French and Russians broke into the Canale front, fighting in a sea of mud, and early on the 15th, it was found that the enemy had evacuated the position and fallen back to the Baritza, less than four miles from Monastir. The Bulgarian line now ran in the loop of the Cherna through Jarovic and Ivan, with the Serbians close on their trail. The city was all but one, for if the Canali lines which Mackensen had prepared a year before could not be held, there was little hope for those on the Baritza, which were only a month old. Thursday the 16th was a day of rain and fog, and the Serbians, who now was before, had the vital task, could not make progress. But Friday was clear and bright, and after severe fighting, Misha carried before evening Hill 1212, north of Jaratok. One height only remained. That marked in map 1378 before the Serbians would be masters of all the high ground in the journal loop, and be able to descend upon the prelate road north of Monastir, and cut off the retreat of the enemy forces. On Saturday 18th, late in the evening, Hill 1378 fell, and at daybreak on the 19th the Serbians were in Makova and Dobromir, and so well to the northeast of Monastir. Winkler retreated while yet there was time, at 8.15 a.m. on Sunday the 19th, the last German battalion hastened out along the Prilip Road, and at 8.30 French cavalry were in the streets. At 9 came the first French infantry, and then a Russian battalion, and then an Italian detachment, which had come in on the extreme left. Later in the day from across the Cherna, the Servians arrived in their recovered city. To them, the fall of Monastir was mainly due, for, by their brilliant flanking movements, first at Kaimak Chalan, and then in the Journal Loop, they had rendered futile the enemy's long-prepared defenses. It was an auspicious omen that they entered Monastir on the anniversary of the day on which, four years before, the troops had wrested it from the Turks. The enemy had fallen back a dozen miles toward Prelep, he was not pursued, for at that season of the year advance was difficult. The snowy Babuna Mountains barred the northern exits from the plain. The country around Monastir was cleared, however, 
in a wide radius, and on 27th November, the hill marked 1050 between Makova and the Cherna, which if held by the enemy, would have been a thorn in the side of the Allies, was brilliantly carried by French Suez. There were minor actions during December, but by the end of the year the fighting on the whole Salonica front had returned to the normal conditions of trench warfare. The campaign, though it did not bring relief to Romania, had not wholly failed. It had compelled Ludendorff to divert to Macedonia several Jaeger battalions that had been destined for Osova. It had restored to Serbia a famous city as an earnest of greater things, and it had proved to the world if proof were needed the heroic steadfastness of her exile sons. The cautious and nerveless strategy of Surreal crippled the genius of the Serbian commander, for had Mizhik been given the free use of the reserves, Prilip also might have fallen to his hand. During the operations in the north, the political situation in Greece was marching steadily to a deeper confusion. We have seen that the surrender of Fort Rupel had been succeeded on 6 June by an Allied blockade of Greek shipping, and that the unsatisfactory partial demobilization, which Monsieur Scolidi's government announced, had been followed by an Allied ultimatum, which led to the formation of a service cabinet under Monsieur Zanus. The new government was non-party in character, and was pledged to carry out in their entirety the Allied demands. Its intention was to proceed with new elections so soon as the army had been demobilized, and it seemed probable that these elections would take place in the middle of August. But the activity of the reservist leagues all over the land made it necessary to retard the elections, which on 16th August were definitely fixed for 8th October. Then came the Bulgarian invasion and the occupation of the better part of eastern Macedonia. The loss of so large a slice of Greek territory put any general election out of the question. The surrender of the Fourth Corps to the enemy and the open approval given by the military authorities to the extension of the reservist leagues had brought things to a pass where normal constitutional machinery had little meaning. On 27th August, Monsieur Venice Helos addressed a mass meeting in Athens to protest against the government's attitude towards the Bulgarian invasion. He declared that the only policy which could save Greece would be for the king to put himself at the head of the nation, to remove his evil counselors, and to take into his full confidence the prime minister, on whom the Visalist party were willing to bestow their complete trust. The appeal met with no response from the king, who refused to receive a Venice list deputation or from the anti Venice list parties, which continued to organize royalist demonstrations. Monsieur Zamus found the task too hard for him. Surrounded by pitfalls and staggered by the situation in Macedonia, he contented himself with doing nothing. His hesitation played into the hands of the more extreme element among the Venezuelists, and on 30th August, a revolution broke out at Salonica. The Cretan gendarmerie and the Macedonian volunteers were the chief movers, and a committee of national defense was formed under the presidency of Zimbrokakis, an artillery colonel, and the Venezuelist deputy for Ceres. After some disorder, General Surreal interposed to prevent bloodshed, and the troops of the Greek Ninth Division, quartered at Salonica, either joined the movement or allowed themselves to be disarmed. Those officers who refused to join were permitted to go to Athens, where they were received by the king and publicly thanked for their loyalty. Meantime, on 1st September, an Allied squadron consisting of 23 warships and seven transports had arrived from Salonica, and anchored four miles outside the Peros. The Allies demanded the arrest and deportation of Baron Schenk and the other German agents whose propaganda was exercising a malign influence and the instant suppression of the reservist leagues. Enraged by these demands, a body of reservists on 9 September 
demonstrated against the Allies in the gardens of the French legation. Monsieur Zemus promised satisfaction for the outrage, but found himself unable to cope with the anarchical movements now breaking out everywhere in the land. On 11 September, he handed in his resignation. He was an honorable and patriotic man, who in 1897 had concluded the peace with Turkey, and in 1906 had succeeded Prince George as High Commissioner of Crete. But his 65 years lay heavy on him, and his carriage was not masterful enough for so fierce a crisis. The king sent for Monsieur Dimitrikopoulos who had been in the Venice List cabinet in 1912, and had since then led a small independent party. He attempted to form an ordinary political ministry, but this the Allies were unable to accept. On 16 September, the anti-Venice List deputy, Monsieur Kalagagopoulos, was invited to construct a government. His selection included Monsieur Ruffles, an Archean deputy, and a violent anti venalist and the Minister of Foreign Affairs was Monsieur Carapanos, whose sympathies had always been anti-ally. The new cabinet was, in fact, purely partisan, and therefore a defiance of the note of 21st June. Monsieur Gallo Garapoulos promised the Allies a policy of very benevolent neutrality, declared that as soon as might be, he would transform his cabinet into a service ministry and disavow the performance of the Fourth Corps at Kalala. But in spite of his professions, the Allies refused to recognize him. Meanwhile, the Venalist movement was taking on a new character. On 22nd September, Monsieur Venalistos told an interviewer at Athens, if the king will not hear the voice of the people, we must ourselves devise what it is best to do. I do not know what that will be, but a long continuation of the present situation would be intolerable. Already we have suffered all the agonies of a disastrous war, while remaining neutral. That same day, a battalion of the Greek Revolutionary Army, Ancelonica, left for the front. You are going, Zimbrakakis told them, to fight and expel the enemy who has invaded our native soil. On the 24th, a revolution broke out at Candia, and in ten days the insurgent forces, estimated at 30,000, were in complete control of Crete. Elsewhere among the islands, at Mytilin, and Samos, and Chios, there were similar movements. Some of the leading Greek generals notified the king of their view that the country's interests demanded immediate war with Bulgaria. Some 70 deputies, till then anti venezist presented a memorial in favor of intervention. Late on the night of the 24th, Monsieur Venizelos took action. He left Athens, like some new Aristides, that he might the better return. Accompanied by Admiral Condoroitis, the commander-in-chief of the Greek Navy, and many of his followers, he crossed to Crete. I am leaving, he said, in order to proceed to the Greek islands to head the movement which has already begun to action against the Bulgarian invader. Do not think I am heading a revolution in the ordinary sense of the word. The movement now beginning is in no way directed against the king or his dynasty. It is one made by those of us who can no longer stand aside and let our countrymen and our country be ravaged by the Bulgarian enemy. It is the last effort we can make to induce the king to come forth as king of the Alleans and to follow the path of duty in protection of his subjects. As soon as he takes the reins, we, all of us, shall be glad and ready at once to follow his flag, as loyal citizens led by him against our country's foe. On 30th September, a triumvirate, consisting of Monsieur Venizelos, Admiral Condriotidis, and General Danglas was chosen to direct the destinies of the national movement, which was soon to become a provisional government. Monsieur Caligaropolis' ministry, now the most embarrassed of phantoms, continued to plead for recognition. It even promised, under certain conditions, intervention in the war. But the Allies remained armed to it, and on 5th October, Monsieur 
Caligaropolis gave up the hopeless task. Three days later, a non-party service cabinet was constructed under Professor Lambros, who was no politician and not even a deputy. He was sworn in on 9th October, and on that day, Monsieur Venezuelos, after a visit to some of the islands, arrived at Salonica to be received with enthusiasm. He proceeded to form a cabinet to direct the work of the national movement, and a conference held by the Allies at Boulogne ten days later. His provisional government was granted a qualified recognition. From that moment, Greece was practically, though not theoretically, divided into two hostile nations. All the conditions of civil war existed, save that the Allies were interposed between the combatants. The Lambros ministry had still to satisfy the demands of the powers. On 11th October, the French admiral, D'Artige du Fournay, commanded the Allied fleet, presented an ultimatum, demanding as a precautionary measure the handing over of the entire Greek fleet, with the exception of three vessels. By one o'clock in the afternoon, as well as the control of the Furious Larissa Railway, the demands were complied with, and in order to preserve order while the terms were being fulfilled, it was found necessary on the 16th to land parties of Allied Blue Jackets to occupy points in the capital. French officers were also appointed to assume control of the Greek police. The affair passed off without disorder, and presently the sailors were re-embarked, but the king and his cabinet were still far from an understanding with the powers. The demobilization was slowly on, but there was much haggling over the surrender of munitions. About 25th October, the decision of the Boulogne Conference was announced in Greece, a decision which satisfied neither party, though both claimed that their point of view had been recognized. The Venezuelist government in Salonica at once declared war on Bulgaria, in conformity with what they conceived to be their position as allies of the Entente powers. The Lambros government, on the other hand, traded on its recognition by the powers in order to refuse or delay the full satisfaction of the powers' demands. One incident increased the bitterness. Two Greek ships were torpedoed outside the Piraeus by a German submarine, and many lives were lost. Some of the passengers were Venezuelists, and Germany announced her intention of sinking any ships carrying adherents of the provisional government, and that she was perfectly within her rights and Monsieur Lambro's ministry seemed to accept the explanation as sufficient. During November, the position became daily more strained. On the 24th of the month, Admiral du Fenet's patience was exhausted. He asked peremptorily for the surrender by 1st December of ten mountain batteries, and for the handing over the remaining war material by 15th December. Failing compliance, he promised to take summary steps to enforce his orders. The long delay had bred a dangerous spirit in the royalists, who had come to believe that they could bluff the Allies indefinitely. On the last day of November, nothing had been done, and during the early morning of 1st December, French, British, and Italian troops were landed at the Piraeus. The king had assured the Allied commanders that no disorder need be expected, so the contingents were small. They found the capital held in force by a Greek corps. Two sides came into collision, and with considerable bloodshed, the landing parties were borne back by the weight of numbers. On this, the Allied warships opened fire on the Greek positions, whereupon the king proposed an armistice on condition that the bombardment ceased and the troops were re-embarked, offering also to hand over six batteries instead of the ten stipulated for in the note. After some haggling, the armistice was agreed upon. Meantime, the royalists, flushed by what they regarded as a victory, proceeded to insult the Allied legations and to rout out, maltreat, and in many cases murder the principal adherents of Monsieur Venizelos in the city. The prisons were choked with innocent victims, and for a day or two mob rule was rampant at Athens. It was noted that many highly placed personages, 
seemed to be personally superintending the campaign of outrage. A legend was invented late of a Venezuelan plot, the common pretext to malefactors to cover their crimes. The situation had become both farcical and tragic. The Allies had suffered a severe rebuff and had allowed themselves to be fooled by an insignificant court. A handful of German-filled staff officers and a rabble of discharged soldiers. A strict blockade of the Greek coast was announced on 7th December. On the afternoon of 14th December, an ultimatum was presented which required a reply within 24 hours. The note demanded the withdrawal of the entire Greek force from Thessaly and the transfer to the Peloponnesus of a large proportion of the Greek army. Failing compliance, the Allied ministers were instructed to leave Greece when a state of war would begin. The Greek government, realizing that this time the Allies were not to be trifled with, accepted the ultimatum, but after their fashion began to quibble about the construction of the terms. On 31st December, a second Allied note was delivered, containing the demands for military guarantees and for reparation on account of the events of 1st and 2nd December. The Greek forces outside the Peloponnesus were to be reduced to the number absolutely required to maintain order, and the surplus disbanded. All armaments and munitions beyond the amount required for this reduced force were to be transported to the Peloponnesus, as well as all machine guns and artillery of the Greek army. The situation thus established was to be maintained as long as the Allied governments deemed it necessary. Civilians were forbidden to carry arms, and all reservist meetings were prohibited north of the Isthmus of Corinth. All political prisoners were to be immediately released, and the sufferers from the events of 1st and 2nd December were to be indemnified. The general responsible for the action of the First Corps on these states was to be superseded. Finally, the Greek government was to apologize to the Allied ministers, and the British, French, Italian, and Russian flags were to be formally saluted in a public square in Athens in the presence of the Minister of War and the assembled garrison. Meantime, the blockade would continue till every jot and tittle of the demands had been fulfilled. Again, the Athens government quibbled, adopting the method of pleading known to English law as confession and avoidance. The anti fundalist persecution went on, and the reservists continued their meetings. An evasive reply was delivered, and this brought a second ultimatum, based upon the decisions reached at the Rome Conference in the first week of 1917. King Constantine judged shrewdly that he had now arrived at the end of the Allied patience. He had been in constant correspondence with Berlin and hoped that the situation would be saved by a German advance, which would drive Surreal into the sea. But Germany's obligations elsewhere did not permit of a Salonica offensive, and the king accordingly accepted the Allies' terms. On January 20th, 1917, the transfer of the Greek forces to the Paul of Phoenicis began. On 24th January, the Greek government formally apologized to the Allied ministers. On Monday, 29th January, in front of the Sepion, the Allied flags were solemnly saluted by soldiers and sailors, representing all the Greek units left in Athens. The reserve societies at the same time were dissolved by a legislative decree. The Allied handling of the Greek problem had never been brilliant, but during the last months of 1916, it seemed to most observers in the West to reach a height of fatuity, not often attained by mortal statecraft. Blunders there were, without doubt, but facile criticism scarcely recognized the extreme difficulty in which the Allies were placed. Their one object was to win the war, to prevent any addition to the German resources, and to avoid burdening themselves with troublesome problems not germane to their military purpose. A united Greece as an ally was beyond hope. The blunders of 1915 had made that impossible. The most they could look for was some arrangement which would protect their Salonica army 
from an assault in rear. They wished to keep Greece quite absent and to avoid having to fight a campaign in Thessaly or Attica, as well as in Macedonia. It was too often forgotten by their critics that a state of civil war in Greece would be more troublesome from a military point of view than a Greek declaration of war against the Allies, for it would not be possible to use the fleets as a weapon. On the top of their grave preoccupations, the Allies did not wish to have the ordering of the domestic affairs of a country none too easy to order. This desire was intelligible and politic. The Allied policy and its details may well be criticized. Ultimata, which were not ultimate. Pinpricks, which did not pierce the skin. Admiral de Fournay's landing parties, which were so ill-judged and ineffective. But when one plays a trimming game, one is apt to wear the appearance of inefficiency. The Allies sought to keep the peace at almost any cost. They accepted two de facto Greek governments. At their own conference, they tried to stereotype the arrangement and prevent either side from increasing its power. The whole situation was farcical, but let us recognize that the policy in the main succeeded at the cost of the loss of every kind of international dignity. Official Greece was kept uneasily neutral. There were many who advocated a more heroic course. Venizelos, they said, was the friend of the Allies and the declared enemy of the Teutonic League. He had 30,000 men under arms and, if allowed to make a levy in Greece, might soon have 100,000. Let the Allies do as Admiral Noel did in Crete, train their ship's guns on the royal palace and compel an abdication. Let Venizelos be brought to Athens as regent, and the provisional government established there. Let King Constantine retire to the Peloponnesus with his following, and let the Isthmus of Corinth be an impassable barrier between north and south. Or, if such things were impossible, let Venizelos be acknowledged as the true ruler of Greece. The Allied legations removed to one of the islands, and Athens and South Greece left to dree their weird under a strict blockade. If either course were taken, it was argued, every Hellene worthy of the name would be fighting actively on the Allied side, and the king and his councils would be reduced to the impotence, which was their proper destiny. The objection to these heroic courses did not lie in any tenderness to the royal cause. King Constantine, Trebly forsworn, deserves small consideration. It reposed on two uncontroverted facts. In the first place, the Allies were not yet agreed in their estimate of Venizelos. France was his passionate defender, Britain his staunch admirer. The many elements in Italy looked askance on one whose ambitions for his country might presently conflict with Italian aspirations. And the government then in power in Russia was naturally hostile to the man who had challenged a monarchy. In the second place, the Venizelists were by no means the whole of the Greek nation. By this time, it was not even certain that they were the larger part. Too much was made of the Germanophilism of anti venizelist Greece. Except in the court, a handful of politicians and the general staff, there was little love for Germany. The opponents of Venizelos were partly his political opponents, the narrow politicians who could not look beyond parochial ends. They were partly the middle classes who were afraid of bold ventures. They were very largely the reservists who strongly objected to be made to fight. They were all the creeping things that infest a court. They were simple conservatives with a leaning to royalty. They were the ignorant and superstitious peasants who had that semi-religious veneration for a king, which is common in the Orthodox Church. anti venizelism included the basic elements in the nation, but it involved also elements, narrow and self-centered indeed, but wholly respectable and honest. Venizelos drew to a standard all that was bold and generous and far-seeing in Hellenic life, but such men are rarely the majority in a nation. He preached a council of perfection which was a stumbling block to commonplace minds. 
for the Allies at that moment to have definitely espoused his cause and set him up in power would have rent the nation in two and delivered it over to civil war. If peace at all costs had to be preserved, a temporizing policy was the only course left to the embarrassed Allied statesmen. A recognition of this truth need not blind us to the greatness of Venizelos's part and the exceeding dignity and resolution of his character. He was called to a harassing work, to make bricks without straw, to make war under bonds, to govern and at the same time to serve. He could not attack the dynasty, since he sought above all things Hellenic unity, but he had to wait in silence while that dynasty oppressed and murdered his supporters. He had to content himself with a half-hearted recognition by the Allies. He had to submit to restrictions on the natural increment of his following. He had to obey often what he thought was the starkest folly. Yet at all times he took the larger view and showed a patience and a noble absence of vanity, which few leaders in history have excelled. I have tried, to quote his own words, not to cause any difficulties for my friends. I am told to evacuate Katerina. I evacuate Katerini. I am told to abandon Carrillo. I abandon Carrillo. A neutral zone is imposed on me. I respect the neutral zone. I am asked to bring my movement to a standstill. I bring it to a standstill. He was, above all things, a practical statesman, never losing sight at the end but ready to change his means as the occasion demanded. He had seen unmoved the failure of his treatment rising in 1897, and had promptly set himself to achieve his purpose by other methods. He had served the dynasty when Greece needed it. He was ready to oppose it when it played false to Greece. A passionate patriot, there was nothing parochial in his love for his country. He saw it as part of Europe and no man was ever a better European. Others have had imagination and adventurous courage, but few have joined to these qualities, the surest flair for the practical and unearthly patience, the vision and the fact, the poetry and the prose of life. It is not often that they find union in a single human soul. End of chapter 66, part 1